Chapter 15, A History of California, the American Period, by Robert Glass Cleland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15, The Bear Flag Revolt. Prior to the Mexican War, the American residents of California were divided into two distinct classes. In Monterey and other coast ports, and in the interior around Los Angeles, were many American merchants and some landholders who had become closely identified through business relations, friendship, or even marriage with prominent California families. Many of these Americans, indeed, had become naturalized Mexican citizens. Such men might regard the Californian as inefficient in government and neglectful of great economic opportunities, but they neither despised him as an individual nor feared him as a ruler. And if independence were to be sought, they preferred to make common cause with him against Mexico rather than to treat him as an enemy. The other class of American settlers, however, were of a very different mind. Coming to California from the frontier states of the West and Southwest, they brought with them an instinctive prejudice against everything of Spanish origin, a prejudice somewhat older than American independence, born of all sorts of influences, of racial differences, of conflicting territorial claims, of bitter religious animosities, of border conflicts, of historical tradition, of contempt and hatred which had their origin, perchance, as far back as the days of Drake and Hawkins, when English freebooters looted the Spanish treasure ships, and when English sailors died of nameless tortures in Spanish jails. This attitude was particularly characteristic of the settlers of the Sacramento Valley. Forming almost a community by themselves and having but little contact with the native Californians, they were restive under Mexican authority and over-anxious to assert their Anglo-Saxon superiority. Among them, too, were the bitter memories of the recent atrocities of Mexican troops in Texas, memories which even today the lapse of nearly a hundred years has scarcely effaced from the border states. Consequently, with all the self-assurance of the American settlers along the Sacramento, there was intermingled a deep-seated fear of the fate that might await them if the California officials, through treachery or surprise, should get the foreigners of the province completely under their control. Indeed, while the Californians as a whole never dreamed of resorting to such harsh measures to hold the Americans in check, some color was given to this fear by a few isolated instances. More than one fur trader, like Smith and the Patties in the preceding decade, had been unpleasantly dealt with on the ground that he had violated some provision of Mexican law. More recently still, a very considerable body of foreigners had been brutally seized and sent to Mexico by the California authorities. The details of this incident, commonly spoken of as the Graham Affair, were briefly as follows. In the spring of 1840, rumor got abroad that a number of foreigners, American trappers chiefly, with some English citizens of rather undesirable reputation, were planning a movement for independence. These men were in California without passports, contrary to Mexican law, but they might have stayed on unmolested, as did many another foreigner in violation of the same law, if they had not made themselves obnoxious to the local officials. Typical of the lot was Isaac Graham, the Tennessee trapper, whose name has already appeared in these pages in another connection. Like many another American of his calling, Graham had little regard for the dignity of California law and probably less respect for those empowered to administer it. He had also intermeddled with local politics and acquired considerable fame for his participation in the Revolution of 1836. His attitude had subsequently become so domineering that Alvarado and Castro, whom he had supported in the Revolution, were determined to get rid of him and his kind by any means at their command. Accordingly, one night when Graham was asleep, a company of soldiers under Castro's orders surrounded his cabin, and when he appeared in the doorway, fired point-blank at the startled American. Luckily for Graham, none of those shots took effect, though his shirt was burned by the powder in a number of places. He was then unceremoniously seized and carried off to jail. In a similar manner, about a hundred other foreigners were arrested in various parts of California and thrown into prison. After a farcical trial, some forty of the prisoners were then placed in irons and shipped down the coast to San Blas, 
suffering severely on the voyage from harsh treatment and because of insufficiency of food, water, and fresh air. Upon reaching Tepic, they were kept in confinement while their case was being disposed of in Mexico City. Here the pressure of the British and American governments was effectually exerted to secure their release, and Graham and many of his companions were returned to California at Mexican expense. In addition, nearly all the victims of the affair filed large claims against the Mexican government for their illegal arrest and harsh treatment. While this episode undoubtedly left some bitter memories and created an uneasy fear among the foreign residents of California, it was not at all in keeping with the general attitude of California officials toward American settlers. Some measures, it is true, were tentatively proposed to restrict the overland immigration, but these nearly all originated in Mexico and found expression only in high-sounding proclamations or in decrees that the Californians would not or could not enforce. In fact, the only proposals of any consequence that might have exerted serious influence upon the status of the foreigners were a recommendation by Vallejo and Castro to purchase New Helvetia from Sutter and a plan of the Mexican government to send an expedition into California to keep the activities of foreigners confined to proper bounds. The possession of Sutter's Fort, because of its strategic location, would have given the Californians an important check on overland immigration and an effective control of the foreign settlers in the Sacramento Valley. Similarly, a well-equipped, properly disciplined force of Mexican troops, if such a thing existed, might easily have dampened revolutionary ardor among the Americans, or at least kept it from blazing forth into action. Neither of these measures, however, brought forth any practical results. The proposal to purchase New Helvetia was buried somewhere in the vast graveyard of the Mexican archives, and though an expedition was actually gotten under way by the central government to save California, it broke down before leaving Mexico under endless charges of corruption and mismanagement and the vagabond troops of which it was composed, who would have been an aggravation instead of help had they reached their destination, found ready employment under the standard of revolt which Paredes was just then raising against Herrera. The Californians themselves, like the home government, made no practical efforts to check the growth of foreign domination. Juntas were held and wordy proclamations issued without number, but the frontiers remained unguarded, and the settlers, after the Graham episode, did almost as they pleased. Naturally, however, the assumption of superiority on the part of the foreigners was resented by the California aristocracy. Thus, Guerrero evidently voiced a common sentiment when he wrote Castro early in 1846 that the Americans apparently held the idea that because God made the world and them also, that what there was in the world belonged to them as sons of God. And Castro, probably in some heat, declared before an assembly at Monterey, quote, These Americans are so contriving that some day they will build ladders to touch the sky, and once in the heavens they will change the whole face of the universe and even the color of the stars. Unquote. Yet neither Guerrero nor Castro nor anyone else put forth a definite effort to prevent the Americans from changing the destiny of California. As has been said, the sovereignty of Mexico over California, as everyone but the Mexicans saw, was at an end by 1846. She could no longer command the loyalty of her subjects there by force, nor hold it by affection. At the same time, Polk's second plan of acquiring California through the initiative of native uprising or of peaceful separation from Mexico had before it every prospect of success. At this juncture occurred the Bear Flag Revolt. This movement, though sometimes spoken of as a turning point in California destiny, was actually shorn of much of its importance by the outbreak of the Mexican War. Tradition, however, has given it a significance which cannot be ignored. To the popular mind, at least, it will probably always stand as the very embodiment of pioneer spirit and the decisive stroke by which California was saved to the United States. The first participants in the revolt consisted of a handful of landholders in the Sacramento Valley and a somewhat larger number of hunters and trappers from the same region. Less than 35 men took part in the initial phase of the movement, but back of these, lending them something more than moral support, stood John C. Fremont and the members of his well-armed exploring expedition. 
Even at this late date, however, it is impossible to say just what relations Fremont and his command sustained to the actual revolt. The question is probably the most hotly debated point in California history, nor is anything like unanimous agreement upon it ever likely to be attained. The facts, as nearly as can be determined, are these. In the spring of 1845, Fremont, with a party of 62 men, six of whom were Delaware Indians, started from St. Louis on a third exploring expedition beyond the Rocky Mountains. The ostensible object of this undertaking was to discover the most feasible route from the Mississippi to the Pacific. But coupled with his purpose was an ever-growing desire on Fremont's part to revisit California and to examine in more detail a country over which he had already become an ardent enthusiast. The party reached Walker's Lake when winter was already at hand. Food was none too plentiful, and the danger of becoming snowbound in the Sierras led to a division of the company. Fifteen men under Fremont sent out to cross the mountains to Sutter's. The main body of the expedition, under command of Joseph Walker, skirted the mountains southward, intending to cross from Owens Valley into the San Joaquin through Walker Pass. It was understood that the two parties should come together again as soon as Fremont could procure supplies from Sutter's establishment and make his way to the southern end of the San Joaquin. The rendezvous was fixed at a stream known to the explorers as the River of the Lake. Crossing the Sierras without noteworthy incident, Fremont secured the needed supplies from the obliging Sutter and then hurried on to the appointed meeting place with the company under Walker. Reaching the banks of the King's River, which he took to be the stream agreed upon as the meeting place, and finding no signs of the other party, Fremont waited several days, vainly hoping for Walker's appearance, and then retraced his way to Sutter's. Leaving his men here with instructions to proceed later to Yerba Buena, Fremont accompanied Leidesdorf, the United States vice Consul, to Yerba Buena and Monterey. At Monterey, he was entertained by Larkin, from whom he learned much concerning the conditions in California. On the 29th of January, while Fremont was still at Monterey, Prefect Manuel Castro pointedly inquired of Larkin what American soldiers were doing in the province without permission from the California officials. Footnote. In his note, Castro referred only to the members of Fremont's company, which by this time was encamped at Yerba Buena, and made no reference to the larger party under Walker, whose presence in the province was as yet unknown to the Californians. In footnote, Fremont replied to Castro's communication in a frank, conciliatory manner, explaining that his expedition was purely scientific in its character, and that most of his men had been left in the unsettled interior of the province, while he and a few companions had come to Monterey merely to purchase badly needed supplies for a continuation of their explorations to Oregon. These assurances, which were afterwards reiterated to Alvarado, quieted, temporarily at least, the uneasiness of the Californians, and they accordingly gave Fremont permission to winter in the province, provided he kept his men away from the coast settlements. While Fremont was thus occupying his time at Monterey, Walker and his command were encamped on the Kern River, many miles south of the Kings, wondering what had become of their lost commander and the provisions he had gone in search of when the two companies separated east of the Sierras. After three weeks of fruitless waiting, Walker then moved northward, expecting to find Fremont at Sutter's Fort. Upon reaching the Calaveras River, however, Walker learned from a chance hunter that Fremont was in the Santa Clara Valley, whither he had gone from Monterey, intending to return to the San Joaquin on another search for Walker. And here the two companies came together about the middle of February 1846. The combined force then temporarily encamped on the Laguna Rancho, south of San Jose. After only a short stay in this locality, the party began to move leisurely toward the coast and, after crossing the Santa Cruz Mountains by way of Los Gatos, went into camp in the Salinas Valley, some 20 or 25 miles from Monterey. It is not certain what course Fremont intended to pursue from this point onward. There is some reason to believe that he planned to travel down the coast to Santa Barbara, or perhaps spend a few weeks until the Oregon route should be clear of snow in the little valley of the coast range near Salinas which had seemed so like paradise to the half-starved immigrants of the Childs-Walker party a few years before. 
But whatever his purpose, he seems to have had no thought that the presence of the company near Monterey would be construed as a violation of his understanding with the California officials. The Americans were surprised and then considerably angered, therefore, when peremptory orders came from the authorities at Monterey to leave the province immediately or take the consequences. Fremont, though perhaps technically in the wrong, refused to obey this blunt demand, and moving his camp to the top of a nearby hill, known as Hawk's Peak, prepared to resist whatever force the Californians might bring against him. The expected attack, however, did not develop. There was a good deal of bluster and the mustering of a considerable force by the Californians, but inasmuch as the demonstration was probably gotten up chiefly to satisfy the Mexican government, or to quiet the protests of the British vice-consul against the presence of the Americans in California, no actual hostilities took place. Fremont, after waiting some three or four days, withdrew under cover of darkness from his fortified position and started for Oregon by way of the San Joaquin and the Sacramento. While the Hawks Peak affair in itself amounted to little, its results were most unfortunate. The distrust and antipathy of Fremont's company toward the Californians were greatly increased, and the feelings of the latter were correspondingly ruffled and outraged. Among the American settlers in the Sacramento, also, the incident created much excitement, and it was persistently rumored that the government had planned to expel or seize all foreign residents in the province. In this sense, at least, the episode was one of the most direct causes of the Bear Flag Revolt. Not long after the Hawks Peak episode, a messenger from Washington reached Monterey. This was Lieutenant Archibald H. Gillespie of the United States Marine Corps, to whom reference has already been made as the bearer of a copy of Buchanan's dispatch to Larkin and as a confidential agent to the American government. Though Gillespie had destroyed Buchanan's letter, he had brought most of his other papers through unharmed. Among these was a packet of letters for Fremont from Senator Thomas H. Benton, Fremont's influential father-in-law. After a stay of only two days at Monterey, Gillespie hastened on to Yerba Buena, where he remained a short time with the American vice consul, W. A. Leidesdorf, and then set out to overtake John C. Fremont. The latter, after reaching the San Joaquin, had moved northward at a leisurely pace, reaching the Klamath Lake region about the middle of May. Here Gillespie overtook the party, and besides delivering to Fremont the Benton letters, acquainted him with the nature of Larkin's confidential appointment and the purposes of the Polk administration, so far as Gillespie himself understood them. It was not at all strange that the information and dispatches brought by Gillespie caused a radical change in Fremont's plans. Instead of continuing his route to the Columbia, he resolved on an immediate return to California. This course was dictated by common sense and lay plainly in the line of duty. Incidentally, it coincided with Fremont's own desires. But had it been otherwise, he could scarcely have gone serenely on his way to Oregon, knowing that events in which his government was vitally concerned were rapidly coming to a crisis in California, and that his presence there might change the destiny of the province. Fremont has been pretty severely handled by his critics for this abrupt return from Oregon. He himself testified that he was led to believe through certain enigmatic and obscure passages in the letters from Benton, passages written, he says, in a prearranged code, that California was in imminent danger of slipping into British hands and that the administration expected him to act on his own initiative to forestall such an eventuality. Whether Fremont was right or wrong in this interpretation of the situation is really immaterial. The true justification for his return to California lay not in what he read between the lines of Benton's letters, but in the simple fact that a trusted agent of the United States government, the confidential representative of the State Department and of the President himself, had traveled post-haste more than 500 miles from San Francisco to Oregon through a dangerous and almost unbroken wilderness to overtake the exploring party and urge its return to the Mexican province. Unless Gillespie made this journey for his health, or out of mere whim, or for some other ridiculous purpose, Fremont had no option in the matter. It was his unmistakable duty to turn back to California. When Gillespie and Fremont reached the Sacramento, after a serious brush with the Klamath Indians, 
they encamped at the Marysville Buttes above the junction of the Feather and Sacramento Rivers. Here, rumors came to them of intended hostilities by the Californians against the American residents in the valley. There may or may not have been truth in these reports, but even if the intentions of the native leaders had been unfriendly, it is doubtful, owing to the confusion in the provincial government, if they could have made any serious move against the foreign settlers. Naturally, however, the Americans viewed the situation with a good deal of concern, especially as the hostile demonstration against Fremont in the Hawks Peak affair was still vividly before them. This uneasiness gave place to actual alarm when information, apparently authentic, spread through the valley that a company of 250 Californians was advancing toward the Sacramento, burning houses, driving off cattle, and destroying the grain. In the face of this supposed danger, the scattered settlers of the valley hastily came together to effect a military organization. The natural rendezvous was Fremont's camp, where sixty or more well-disciplined men already furnished the nucleus for an effective resistance against any force the Californians might have at their command. The position of Fremont in this emergency was surrounded by some embarrassment. Having learned probably as much as Gillespie himself knew of the plans of the administration, and believing that California must be secured as quickly as possible to prevent its seizure by Great Britain, for, in spite of much argument to the contrary, Fremont was evidently sincere in this conviction, the American commander faced a difficult problem. If he took an active part in organizing a settler's revolt, he would not only lend the uprising the official sanction of the United States government, but would also lay himself open to severe censure and perhaps punishment in case the administration later disavowed the movement. The other horn of the dilemma was equally serious. If the revolt collapsed because Fremont failed to support it, and the American settlers should be killed or driven out of the province, a fate Fremont evidently feared for them, not only would the blame for this rest upon his shoulders, but also the greater reproach, as he saw it, of standing irresolutely by while California passed out of the reach of the United States into the waiting hands of England. Fremont's course in the emergency has been the object of both unreasonable criticism and of exaggerated praise. He did not save California by his presence in the Sacramento, nor did he take an active part in the first stages of the Bear Flag movement, but he did make the latter possible by giving it his moral support and by secret promises of aid if his assistance should be required. How far he was actually responsible for fomenting the revolt is one of those disputed points on which there is no possibility of agreement. Putting all partisanship aside, and acknowledging that personal ambition probably played its part, the fair-minded historian must still acknowledge that Fremont, viewing the situation in the light of what he knew of California conditions and believing that President Polk had determined upon the acquisition of California, pursued a perfectly natural and not altogether blameworthy course. Unfortunately, claims later made on his behalf were far beyond his actual performances, and his reputation suffered much in consequence. The first hostile act of the Bear Flag Uprising was the seizure of a band of horses which were being driven from Sonoma to the Santa Clara Valley for the use of General Castro. Rumor reached the Americans at Fremont's camp that these animals were to be employed in the threatened expedition against the settlers of the Sacramento. Encouraged, doubtless by Fremont, about a dozen men under the leadership of Ezekiel Merritt started out to intercept the drove. They succeeded, without the slightest difficulty, in surprising the small guard under Francisco Arce, and took from them the greater part of the horses. These they brought back to Fremont's headquarters, which in the meantime had been moved farther down the Sacramento. No blood was shed in this encounter, nor were the Californians aware that anything more serious than a robbery had taken place. The next step was of more significance. Encouraged by their success against Arsa and realizing that they had already gone too far for halfway measures, Merritt's company turned their attention to the capture of Sonoma. Originally established to check the Russian advance, this settlement, with the exception of New Helvetia, which was only nominally under California control, had become the leading political and military center of the province north of Monterey. Sonoma's chief claim to importance arose from the fact that it was home of Mariano G. Vallejo, 
in many respects the most dominant figure among the Californians. Toward Americans, Vallejo had always shown the kindliest feeling and was already pretty thoroughly committed to Larkin's plan of independence. Under these circumstances, Vallejo and his fellow townsmen were naturally not anticipating any trouble with their American neighbors in the Sacramento. It was with the utmost surprise, therefore, that the general and his family awoke about dawn on the quiet Sunday of June 14th to find themselves surrounded by a band of 33 armed men, dressed for the most part in trapper's garb, and evidently come on hostile business. At first, Vallejo had considerable difficulty in finding out what the Americans wanted. But through an interpreter, he soon learned that they had come to make him prisoner and take possession of the town. The leaders of the attacking force, Merritt, Semple, and William Knight, undertook to explain to Vallejo the purpose of the uprising and to arrange the terms of his capitulation. The conference, held in the prisoner's house, made such slow progress that the rank and file of the company outside grew impatient and deposed Merritt from command, electing John Grigsby in his stead. The new leader made no faster headway than the old, and William B. Ide was accordingly sent in to speed up the negotiations. When the latter entered the room, he says, he found most of the conferees too far gone for business. Vallejo's wine and aguardiente taken on empty stomachs had proved almost too much for the American commissioners. At last, however, the articles of capitulation were completed and signed. General Vallejo, his brother Captain Salvador Vallejo, and Colonel Victor Prudon were sent as prisoners of war to Fremont's camp, under positive assurance that no harm should come to them or to their property. In the meanwhile, Ide was elected captain of the company in the place of Grigsby, who seems to have become somewhat alarmed at the progress the movement was taking under his leadership and the Republic of California was soon brought into being. As a first step in the creation of the new government, William Todd, an enthusiastic member of the Revolution, designed a flag. This was made from a piece of unbleached cotton cloth, five feet long and three feet wide. In the upper left-hand corner, a five-pointed star was roughly painted with red ink, while facing this stood the crude figure of a grizzly bear, which gave both the flag and its republic its familiar name. A strip of red flannel on the lower edge of the cotton and the words California Republic, done in red, completed the design. When the flag had been completed, I'd prepared a proclamation in which he set forth the justification and purposes of the revolution. The next move was to organize a government. Nothing much could be done as yet in this direction, but a general statement of principles of the movement was drawn up which I'd evidently thought might serve as the basis for a more elaborate constitution later on. So far, the uprising had proceeded without bloodshed. But a few days after the taking of Sonoma, two Americans, Cowie and Fowler, were captured by a band of Californians and unceremoniously put to death. Whether this was the act of an individual or the result of official orders cannot be determined with certainty. Footnote. Responsibility for the act has been laid at the door of the notorious three-fingered Jack. In footnote. It led, however, to unfortunate reprisals in which a few of Fremont's men, under Carson's command, ambushed and shot three rather inoffensive Californians. As the movement progressed, the force under Ide received considerable reinforcement from settlers in the Sacramento and around San Francisco Bay. Fremont, having resigned his commission in the United States Army, also openly joined the uprising, thus lending to it the effective support of his highly skilled company and strengthening the idea, already nearly universal, that the United States government was behind the whole affair. The Californians, in turn, were doing their utmost to subdue the revolt. It had been necessary first for Castro and Pico to compose their differences, which in fact had already reached the stage of civil war, and then after issuing the appropriate proclamations, without which no Californian could commence a serious undertaking, to muster the inadequate provincial forces against the American revolutionists. Castro, whose headquarters were fixed at Santa Clara, succeeded in putting an army of a 160 men into the field. These were divided into three divisions, only one of which, that led by Joaquin de la Torre, ever made contact with the Americans. 
This was in the nature of a surprise skirmish which occurred between Petaluma and San Rafael. In it, one of the Californians was killed by American fire. In the south, Pico, still somewhat in doubt as to the purity of Castro's motives, sent out one fervid appeal after another to his fellow citizens to rise in arms against the vile Americans. Quote, fly, Mexicans, he wrote in one of the most lurid of these proclamations, fly, Mexicans, in all haste in pursuit of the treacherous foe. Follow him to the farthest wilderness, punish his audacity, and in case we fail, let us form a cemetery where posterity may remember to the glory of Mexican history the heroism of her sons. Compatriots, run swiftly with me to crown your brows with the fresh laurels of unfading glory. In the fields of the north they are scattered, ready to spring to your noble foreheads. In spite of such appeals, however, both the citizenry of Los Angeles and of Santa Barbara, where Pico was then located, met the emergency with such indifference that when the governor marched north to form a junction with Castro, he had at his disposal only about a hundred men. The two California leaders, so long bitter rivals, met with a show of friendship at the peaceful ranch of Santa Margarita near the mission of San Luis Obispo. What they might have done against the revolting Americans will always remain a matter of conjecture, for by this time the bear flag was a thing of the past. Its activities had been superseded by agencies of greater magnitude. The news of war between the United States and Mexico had at last reached California. What place should the bear flag movement have in California history? It was neither authorized by President Polk nor in keeping with his California policy. It put an end to Larkin's hope of a peaceful annexation, and it was unquestionably responsible for much of the ill will among the native inhabitants which later made necessary the forceful conquest of the province. It was never a general movement among the Americans in California, many of whom condemned it out of hand, but was confined to a limited area and carried out largely by trappers instead of by permanent residents. It did not save California from falling into British hands, nor hasten its acquisition by the United States. This much the historian must now admit. Yet the sarcastic criticism so often passed upon the movement and those who participated in it, since Bancroft and Royce set the fashion, is entirely out of place. Merritt, simple-eyed in their companions, it is true, had no respect for California law and institutions, and too little acquaintance with the conditions in the province. They were also in no actual danger at the hands of Castro before the seizure of Sonoma, though they had substantial reason to think that they were. They could not know the actual plans of their government for acquiring California by peaceful means, but they did know that a deep-seated conviction prevailed throughout the United States that annexation must sometime, somehow, be brought about. If, at the outset, the movement was only a local affair with no very definite purpose or plan of procedure, yet it soon gave promise of a much larger proportions. If its actual accomplishments were of little importance, this was only because the outbreak of the Mexican War made its further progress unnecessary. Had this war not come when it did, there is every reason to believe that the Bear Flag Revolt would have brought to a successful conclusion the third method of securing California, that is, by the agency of an armed uprising among the American settlers in the province. In such case, Ide or Fremont might have stood out as the creator of a new republic, the Sam Houston of the Pacific Coast. End of chapter 15Chapter 16, A History of California, the American Period, by Robert Glass Cleland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16, The Conquest of California. Apart from the Bear Flag Revolt, there were two clearly defined stages in the conquest of California by the American forces. The first of these, extending from July 7th to August 15th, 1846, though devoid of bloodshed, resulted in the temporary establishment of American control over every place of significance in the province. The second, beginning with a local revolt in Los Angeles on September 22nd, 
was a matter of much greater importance and for a time seriously threatened the continuance of American control. As previously stated, the Polk administration was determined upon the acquisition of California in case of war with Mexico. At the same time, the Washington government believed that the Californians, disaffected as they were with Mexico, might easily be persuaded to transfer their allegiance to the United States without the necessity of armed conquest. The opinion also prevailed that, even were the Californians so inclined, they could not offer very serious resistance to the United States because of military weakness and inefficiency. These views were the basis of the administration's policy regarding California. As early as June 1845, George Bancroft, Secretary of the Navy, instructed Commodore John D. Sloat, then in command of the American naval forces in the Pacific, to seize the harbor of San Francisco in the event of war with Mexico, and such other California ports as his strength would permit. As these harbors were said to be open and defenseless, little difficulty was anticipated in carrying out the Secretary's instructions. Occupation of the seacoast ports, however, was but the first step in fulfilling the President's program. Sloat was then to use every precaution to secure and preserve the goodwill of the Californians so that the province might be acquired through friendly cooperation rather than by armed conquest. In the spring of 1846, Sloat, with five vessels under his command, was on the west coast of Mexico expecting any moment to learn of the outbreak of war. In April, upon the receipt of an urgent request from Larkin, set off after Fremont's affair at Hawke's Peak, he ordered one of his vessels, the Portsmouth, under Captain John B. Montgomery, to sail to Monterey. Here, and later at San Francisco, Montgomery kept close watch upon the rapid development of the California situation, including the Bear Flag Revolt. But knowing nothing as yet of any declaration of war, he was able to play only the role of an observer in the proceedings. On May 17th, word reached the American fleet at anchor in the harbor of Mazatlan that hostilities had begun between Mexico and the United States. But as the report was not official, Sloat contented himself with dispatching a single additional vessel, the Cyan, under command of Captain Mervine to join the Portsmouth at Monterey, while he remained in the Mexican harbor with the remainder of the fleet. A few weeks later, receiving additional confirmation of the earlier report, he quietly slipped out of Mazatlan and sailed direct to Monterey. In taking this course, Sloat was not only guided by Bancroft's orders of the previous year, but also by evidence apparently genuine that the British government planned to check the American occupation of California. Admiral Seymour, whose interest in California has already been referred to, was then cruising in the vicinity of Sloat's command and had shown an unpleasant curiosity in the doings of the American fleet. It was credibly reported that he intended to forestall Sloat's occupation of any California port, and as later evidence showed, only the absence of official orders prevented him from making this attempt. As it was, however, Sloat found no obstruction in his way at Monterey. His flagship, the Savannah, anchored in the harbor on July 2nd, but instead of taking immediate possession of the fort, with a hesitancy and vacillation strangely out of keeping with the tradition of the American Navy, he delayed action until the morning of the 7th. The intervening time was occupied in conferences with Larkin, in the preparation of plans and proclamations for the conquest of the province, and in the exchange of official courtesies with the California authorities. At last, however, stirred by news of Fremont's activities in the north, the fear of Admiral Seymour's arrival, and the urging of his own officers, Sloat decided to act. The occupation of Monterey then became almost a matter of routine. There had been no powder in the fort to salute the American vessels when they sailed into port. All of the soldiers, a mere handful, had gone south with Castro, and a Mexican flag had not been seen in the town for three months. Accordingly, when the formal demand for surrender was refused because there was no one with authority to grant it, Sloat disembarked some 250 men who marched unmolested to the Customs House, where they raised the American flag, fired a salute, 
and formally proclaimed California annexed to the United States. Two days later, the flag was raised over San Francisco and Sonoma, and on the 11th at Sutter's Fort. In all these proceedings, and in the proclamations accompanying them, it is worth recording that the American officers sought, according to their instructions, to conciliate the Californians and to treat them with all possible consideration. Two weeks after the occupation of Monterey, new vigor was instilled into the American activities by the resignation of Sloat and the transference of his command to a more aggressive leader, Commodore Robert F. Stockton, who had arrived on the 15th of July from Norfolk, Virginia, in the Congress. Just before leaving Norfolk, Stockton had held a conference with the Secretary of the Navy and was therefore far better acquainted with the plans of the administration than was Sloat nor by temperament was he given to halfway measures. Having assumed command of both naval and land operations in California, Stockton at once enrolled the Bear Flag Battalion, which Fremont had brought to Monterey, as volunteers in the United States Army. At the same time, he commissioned Fremont a major and Gillespie a captain in the battalion. He then proceeded, after issuing what has generally been regarded as an unfortunate proclamation against the California leaders, to carry out the conquest of Southern California. In keeping with this plan, Fremont and his command were sent to San Diego on the Cyan, and Stockton with some 360 men landed at San Pedro. The California army, under General Castro, at this time consisted of only a 100 men, almost without arms and so disaffected that they could not be counted upon to obey their officers. Under such conditions, both Castro and Governor Pico gave up all thought of resistance to the American advance, and after vainly seeking to negotiate a suspension of hostilities with Stockton, adjourned the California Assembly, then in a last forlorn session at Los Angeles, and fled into retirement. Castro went immediately to Sonora by way of the old Anza Trail through the Colorado Desert, while Pico, after remaining some time on his ranch near San Bernardino, took refuge at last in Lower California. Deprived of these two leaders, the Californians made no resistance, either to Stockton's advance upon Los Angeles from San Pedro, or to Fremont's expedition northward from San Diego. On August 13th, the united command of Fremont and Stockton entered Los Angeles, raised the American flag, and received the allegiance of the leading citizens. Four days later, Stockton proclaimed the province a territory of the United States. The first phase of the conquest, except for a few minor episodes, was completed. It had been accomplished without loss of life and distinguished by no very exciting incidents. Footnote. From this statement, of course, the Bear Flag movement is excluded. As has been shown, it was not properly a part of the conquest by the United States government. In footnote. The second phase of the conquest was characterized by some pretty vigorous fighting and a considerable amount of bloodshed. Stockton and Fremont, apparently misled by the ease of their triumph, left Los Angeles early in September in command of Captain Gillespie and a force of 50 men. As events prove, this garrison was wholly inadequate to control the turbulent element in the Pueblo and only invited insurrection by its presence. Gillespie himself was lacking in tact, while the population over which he ruled had always been distinguished for an unusual readiness to revolt. The first outbreak occurred before daylight, September 23rd, when a motley company of Californians, filled with patriotism and perhaps with wine, attacked the adobe quarters in which Gillespie's men were sleeping. The party was led by Serbulo Varela, a frequent disturber of the peace even when Los Angeles was under native rule, and his followers belonged to the semi-outlaw class of California society. The attack was easily repulsed, but when Gillespie the next day sought to arrest the offenders, he found a revolution of no mean proportions already underway. Before the end of 24 hours, he and his men were surrounded by a force of several hundred Californians, and the revolt was in full swing. As leaders of the movement, several of Castro's former officers, 
all of whom had given their parole not to take up arms against the United States, now came forward. Chief of these were Jose Maria Flores, Jose Antonio Carrillo, and Andreas Pico. The success of the movement, which all things considered was quite surprising, was due, however, not so much to the ability of these leaders as to the popular enthusiasm which supported it and to the swiftness with which the revolutionists carried out their operations, a swiftness made possible by the superior horsemanship for which the Californians had long been noted. The first victory of the uprising occurred while Gillespie was shut up in Los Angeles. About a score of Americans under command of B.D. Wilson, hearing that the country was up in arms, took refuge with Isaac Williams, one of the early Santa Fe traders who had settled on the Chino Rancho some 25 miles east of Los Angeles. On September 26th, this party was surrounded by a force of 70 mounted Californians and compelled to surrender after a short skirmish in which one of the Californians was killed and several of the Americans wounded. The success of this engagement greatly encouraged the Californians in their attack upon Gillespie. The latter, who had taken up his position on what was afterwards known as Fort Hill, back of the old Plaza Church, was in a serious predicament. His supplies were cut off, and a force overwhelmingly superior to his own kept him continually invested. The nearest assistance to which he could look was at Monterey, approximately 400 miles away, and the route over which a courier had to pass, even should he elude the besieging force, lay through a country where every native inhabitant must be counted upon as an enemy. These difficulties, however, did not prevent one of Gillespie's men, John Brown, or Juan Flacco, Lean John, as he was commonly known, from carrying the message for aid to Commodore Stockton, who was not at Monterey, as Gillespie supposed, but at San Francisco, a hundred miles beyond. Leaving Los Angeles at eight o'clock on the evening of September 24th, with a short message from Gillespie written on cigarette papers and concealed in his hair, unarmed and equipped only with spurs and riata, Brown successfully passed the enemy lines. He was pursued, however, by fifteen Californians, but escaped from them by jumping his horse, already mortally wounded, across a thirteen-foot ravine. Two miles more, and the horse died. Lean John walked 27 miles to the ranch of an American, where he secured another horse with which he reached Santa Barbara. From here, obtaining fresh horses as he could, he rode almost continuously until he arrived at Monterey on the evening of the 29th. Up to this time, according to the report of an eyewitness of his arrival, Brown had had neither rest nor sleep since leaving Los Angeles. He slept three hours at Monterey, then pushed on to San Francisco, which he reached either late on the 30th or early the next morning. The distance covered was over 500 miles. Brown's actual riding time was less than five days. It is a record not easily matched. Upon receipt of Gillespie's message, Stockton at once ordered Captain Mervine to sail for San Pedro in the Savannah with 350 men. At Sausalito, however, the relief ship encountered such a heavy fog that progress was impossible for several days, and Mervine did not reach San Pedro until the 7th of October. As it proved, however, even without this delay, Mervine's assistance would have been too late. On the 30th, even before Lean John's arrival at San Francisco, Gillespie had realized the hopelessness of his position and accepted the only chance of escape by surrendering to the California commander. Under the terms of the agreement, the Americans were allowed to withdraw unmolested to San Pedro without the loss of flags or weapons. Here they were under pledge to embark immediately upon a merchant vessel then in the harbor. But Gillespie, hoping for the arrival of one up Stockton's fleet, delayed this feature of the agreement for four days after his arrival at the harbor. At the end of that time, not knowing whether or not the message carried by Brown had reached Stockton, he spiked the cannon he had brought from Los Angeles on ox carts, threw one of them into the bay, and took his men on board the waiting Vandalia. Here Mervine found him when the Savannah reached San Pedro on the 7th. 
At six o'clock on the morning following Mervine's arrival, some three hundred men, including Gillespie's command, disembarked from the vessels and prepared to march against Los Angeles. For the first four or five miles, the mounted Californians, who were present in considerable number on the hills surrounding the landing place, made no serious attempt to retard the American advance, but confined their efforts to a few volleys at long range. Captain Mervine's force, however, found that they had entered upon something very unlike a holiday. Quote, Our march, wrote Lieutenant Robert C. Duval, one of the officers under Mervine, was performed over a continuous plain overgrown with wild mustard, rising in places to six or eight feet in height. The ground was excessively dry, the clouds of dust were suffocating, and there was not a breath of wind in motion. There was no water on our line of march for ten or twelve miles, and we suffered greatly from thirst. Residents of Southern California can appreciate how this October day surcharged with electricity and tolerably hot and without the faintest breeze except perhaps a few dry puffs from the mojave desert sucked away the spirits and reduced the energy of the marching troops so great was the exhaustion that a halt was called at half past two in the afternoon and camp made for the night on the old dominguez rancho some fifteen miles from san pedro the Californians by this time had become more threatening and were forming on a hill or plateau overlooking the American camp for a sudden onslaught. To prevent this maneuver, part of the Americans charged the enemy formation. But inasmuch as the Californians withdrew before their opponents came within effective rifle range, there was no damage done on either side. No further excitement arose until about two o'clock the next morning. Then the Californians succeeded in bringing up a small cannon with which they sent a single shot into the American camp. A detachment sent out by Mervine to capture the gun found no trace of it or of those who had fired it, but the next day it reappeared in a most effective and unpleasant fashion. Camp was broken about six o'clock on the morning of the ninth, and the march begun again toward Los Angeles. As the Americans got under way, they found the Californians drawn up on either side of the road to dispute their advance. The force, numbering about 120 men under command of Jose Carrillo, were well mounted and armed with carbines and lances. The guns were of various grades of effectiveness. The lances were eight-foot willow poles tipped with blades beaten out of files and rasps. In spite of their homemade appearance, these lances were ugly weapons in the hands of skillful horsemen. The real strength of Carrillo's company, however, lay in the little cannon which the Americans had vainly sought to capture during the preceding night. This was a bronze four-pounder, known as a pedrero or swivel gun. It had long done duty on the Los Angeles Plaza before the coming of the American forces in the firing of salutes and in the celebration of holidays. When news of Stockton's approach reached the Pueblo, at the time of his first occupation of the town, an old Mexican woman with the pride of her people, or so the story goes, had resolved to save at least one thing from the hands of the Americans. She accordingly hid this gun in the tulis near her house, only to dig it up again when Gillespie retreated to San Pedro. The piece was mounted on the front axle of an overland wagon in such a way that the range could be obtained by raising or lowering the tongue. In the Battle of Dominguez, the gun was in charge of Ignacio Aguilar, who fired it by applying a lighted cigarette to the touch hole. Eight or ten horsemen dragged it with their riatas into position or out of harm's way as necessity arose. The methods used by the Californians in the handling of this old woman's gun, as it was appropriately named, and its effectiveness in the battle can best be shown by Duval's own words, quoted by J. M. Gwynn. Quote, when within about 400 yards, the enemy opened fire on us with their artillery. We made frequent charges, driving them before us, and at one time causing them to leave some of their cannonballs and cartridges. But owing to the rapidity with which they could carry off the gun, using their lassos on every part, they were able to choose their own distance, entirely out of all range of our muskets. The horsemen kept out of danger, apparently content to let the gun do the fighting. End quote. Worn out with the futile efforts to capture the four-pounder, and convinced that further progress would result in useless loss of life, 
the Americans resolved to return to San Pedro and await a more favorable time for the capture of Los Angeles. This decision was strengthened by the report that the Pueblo was defended by some five or six hundred additional troops, and the fear that even if the town were taken, the American force would find itself cut off from communication with the supporting vessels at San Pedro and be compelled to surrender. On the retreat, Mervine's men were harassed by Carrillo's troops as long as the ammunition of the Californians held out. Getting the ever-present old woman's gun upon a hill ahead of the Americans, the Californians fired at the retiring column until their powder, which had been made at the San Gabriel mission, was wholly exhausted and the usefulness of the little cannon came to an end. When the Americans reached San Pedro, they were so thoroughly exhausted with heat and fatigue that many of them could scarcely drag one foot after the other. In addition, they had suffered in the battle, which was a clear victory for the Californians, a loss of at least four men killed or mortally wounded, and six others more or less seriously injured. The American dead were buried on a little island near the eastern entrance of San Pedro Bay. For many years previous to this, the island had borne the name of Dead Man's Island, but the burying party from the savannah christened it thus anew. At the present time, the island is rapidly disappearing before the action of wind and tide, and even now there is little left of this first burial place of American soldiers killed on California soil. The Battle of Dominguez Rancho was followed by an interval of quiet on either side. Flores was proclaimed provisional governor by a sort of rump assembly in Los Angeles, and the revolt spread to nearly every part of the province where the Americans were not in full control. San Diego and Santa Barbara both passed into the hands of their former owners, and in the north, Manuel Castro, Joaquin de la Torre, and one or two others carried on an annoying guerrilla warfare which finally culminated in the severe skirmish known as the Battle of Natividad. This engagement differed from most of the battles of the South, in that no regular United States troops took part in it. It was fought in the Salinas Valley, at one of the fords of the river some fifteen miles from Monterey. A company of sixty or seventy Americans, with a band of three hundred horses brought from Sacramento, were on their way from San Juan Bautista to join Fremont at Monterey. Learning of this, the Californians got together their scattered bands for a surprise attack, hoping, if possible, to capture the horses, and thus prevent or at least delay Fremont's march down the coast to aid Stockton against Los Angeles. The leaders of the Californians, who were close to 150 in number, were Manuel Castro, Jose Chavez, Francisco Rico, and the two de la Torres. The Americans, most of whom were settlers or newly arrived immigrants, were commanded by two recently created captains, Charles Burroughs and B.K. Thompson. In the first skirmish, a small counting party from this force, which included a number of Indians, was surrounded by Castro's men, and several of its members were killed or wounded. When the main body of Americans came up, a brief but sharp engagement followed in which the Californians, after inflicting rather serious injuries upon their opponents, retired from the field. The total American loss in this battle was about the same as that suffered by Mervine on his march from San Pedro, four or five killed and an equal number wounded. Castro's forces suffered somewhat more severely. After the engagement, most of the Californians, taking with them Thomas O'Larkin, whom they had captured the night before, retired down the coast toward Los Angeles. The Americans, in turn, withdrawing to a ranch near San Juan Batista, united with Fremont's force of 300 men from Monterey, and a little later moved south to cooperate in the capture of Los Angeles. In the meantime, the Californians had been called upon to face another American force, which was coming upon them from an unexpected quarter. The plans of the United States War Department for the conquest of Mexico called for four lines of invasion of the enemy's territory. The first, under General Taylor, aimed at the subjugation of Tamaulipas, Nuevo Leon, and Coahuila. The second, in charge of General Wool, proposed to subdue the important state of Chihuahua. The third, commanded by General Scott, struck at the Mexican capital by way of Veracruz. And the fourth, with which this narrative is alone concerned, 
had as its objective the conquest of New Mexico and California. The last force was under the command of Colonel, afterwards General, Stephen W. Kearney, an officer of considerable skill and force of character. Leaving Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, in the spring of 1846, this Army of the West, as Kearney's command was known, marched to Santa Fe and took possession of the province of New Mexico without serious difficulty. From Santa Fe, Kearney set out for the coast, where he expected to cooperate with the naval forces under Stockton and the volunteers from the American settlers in taking complete possession of California and establishing there a new government under American control. To aid Kearney in the enterprise, the War Department later sent a considerable body of reinforcements to the coast, selecting for this purpose a battalion recruited from the Mormon immigrants in Salt Lake and a regiment of New York volunteers under Colonel Stevens. The Mormon battalion, as it was called, marched overland. The New York regiment went by sea around Cape Horn. Neither force, however, reached California in time to be of any actual assistance in the conquest. With about 300 dragoons under his command, Kearney left Santa Fe on September 25th over the old Gila River Trail, which the Petis had followed some 20 years before. Near Socorro, however, he met Kit Carson, who was on his way to Washington with despatches from Stockton. Carson, having left California before the uprising in Los Angeles against Gillespie had broken out, of course knew nothing of the general revolt that had turned the province topsy-turvy since his departure. He therefore informed Kearney that American rule had been established on the coast with little opposition, and that the natives had accepted it in good part. Acting upon this information, Kearney sent back nearly two-thirds of his battalion, but having requisitioned the reluctant services of Carson as a guide, he continued his own way to California with a hundred men who remained. At the Colorado, through intercepted despatches, he learned something of the revolt in California, but the information was too meager for him to determine how serious the situation really was. In crossing the desert west of the Colorado, Kearney's force experienced the greatest privations. The animals were sometimes without water for 48 and 60 hours at a time, so that many of them died of thirst. And it was not until the party reached the little stream known as Carrizo Creek that the way again became endurable. By this time, however, both men and beasts were so exhausted that they were in no condition for a serious test of arms. On December 2nd, Kearney's troops arrived at Warner's Ranch, where an abundance of food was obtained. On the 5th, they were joined by a party of 35 men, whom Stockton, again in possession of San Diego, had sent under Gillespie and Lieutenant Beale to reinforce Kearney's detachment. There was now, between the American position in San Diego, a considerable body of well-mounted Californians led by Andreas Pico. This force was camped near the Indian village of San Pascual, and Kearney, with the approval of Gillespie, resolved to order an attack against it the following morning. Camp was broken, accordingly, before daybreak of December 6th. But the American troops were already exhausted by the long march from Santa Fe, and as the preceding night had been cold and rainy, their vitality was running at a low ebb. The Californians, moreover, had already been warned of the impending danger and were prepared to meet the advancing force. In the first attack, Captain Johnson, the leader of the charge, was instantly killed, and only the arrival of the main body under Kearney saved the advance guard from annihilation. With the appearance of this larger number of the enemy, the Californians fled, but when Kearney's troopers, poorly mounted and somewhat disorganized, were strung out in a long line of pursuit, Pico's forces suddenly wheeled and almost swept the Americans from the field. This contest, the bloodiest in the entire conquest of California, lasted upwards of half an hour before the Californians withdrew. Sixteen or eighteen Americans were killed, most of them with lances, and nearly a score seriously wounded. Among the latter were General Kearney and Captain Gillespie. The condition of the American forces after the battle was serious. Quote, our provisions were exhausted, wrote Major Emery, our horses dead, our mules on their last legs, 
and our men, now reduced to one-third of their number, were ragged, worn down by fatigue, and emaciated. End quote. The same writer elsewhere spoke of his companions as the most tattered and ill-fed detachment of men that ever the United States mustered under her colors. The Californians, though they had left the battlefield in possession of the Americans, were by no means beaten, and continued to threaten and harass the exhausted column as it strove to move forward to San Diego. Finally, though Lieutenant Godley, Fremont's famous scout, had already been sent to Stockton with a request for aid, Lieutenant Beale, Kit Carson, and an Indian were dispatched under cover of darkness to hurry forward the reinforcements, which by this time were imperatively needed. After the severest hardships, the three scouts succeeded in reaching San Diego, and on the 10th, a detachment of 180 men from Stockton's command made its welcome appearance in Kearney's camp. On the 12th, the combined forces marched without incident into San Diego. The arrival of General Kearney at San Diego was unfortunately followed by a dispute over a question of rank between himself and Commodore Stockton. The difference was at last temporarily adjusted through a compromise which left Stockton nominally in command, but put Kearney in actual charge of military operations. It was then decided that the combined forces at San Diego should move northward to cooperate with Fremont's advance from Monterey against Los Angeles. On December 29th, in keeping with this plan, some 600 men marched out of San Diego, accompanied by artillery and a baggage train, and took the road through San Luis Rey and Capistrano for Los Angeles. Their equipment was not of the best, and the going proved difficult. Of this stage of the expedition, Stockton wrote, quote, Our men were badly clothed, and their shoes generally made by themselves out of canvas. It was very cold, and the roads heavy. Our animals were all poor and weak, some of them giving out daily, which gave much hard work to the men in dragging the heavy carts, loaded with ammunition and provisions, through deep sands and up steep ascents, and the prospect before us was far from being that which we might have desired. But nothing could break down the fine spirits of those under my command, or cool their readiness and ardor to perform their duty, and they went through the whole march of 145 miles with alacrity and cheerfulness. End quote. Fortunately for the Americans, no opposition from the enemy was encountered until the expedition came to the willow lined banks of the San Gabriel River. In its course through the mountains, this stream flows through deep canyons and over a hard rocky bed, but in the lowlands, where the Americans were compelled to find a ford, the river broadens out, and in many places there is sufficient quicksand to make crossing extremely difficult. The bank opposite the ford selected by the Americans was also commanded by a high bluff, which afforded the enemy a most convenient station for his artillery. This consisted chiefly of two nine-pounders, which were well supported by squadrons of horsemen on either flank. The entire force of the Californians amounted to 500 or 600 men. General Flores was in command, with Andreas Pico and Jose Carrillo serving under him. With surprising ease, considering the strong position of the enemy, the Americans succeeded in dragging their artillery across the river and dislodged Flores from his position on the bluff. The following brief description by Major Emery, one of the participants, gives a vivid picture of the skirmish. Quote, Halfway between the hill and the river, the enemy made a furious charge on our left flank. At the same moment, our right was threatened. The first and second battalions were thrown into squares and, after firing one or two shots, drove off the enemy. The right wing was ordered to form a square, but seeing the enemy hesitate, the order was countermanded. The first battalion, which formed the right, was directed to rush the hill, supposing that that would be the contested point, but great was our surprise to find it abandoned. The enemy pitched his camp upon the hills in view, but when morning came, he was gone. End quote. Thus, in an hour and a half after the first shot was fired, the American force, baggage train and all, was across the river, and the Californians were retiring toward Los Angeles. The next day, January 9th, came the last battle on California soil. 
As the Americans proceeded from the San Gabriel River toward Los Angeles, the California horsemen again presented some slight opposition, and shortly before four o'clock in the afternoon, Flores made his last stand near the banks of the Los Angeles River. As usual, the Californians confined their activities to artillery fire at long range, supplemented by cavalry charges upon the flank and rear. These attacks resulted in but little damage, however, except to those who made them. As a matter of fact, the Californians, realizing the hopelessness of their resistance, seemed to have put but little heart in this last skirmish, and withdrew before the battle was well begun. That night, Stockton and Kearney camped on the outskirts of Los Angeles, and the next day marched to the plaza, having already received the surrender of the city from a deputation sent out by the inhabitants. Except for insulting remarks from drunken citizens and a hostile demonstration, which cost the lives of two of the Californians, the occupation of Los Angeles was accomplished without incident. Gillespie raised once more the flag, which four months previously he had been compelled to lower, and the control of the city passed forever out of Mexican hands. The capture of Los Angeles, however, did not result in the complete disbanding of the California troops. Though many of them returned to their homes and others continued to wander about the country in groups of two or three, the larger part of Flores's command retired to the San Pascual and Verdugo ranches to await developments. These came quickly with the arrival of Fremont and his battalion at the San Fernando Mission. Fremont's march down the coast, after the Battle of Natividad, had met with little opposition from the enemy. The route, however, was difficult, owing chiefly to rain and mud, and progress was consequently slow. Near San Luis Obispo, Jesus Pico, one of the leaders of the revolt, was captured and sentenced to be shot for breaking his parole. His life, however, was spared by Fremont at the interception of the prisoner's wife and family. As there were fourteen children to plead for Don Jesus, Fremont's clemency can easily be understood. After his release, Pico became a devoted friend to his benefactor and served the American cause with good purpose in the final surrender of the Californians. With Kearney and Stockton in control of Los Angeles and Fremont occupying the San Fernando Valley, further resistance on the part of the Californians was unthinkable. Flores, accordingly, surrendered his command to Andres Pico and left for Sonora. Jesus Pico was sent by Fremont to persuade the Californians to lay down their arms and make peace with the Americans. This they were already eager to do, provided favorable terms could be arranged. After some preliminary negotiations, articles of capitulation were accordingly drawn up and signed at the old Cahuenga ranch house, to which Fremont had moved his headquarters. Though the resistance of the Californians to the American forces had proved futile, it nevertheless had about it a certain dash of gallantry and enough of the old traditional bravery of Spain to excite one's admiration. The terms of this Cahuenga capitulation, as it is sometimes called, were dictated by liberality and common sense. There was to be no revenge for broken paroles, no condemnation of property, no discrimination between Californians and Americans, no restriction against the departure of anyone from the province, no oath of allegiance even until peace had been signed between the United States and Mexico. All that was required of the Californians was the surrender of their artillery and public arms consisting of two cannon and perhaps a dozen muskets, a pledge to obey the laws of the United States, and a promise to refrain from joining the war again on behalf of Mexico. It was a treaty drawn in the spirit of Polk's desire for conciliation and contained little to show that it was the result of military conquest. When Fremont and Andreas Pico put their signatures to this document on January 13, 1847, the Mexican War, so far as California was concerned, was definitely over. Mexican institutions henceforth were to give place to those of Anglo-Saxon origin. Mexican laws, Mexican customs, Mexican inefficiency were to be supplanted by American laws, American manners, and American energy. Cities were to spring up where sleepy pueblos had previously stood. The untouched resources of the generous earth, 
its mines, its forests, its leagues of uncultivated soil, were to be made to serve the needs of all mankind. A new day was about to dawn on the Pacific Slope. End of chapter 16「Seventeen: A History of California, the American Period by Robert Glass Cleland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen: The Gold Rush. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, by which California formally became a part of the United States, was signed February second, eighteen forty eight. Two weeks before, in one of the innumerable canyons of the Sierra Nevada, a man named James W. Marshall chanced upon some glittering particles in the tail race of a sawmill belonging to his employer, John A. Sutter. Before the ink was scarcely dry on the treaty, the news of Marshall's discovery had begun to set an eager world in ferment and change the whole course of California history. Footnote. Marshall's discovery occurred January 24th. The following extract from the diary of Azariah Smith one of the laborers at Sutter's Mill gives this interesting contemporary account to the event. Quote, Sunday, January 30th. Mr. Marshall having arrived, we got liberty of him and built a small house down by the mill, and last Sunday we moved into it in order to get rid of the brawlings, partial mistress, and cook for ourselves. This week Mr. Marshall found some pieces of, as we all suppose, gold, and he has gone to the fort for the purpose of finding out it is found in the raceway in small pieces. Some have been found that would weigh five dollars, in quote, in footnote. Gold had been found in California long before Marshall gathered it out of the tail race of the mill on the south fork of the American River. Seven years before, in the Santa Feliciana Canyon of the San Fernando Hills back of Los Angeles, Francisco Lopez, a native Californian, came upon traces of the metal as he was digging up wild onions in the shade of an oak tree under which he had stopped to rest. This discovery led to much excitement in the southern part of the province, and even brought a considerable number of prospectors from Sonora, Mexico, to the newly opened field. In spite of lack of water, these San Fernando deposits were worked successfully for a number of years, yielding some four or five thousand dollars annually in gold dust and small nuggets. Mines of other metals, notably the exceptionally rich quicksilver deposits of New Almadane, where the mercury was first obtained by heating the ore in gun barrels, were also in operation before 1848. But until Marshall's accidental discovery, the great treasure of the California mountains remained unsuspected by foreign visitor and native resident alike. Considering all the circumstances, this is one of the strangest facts in California history. The Spaniards who conquered Mexico were among the most indefatigable miners the world has ever seen. For more than two centuries after the landing of Cortes, the history of New Spain was largely the history of men interested in the saving of precious souls or of men interested in the discovery of precious metals. From Mexico City northward to Nuevo León in Chihuahua, westward to the Pacific, northward to Sonora, New Mexico and Arizona, the conquistadores and their descendants prospected for gold and silver, joined in the hectic excitement of one mining rush after another, and exploited a thousand rich deposits discovered by their industry and their never-failing zeal. Why these same people, so successful and zealous as miners in Mexico, failed to find the vast treasures of the Sierra Nevada, which nature made almost no attempt to conceal, will always remain a curious problem. The effect of the discovery of gold upon California's destiny, if this had happened under Spanish or Mexican rule, has already been pointed out by one of the most authoritative of the state's historians. Assuredly, it was the whim of fate, or the hand of a guiding providence, that delayed this discovery until the territory had come into the possession of the United States. When Marshall and Sutter became convinced that the bits of yellow metal which remained in the tail race were actually gold, they agreed together to keep the matter secret, not so much apparently because they wished to preempt the deposit as because they feared the mining craze might carry off the needed laborers from Sutter's wheat fields, mills, and numerous other undertakings. To cover up such a discovery for any length of time was difficult. 
Yet, for nearly six weeks, few people outside those at the mill knew of its event. Inevitably, however, the secret at last became public. Teamsters coming in from the outside heard of the find and carried the news back to the coast. Mormon immigrants, many of whom worked for Sutter, spread the report among their co-religionists, and Sutter's own agent, sent to Monterey to obtain a grant or patent to the mining rights, told nearly everything he knew about the discovery. At Monterey on May 29th, Walter Colton, the American alcalde, made this entry in his diary, quote, Our town was startled out of its quiet dreams today by the announcement that gold had been discovered on the American fork. The men wondered and talked, and the women too, but neither believed. The Sibyls were less skeptical. They said that the moon had, for several nights, appeared not more than a cable's length from the earth, that a white ram had been seen playing with an infant, and that an owl had rung the church bells. End quote. On June 20th, after several other reports had been received, and the alcalde himself had dispatched a special investigator to the gold region, this entry was made in the same diary showing how great an effect the excitement was already having upon the normal life of Monterey. Quote, My messenger has returned with specimens of gold. He dismounted in a sea of upturned faces. As he drew forth the yellow lumps from his pockets and passed them around among the eager crowd, the doubts, which had lingered till now, fled. The excitement produced was intense, and many were soon busy in their hasty preparations for a departure to the mines. The family who had kept house for me caught the moving infection. Husband and wife were both packing up. The blacksmith dropped his hammer, the carpenter his plane, the mason his trowel, the farmer his sickle, the baker his loaf, and the tapster his bottle. All were off for the mines, some on horses, some on carts, and some on crutches, and one went in a litter. An American woman, who had recently established a boarding house here, pulled up stakes and went off before her lodgers had even time to pay their bills. Debtors ran, of course. I have only a community of women left and a gang of prisoners with here and there a soldier who will give his captain the slip at the first chance. End quote. On June 28th, Thomas O'Larkin, still serving in his consular capacity, wrote to Buchanan, quote, Three-fourths of the houses in the town on the Bay of San Francisco are deserted. Houses are sold at the price of building lots. The effects are this week showing themselves in Monterey. Almost every house I had hired out is given up. Every blacksmith, carpenter, and lawyer is leaving. Brickyards, sawmills, ranches are left perfectly alone. A large number of the volunteers at San Francisco and Sonoma have deserted. Public and private vessels are losing their crews. Both of our newspapers are discontinued from want of workmen and the loss of their agencies. The alcaldes have left San Francisco, and I believe Sonoma likewise. The former place has not a justice of the peace left. End quote. Governor Mason, who made a tour of the mines about the time Larkin's letter was written, along the whole route found mills lying idle, houses deserted, fields of standing wheat turned open to cattle, and farms left uncultivated. Ships were deserted as fast as they arrived on the coast. Soldiers left their garrisons and men closed their shops until, without serious exaggeration, one writer could say, quote, The whole country is now moving on to the mines. Monterey, San Francisco, Sonoma, San Jose, and Santa Cruz are emptied of their male population. Every bowl, tray, warming pan, and pigeon has gone to the mines. Everything in short that has a scoop in it that will hold sand and water. All the iron has been worked up into crowbars pickaxes, and spades. End quote. This wholesale stampede from the coast to the mining regions is not to be wondered at. In those first exciting days, especially before the great influx of 1849, gold awaited every comer. Stream beds, hillsides, and rock crevices all alike yielded treasure. Two men in seven days obtained $17,000 from a trench a few feet wide and a hundred feet long. A soldier on 20 days furlough, who spent half his time going to and from the mines, made $1,500 in 10 days of actual mining. Seven Americans, with the aid of 50 Indians, whom they paid presumably in cheap merchandise, took out 275 pounds of gold in a little more than six weeks. Ten men made $1,500 each in 10 days. 
A single miner obtained two pounds and a half of gold in fifteen minutes. A group of Mexicans were seen gambling with a hundred pounds of gold dust and nuggets serving as the bank. In less than half an hour, a man picked up between five and six ounces of gold out of an open hole in the rock, as fast as one can pick the kernels out of a lot of well-cracked shell barks. A rancher named Sinclair, employing Indians as helpers, cleaned up 14 pounds, average Hua, not Troy, in a week's time. On a tour of the mines, the editor of the Californian, which had recently been established at Monterey, averaged $100 a day using only a shovel, pick, and pan. The striking thing about the mining industry, as it was carried on for the first few months, however, was not the lucky finds of a few, but the assured profit for practically everyone who engaged in it. The average return was from $10 to $50 a day, and by August it was reliably estimated that $600,000 had been secured from the various diggings. Authoritative news of the phenomenal discovery reached the states in time for President Polk to comment upon it in his December message to Congress. But some time before this official announcement, the eastern newspapers were full of rumors and reports about the California gold fields, which the public generally accepted with tolerant incredulity. When at last, however, people ceased to doubt and began to believe, such excitement followed as a nation had never known before, or will ever know of its kind again. By the close of 1848, every city, large or small, from the frontiers of Missouri to the Atlantic seaboard, was affected by the California fever. Men were selling out of their business, families were breaking up their homes, officials were resigning their positions, and professional men were getting rid of their practice. Literally scores of companies and associations were being formed by persons planning to make the trip to California. Many of these were organized on a cooperative basis, each member contributing a certain share to the common expense and enjoying equal rights with his fellow members. Other companies were financed by persons themselves unable to make the journey, but who wished to share in the fabulous wealth that every letter and returned traveler reported from the California fields. Thus, there was a Sag Harbor California Mining Association, the Boston and California Mining and Trading Joint Stock Company, with Edward Everett as its patron, the New York Yellow Fever Mining Company, the Manhattan California Overland Association, the Congress and California Mutual Protective Association, and no one knows how many other companies of the same kind. Yet few, if any of these innumerable associations, were able to stand the strain of the passage to California, or of the new environment their members found in the mining camps. Too often, friendships or mutual agreements, formed in an atmosphere where social and business relations followed a well-defined code, were wrenched apart and hopelessly broken by the new conditions of life in California. Naturally enough, the newspaper seized upon the gold excitement with the greatest avidity. Letters, reports, and rumors from California were eagerly sought after and given first place in the news columns. Fortunately, no matter how great the exaggeration in these articles, the actual production of the fields in nearly every case surpassed the imagination of the writer, and fiction again lagged after truth. The reports from California that appeared in the newspapers were also supplemented by many byproducts of the craze. Footnote. About this time, Mrs. Elizabeth Farnham, widow of the well-known author-traveler Thomas Jefferson Farnham, who had died in San Francisco in 1848, was seeking to organize a party of 130 women in New York to go to the coast, in company with six or eight respectable married men and their families, to become the wives of bachelor miners. None of the party were to be under 25 years of age, and each was to furnish $250 as expense money for the trip. In footnote. There were advertisements of businesses for sale, because the owners were leaving to search for gold. There were descriptions of the various overland routes to California, and lists of stout and trustworthy vessels about to sail for San Francisco. Notices of gold dust receipts at Atlantic ports stood side by side with accounts of villains who had abandoned wives and families for the mines. A single issue of the New York Herald contained over 40 advertisements designed to interest buyers about to leave for California. 
Among the articles advertised were an acid and test stone appliance for detecting gold, Hunt's patent gold extracting engine, Bruce's hydrocentrifugal chrysolite or California gold finder, and other essentials of similar character. Lamps guaranteed against upsetting were advertised on the same page with books for pleasant reading on shipboard. Mining treatises, Spanish grammars, and guidebooks for the route were almost as numerous as Buena Vista rifles, pistol belts, and holsters. Who is for California? A company in the process of organization challenged. And in the next column, a physician offered his services to a party bound for the Pacific coast. The New York Washing and Mining Association advertised for recruits, and another enterprising company sought a housekeeper for its California hotel. Preserved meats, soups, spiced oysters, and sauerkraut put up in canisters and warranted for 21 years, saddles, guns, tents, assaying outfits, blankets, India rubber goods, Dana's system of mineralogy, and California overcoats were all brought to the attention of the prospective miner. He was implored to buy a copy of the Crom Thermal System of Medicine, since fully half the miners of California were down with fever, and to have his daguerreotype taken as a farewell remembrance for the dear ones who remained behind. About the only items omitted from the list were coffins and nursing bottles. There is no way of determining, even with a fair degree of accuracy, how many persons came to California from the rest of the United States in the years immediately following the discovery of gold. The migration, however, was so stupendous as to outrank in point of numbers anything of its kind in the nation's history, and to stand on an equal footing with some of the great world movements of population. The whole country, it seemed, was singing the doggerel verse of one of the Argonauts, and thousands upon thousands were actually putting it into practice. Quote, oh, California, that's the land for me. I'm bound for the Sacramento with a washbowl on my knee. End quote. Throughout the winter, the overland routes were closed to travel, so the earliest influx came by sea. During the first week of February, 1849, 50 vessels sailed from American ports for San Francisco. By the middle of March, 17,000 persons had taken passage from cities on the Gulf and Atlantic coasts, and before the year closed, 230 American vessels reached California harbors. The overland migration, when it began, was even larger than that which came by sea. Within three weeks, during the spring of 1849, nearly 18,000 persons crossed the Missouri River for California. A single observer counted 1,100 wagons on the prairies beyond Independence. From the Missouri frontier to Fort Laramie, the procession of emigrants passed in an unbroken stream for more than two months toward the west. By day, this long train of wagons and other vehicles, for they were of all types and descriptions, the herds of animals and the crowds of men, women, and children, gave the impression of a whole nation on the move. At night, the glow of innumerable campfires on the prairies shone like the lights of populous cities. Fully 35,000 people took part in this great overland movement of 1849, a year that rightly occupies a unique place in California and national annals. The chief sea routes to California were by way of Cape Horn and the Isthmus of Panama. The former, made as it was at first chiefly by sailing vessels, for steam navigation was still in its infancy, required from six to nine months, a much longer time than impatient gold seekers could afford to give, and was characterized by no little danger and hardship. Just before the gold rush began, however, William H. Aspinall had organized the Pacific Mail Steamship Company and started the construction of three small steamers, of about a thousand tons each, to run from New York to San Francisco. The first of these, the California, left New York on October 6, 1848, shortly before Marshall's discovery became known. When the vessel reached Panama on January 30, 1849, hundreds of gold seekers who had come by sea to the Isthmus and crossed overland to the Pacific were waiting almost in a frenzy for passage to San Francisco. Some 400 of these were taken on board to find accommodations as best they could in a vessel designed for only a 100 passengers. 
Many of these paid as high as $1,000 for a steerage ticket from Panama to California. The California reached San Francisco on February 28th, the first of a long line of transports laden to the water's edge with New World Argonauts. Those who reached California by the Panama route had much to try physical endurance and test their patience. The voyage from New York to Chagres, on the Caribbean side of the Isthmus, required about two weeks' time and cost from $80 to $150. If the passage could be obtained in a satisfactory ship, this portion of the trip might well prove delightful. But as the number of seaworthy vessels was wholly inadequate to supply the demand, every sort of sailing craft was pressed into service, and even if the vessel escaped foundering in mid-ocean, the passengers were sure to suffer every form of discomfort and annoyance to which travelers are heir. From Chagres, the first stage of the journey across the Isthmus was made by native canoe to the head of the Chagres River, and thence by pack train to the Pacific. The canoes were twenty or twenty-five feet long, carried ten or twelve passengers besides the five or six Indians who pulled them, and made about a mile an hour, when the natives bestirred themselves. Tropical storms, heat, bad drinking water, and voracious insects added to the pleasure of the voyage. But while these things, coupled even with the delay and squalor of the native huts where the immigrants were often forced to lodge, could be endured, there were two grim enemies that brought death instead of mere discomfort. These were Asiatic cholera and the Chagres fever. When the coast was reached, another long wait was in store for the Californians. Frequently, weeks passed before a passage could be secured to San Francisco. The old city of Panama, witness of so much tragedy and heroic undertaking from the time of Balboa onward, surely never saw stranger sights than in those bustling days of 49, when the Americans poured down from the crest of the mountains on foot or on muleback to wait the arrival of some long-expected vessel to carry them on to the land of El Dorado. For two years, the newcomers virtually took possession of the city. Some of the more enterprising set up hotels and opened shops to cater to the needs of their companions. Footnote. One of the most successful of these immigrant merchants was Collis P. Huntington, of later railroad fame. In footnote. Others of different taste even started a newspaper, which outlasted the mushroom community that gave it birth. Many of the more impatient immigrants chartered small sailboats and bravely set out for California without waiting for the larger vessels. And it is even said that some companies, more adventurous or ignorant than the rest, actually sought to make the 5,000-mile journey from Panama to San Francisco in log canoes. With the adventures, hardships, and tragedies of these irregular expeditions, there's no space to deal. But what fine gold still remains in the tailings of California history. Besides the way around South America and across Panama or Nicaragua, there were half a dozen combination routes to California involving both an overland journey and an ocean voyage. Many of the immigrants sailed from New York or New Orleans to Veracruz, traveling thence by way of Mexico City and Guadalajara to take ship on the Pacific at Acapulco or San Blas. Others landed at Tampico and made the trip across Mexico by way of a more northern route to the harbors of Mazatlan and Guaymas on the Gulf. Still others crossed the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, hoping to find a vessel at Salina Cruz to carry them on to California. At least one thing was common to all these various routes. Whichever he chose, the gold seeker was sure to encounter hardships in numerous and terrifying forms. Sometimes disease carried off his companions, one after another around him. Sometimes an accidental gunshot or willful murder threw the shadow of death over a little camp. Again, brigands might strip the company of all its ready money and supplies. Or, failing these misfortunes, there were always cold, flood, thirst, desert heat, and scarcity of food to be reckoned with on the overland portion of the expedition. And on the sea, Danger from storm, failure of the ship's stores, shortage of water, and sudden attack of the Black Plague cholera. A few companies were entirely blotted out by some unknown catastrophe and never heard from again. 
Others escape similar disaster by grim perseverance or merely the whim of a kindlier fate. In addition to the various sea or sea and land routes to California, there were also several principal overland trails supplemented by many cut-offs or diversions from the main routes. The most traveled of these overland routes was the old historic path of the fur trader and the early emigrant along the Platte, up the Sweetwater, through the South Pass, to Bear River and Fort Hall. Thence, most of the caravans turned south to the Mormon settlement at Salt Lake, entering California by way of the Humboldt and Truckee rivers. Others took the trail to Oregon, reaching the Sacramento by the Willamette and Shasta route. Still others, after reaching the Sierra, followed along the eastern slope through the Owens Valley till Walker Pass, or perhaps to Hatchapi, furnished a gateway to the San Joaquin. From Salt Lake, Others took the recently opened Mormon Trail to San Bernardino, a route the Los Angeles-Salt Lake branch of the Union Pacific now closely parallels. Another main highway of the gold seekers reached California by way of Santa Fe. From Missouri to New Mexico, this route had long been known through the agency of the St. Louis-Santa Fe trade. From Santa Fe westward, there was a choice of two routes— one, the Old Pati Trail, ran through Socorro and along the Gila to the Colorado, thence crossing to the coast by way of Warner's Ranch. The second, following Wolfskill's path of the early 30s and the route of the old Santa Fe-Los Angeles caravans, reached the Colorado by way of the Grand, Green, Sevier, and Virgin Rivers. From the Colorado, the trail continued on to Southern California by way of the Cajon or east of the Cajon, turned northward to the San Joaquin by either the Tehachapi or Tejon Pass. Still another route from Santa Fe ran directly south to Chihuahua and Old Mexico. Thence, one of the long-used Spanish trails carried the emigrant across the mountains into Sonora and eventually brought him by way of Altar and Tubac to the regular Gila River Trail over which he traveled to the Colorado. The magnitude of the migrations over these various overland routes cannot adequately be described. Men, women, and children took part in it, for the movement, at least from the frontier states, was not merely the rush of men excited by tales of wealth to a land where they expected to make but a temporary residence. It was the transplanting of a population, the migration of families to find a new and permanent home. Much of the so-called Great Migration was indeed merely a new phase of that overland movement that had begun in 1841 with the arrival of the Bidwell Party, and had already assumed very considerable proportions a number of years before the discovery of gold. Many parties, of course, even from western communities, were made up entirely of men. But in the typical overland company, the unit was the family rather than the individual. Nearly every wagon carried furniture and household goods for the new home on the Pacific. The Westerner who started, well, let us say, from independence in the spring of 1849 for the gold fields of California looked upon the undertaking as nothing unusual except perhaps for the distance involved. His whole previous life had been spent in just such migrations on a smaller scale. Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, and finally Missouri each in turn had witnessed the erection of his crude log cabin, evidence of the sure approach of civilization, and had claimed him for a temporary citizen. By 1849, this nomadic settler was ready for the final move to California. The ordinary means of travel employed by the emigrants was the familiar prairie schooner, probably first made use of in the Santa Fe trade. These were usually drawn by three or four yoke of oxen, though sometimes horses or mules were used instead. Generally, a number of cows were also driven along to furnish a reserve supply of food or to serve as substitutes for broken down or lost oxen. While this was the typical equipment, many of the immigrants had vehicles of other types or employed pack animals alone. Some, indeed, were foolish enough to attempt the journey with wheelbarrows and push carts. Besides supplies of food, coffee, sugar, bacon, dried apples, and the like, every well-to-do company took with it a large amount of bedding, many cooking utensils, guns, axes, and even heavy household furniture, such as bedsteads, tables, and bureaus, or equally heavy farming implements and mining tools. 
The organization of most companies was similar to that adopted by the earlier immigrants of the Bidwell Donner type, and their method of travel in no material way differed from that of their predecessors. The large number of animals passing over well-established routes furnished a more serious problem in the matter of forage, however, than the pre-49ers had been forced to meet, and this often compelled companies to seek less frequented trails where grass was more abundant. Indian difficulties were few during the first years of the gold rush, but every other trouble was met with in abundance. Cholera ravaged many of the trains, in some cases wiping out entire families. Other diseases, such as scurvy, likewise took heavy toll, and death by accident was also a frequent occurrence. Often a company's animals gave out, or ran off, and in crossing rivers, wagons, animals, and men alike were sometimes swept away by flood or sucked down by quicksand. Crime, even of the basest sort, was not unknown. But more commonly, where violence was done, it was due to some outburst of sudden anger or resulted from nerves frayed beyond the breaking point by long-continued anxiety and strain. On the northern route, the most difficult part of the journey lay beyond Fort Hall. Between Salt Lake and the Sierra, the line of travel was marked. More plainly than ever, a modern boulevard was posted by enterprising automobile clubs with broken-down wagons, abandoned equipment, dead animals, and bleaching bones. A single entry in the diary of James Abbey, himself one of the 49ers, shows better than all the second-hand descriptions that have ever been written what the toll was paid on this portion of the route west of the Humboldt Sink. Quote, August 2nd, started out by four o'clock this morning, at six stopped to cook our breakfast and lighten our wagons by throwing away the heavier portions of our clothing and such other articles as we can best spare. We pushed on today with as much speed as possible to get through the desert, but our cattle gave such evident signs of exhaustion that we were compelled to stop. The desert through which we are passing is strewn with dead cattle, mules, and horses. I counted, in a distance of 15 miles, 350 dead horses, 280 oxen, 120 mules, and hundreds of others are left behind, unable to keep up. A tan yard or slaughterhouse is a flower garden in comparison. A train from Missouri have today shot 20 oxen. Vast amounts of valuable property have been abandoned and thrown away in this desert. Leather trunks, clothing, wagons, etc., to the value of at least $100,000 in about 20 miles. I have counted in the last 10 miles 362 wagons, which in the States cost about $120 apiece. End quote. With Abby's description as a background, one's imagination can picture something of the distress and suffering endured by the immigrants who came the northern route. Yet those who took the Gila Trail were equally unfortunate. John W. Audubon, son of the famous ornithologist and a naturalist of no mean ability himself, found the road east of Colorado garnished almost every league with dead cattle, horses, or oxen. Every camping place was littered with wagons, implements, and personal effects thrown away by the passing trains. The worst stretch of this route, however, lay through the Colorado desert west of the Yuma villages. Here, at the so-called lagoons, Audubon, who had traveled by the route across northern Mexico, came upon a scene of desolation more fearful than anything he had previously seen in all his arduous journey. He describes it thus, quote, Broken wagons, dead, shriveled-up cattle, horses and mules as well, lay baking in the sun, around the dried-up wells that had been opened in the hopes of getting water. Not a blade of grass or green thing of any kind relieved the monotony of the parched, ash-colored earth, and the most melancholy scene presented itself that I had ever seen since I left the Rio Grande. End quote. Travel, even over the well-established routes to California, was thus beset with hardship during the period of the gold rush. But where parties turned off to seek new trails, Fate dealt with them even more relentlessly. The most tragic of such cases occurred in that grim region lying east of Owens River, which ever since has borne the name of Death Valley. Two companies, at least, were caught in this waste of sand and desolation during the migration of 1849, 
and the valley dealt with them in pitiless fashion. The story of the first of these parties has been left us by William Lewis Manley, one of its members. His company, having reached Green River by way of the South Pass, attempted the impossible feat of going down the Colorado in an old ferry boat. They succeeded in getting somewhat beyond the spot where Ashley had painted his name on the canyon walls in 1824, but at last were compelled to abandon the river and strike out on foot toward the west. Without serious difficulty, they reached the regular Salt Lake Los Angeles Trail, where they found a large number of wagons bound for California. Manley and his associates joined this company of emigrants, but instead of following the regular route to the Mojave villages, a part of the train, led by Captain Smith, turned off near Mountain Meadows, intending to travel directly west to the San Joaquin. Manley and a friend of his named Bennett, who was in command of several wagons, together with one of the Green River adventurers known as Rogers, followed Smith's party. Before the desert was reached, several of the company turned back to the regular Los Angeles Trail. The rest split into two divisions. One of these, calling themselves the Jayhawkers and composed almost entirely of unmarried men, set off ahead, leaving the men with women and children to get on as best they could. Before this main company had proceeded very far, the outlook became alarming, and when they at last entered the sandy wastes of Death Valley, it was seen that help must be secured or the entire party would perish. Manley and Rogers volunteered to go for aid and with such provisions as could be spared set out for the California settlements. Of the privations experienced by Manley and Rogers on this trip, or of the sufferings endured by the thirteen grown persons and seven children who remained behind, the writer is not competent to speak. It is enough to say that the two messengers, after conquering starvation, sand, fatigue, and thirst, at last reached the little town of San Fernando, a few miles north of Los Angeles, where they obtained supplies and a few pack animals, and then set out again for the Valley of Death to rescue their companions. When the two came again within sight of the camp, which they had left twenty-six days before, some of the wagons were missing, and there was no sign of life about. A few miles back, they had already passed one member of the company, dead on the sand, with his arms extended wide in this little canteen made of two powder flasks lying by his side. It was doubtful whether any of the company, which they had risked so much to rescue, had survived. Manley fired off his gun. A man came out from under a wagon, looked all around without seeing anyone. Quote, then, to use Manley's words, he threw up his arms high over his head and shouted, The boys have come! The boys have come! The great suspense was over, and our hearts were first in our mouths, and then the blood all went away and left us almost fainting as we stood and tried to step. Bennett and Arcane caught us in their arms and embraced us with all their strength, and Mrs. Bennett, when she came, fell down on her knees and clung to me like a maniac in the great emotion that came to her, and not a word was spoken. Unquote. The story of the final escape of the party, though certainly not the least heroic in the annals of the westward movement, cannot be given here. Once out of Death Valley, the route lay along the eastern slope of the Sierra, past Walker's Pass, through Red Rock Canyon, across the Mojave, through Soledad Canyon, and on to San Fernando. The Salt Lake Trail near Mountain Meadows was left on November 4th, 1849. The survivors reached the plenty and safety of the California settlements March 7, 1850. As for the Jayhawkers and the few other members on the train who had separated from the Bennett Manley party, their story is also one of tragedy and suffering. Small groups became detached from the main company and sought to make their own way across the valley. One of these parties, consisting of 11 members, remained unheard of for many years. Two of its number were afterwards found working in the gold mines of Northern California, and in 1856 a prospecting expedition in Death Valley came upon an abandoned camp around which were the skeletons of nine men. In addition to these victims, at least two more of the Jayhawkers died in the valley, and one succumbed while crossing the Mojave Desert. Traveling sometimes with and sometimes apart from the Jayhawkers was a clergyman named Briar, his wife, and three small children, the oldest of whom was nine. 
Like the noble women of the Donner Party, Mrs. Breyer proved a constant source of inspiration and courage to her companions. And in the many stories of California heroism, none deserves a higher place than hers. Many years after the expedition, she was induced to tell something of her experiences. The following brief extract is taken from that narrative. Quote, the valley ended in a canyon with great walls rising up almost as high as we could see. There seemed no way out, for it ended almost in a straight wall. Father Fish died that night. I made coffee for him, but he was all worn out. Isham died that night, too. It was always the same, hunger and thirst and an awful silence. In the morning, the men returned with the same story, no water. Even the stoutest heart sank then, for nothing but sagebrush and dagger trees greeted the eye. My husband tied little Kirk to his back and staggered ahead. The child would murmur occasionally, Oh, father, where's the water? His pitiful, delirious wails were worse to hear than the killing thirst. It was terrible. I seemed to see it all over again. I staggered and struggled wearily behind our other two boys and the oxen. The little fellows bore up bravely and hardly complained, though they could barely talk, so dry and swollen were their lips and tongue. John would try to cheer up his brother Kirk by telling him of the wonderful water we would find and all the good things we would get to eat. Every step I expected to sink down and die. I could hardly see. End quote. That any of the California immigrants who entered Death Valley in 1849 emerged from it alive was due to the cooler weather of the winter months and the kindness of fate. Not even the latter could have saved them if they had sought to cross in the heat of midsummer. Such miracles are not performed when the thermometer stands at 140 degrees in a valley below the level of the sea, where all but 1% of the moisture has been sucked from the atmosphere, and where men go insane if deprived of water for so much as an hour. The Death Valley tragedy occupies a unique place in the annals of the 49ers because of the horrors connected with it. Yet a fate scarcely less terrible, but of a different nature, was narrowly averted in the case of thousands of immigrants who left Salt Lake toward the close of summer or early in the fall, intending to cross the Sierra before snow closed the passes. These latecomers found the grass along the route almost used up by earlier trains. Water was scarce and so unfit to drink that beasts and men alike were made sick by it. In places, the road was so cut up by constant use that clouds of alkali dust enveloped every wagon, making travel difficult and slow. Cholera and scurvy attacked many of the companies, and exhaustion from the long journey and lack of food reduced others to a condition of despair. The chief danger, however, was the coming of winter. If this should set in before the worn-out emigrants were safely through the mountains, the tragedies of Donner Lake and Death Valley would be multiplied a hundredfold. Fortunately, as early as August, this danger was realized by General Persifor H. Smith, who had recently arrived by way of Panama to take charge of the United States forces in California. And in conjunction with Governor Riley, he dispatched a few relief trains across the Sierra to aid the stragglers to get through. As the season grew later, Reports reached the cities and mining communities of California that thousands of emigrants still east of the mountains were in desperate straits, and unless help were sent, would perish before they could reach a place of safety. Lack of food had driven many of them, with disastrous results, to eat the putrefying flesh of oxen or mules that had died along the way. Others had lost all their animals from disease, or at the hands of the Indians, who were now becoming much more troublesome and were striving to make their way across the mountains on foot. To add to the danger, snow had commenced to fall much earlier than usual in the High Sierra, making the passes more difficult every day and threatening a complete blockade before the emigrants could get through. The emergency, great as it was, was met successfully by the organization of relief trains and the transportation of large quantities of supplies across the mountains. The work was largely in the hands of United States Army officers, with Major Rucker in command. In the face of great difficulties, he succeeded in bringing the last of the emigrant trains of 1849 through the snows before the route became impassable. 
though some of the parties had already been three days without food when the government supplies arrived. Many of the companies which reached Salt Lake late in the summer of 1849, instead of completing their journey that year, remained until spring in the Mormon city. Much has been written of the treatment received by the gold seekers from Brigham Young's followers during this period, but the testimony is too nearly divided between good and ill for an authoritative conclusion to be reached. The Mormons certainly took advantage of the immigrants' needs to charge high prices, 75 cents a pound for meat, 50 cents a gallon for milk, $500 for a wagon were the prevailing rates. But later on, when the gold seekers reached the Sierra, they found their fellow Gentiles at least as skillful at profiteering as the Mormons. The story of the migration of 1850, except in detail, differs little from that of the preceding year. The spring months saw thousands of wagons filled with men, women, and children, household goods, food, and treasured possessions of every kind taking the westward way. Along the route, the drama of 1849 was reenacted. Cholera, scurvy, dysentery, accident, thirst, hunger, fatigue, Indian attack, quarrels, discouragement, and every other ill attacked the trains. Against these foes were set hope, ambition, steady determination, patience, humor, and the fighting spirit of the frontier. Here a train pauses in its slow progress toward the Pacific to bury one of its members. Another, within sight, stops a few brief hours while a woman gives birth to a child. Days of easy travel with abundance of food, grass for the animals, light-heartedness, music, and good cheer around the evening camp alternate with days of tragedy and unspeakable hardships. Again, in 1850, as in 1849, disaster threatened many of the immigrants who attempted to cross the Sierra late in the season. In September, the Humboldt route was crowded with trains, most of them in desperate straits because of loss of animals, sickness, or lack of food, while farther north along the Pitt River were other immigrants equally destitute and subject in addition to Indian depredations. Once more, relief parties were formed and supplies sent to the sufferers. Voluntary organizations in Stockton, San Francisco, Marysville, and other communities collected money with which to purchase food and dispatched pack trains across the mountains. Newspapers and individuals spread the appeal for funds, and money soon poured in from mining settlements and ranches as well as from the cities. The heart of all California was touched with that sympathy and liberality which have since become the proverbial heritage of the state. Perhaps the chiefest of the Good Samaritans of this early day was William Waldo, a member of the Relief Committee of Sacramento. No man was more untiring in his efforts to rescue the threatened immigrants, or so quick in his sympathies for their sufferings. Early in September, he dispatched a letter from his camp on the Humboldt, where he had gone with supplies, to the Relief Committee at Sacramento. An extract from this dispatch will show, better than any other description, something of Waldo's generosity and the desperate need he found among the trains. Quote, Should your committee, wrote Waldo, still be unable to collect funds, I then ask that the committee, city council, or some other body of men advance to the amount of eight or ten thousand dollars and forward the amount in flour and little articles for the sick to this point and to the summit, for which I pledge my honor if I live to return where it can be legally done to set over all my right, title, and interest to real estate in Sacramento City that has cost me $10,000. This sum will send between twenty and 25,000 pounds of flour to the summit. This, in connection with the beef, horses, mules, and dead stock that can be jerked before it putrefies, will save 10,000 human beings from starvation. A man can live very well upon half a pound of beef and a quarter of a pound of flour per day. I again repeat that these people must be relieved or they must die and that by starvation. Can you believe that the destitution is so general that during an absence of six days from this station I found but two trains of which I could procure a piece of bread and a cup of coffee? I have known a cup of soup containing not more than one spoonful of flour to sell for one dollar 
and the buyer considered himself fortunate to get it on those terms. End quote. Thanks to the efforts of Waldo, Colonel Ralston, Major Sherman, and others of like kind, and the generous response of the people of California, disaster was averted in 1850 as it had been in 1849. Aid was given not only to those on the central and northern routes, but also to the equally unfortunate caravans coming by way of the Gila. One cannot picture the outcome if this help had been denied. Even so, it is said 1,500 graves were counted between Salt Lake and Sacramento along the Truckee route alone. Of such magnitude was the toll paid in the Great Migration. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 A History of California, the American Period by Robert Glass Cleland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 Statehood while the immigration spoken of in the previous chapter was in progress, California was face to face with the serious problem of establishing a government adequate to meet the new conditions. The American conquest, in fact, had ushered in an era of political transition. During the first three years of American possession, from 1846 to 1849, the newly acquired territory enjoyed almost as many rulers as in the old days of Mexican control, when frequently the province was blessed with two governors at a time and once with triplets. Sloat, who assumed command of California in his proclamation of July 7, 1846, gave place to Stockton before the month was out. Stockton, despite the claims of General Kearney, remained in control until shortly after the middle of January 1847. He then passed over the governorship to Fremont, who in turn was superseded by Kearney early in March. Within 60 days, Kearney was succeeded by Mason, and Mason resigned in favor of Riley on April 12, 1849. During much of this period, particularly after the ratification of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the political status of the newly acquired territory was in a state of curious uncertainty. The government during this year has been described as, quote, part military and part civil and part no government at all. The laws were mostly variant and variously conceived, the civil law, the Pike County Code, the New York Code, the common law, maritime law, the law of the plains, military law, and the miners' law were all jumbled up together, and the courts were as unique as the government and the laws. They were Americo-Mexican, military-civil, and with a good degree of the vigilante. Presumably, under international law, the laws and institutions of Mexico already existing in California should have remained in effect until definitely superseded by congressional legislation. As a matter of fact, however, the Mexican form of government was so ill-suited to American tastes and the needs of the country that this theory, except in occasional instances, was wholly abandoned, and then the successive governors found themselves compelled to work out a more practical program of their own. The most striking instance of the few attempts to maintain institutions of Mexican origin was in the case of the Alcalde appointments made by Commodore Stockton. One of the Americans who sat in this seat of old-time Spanish authority was the Reverend Walter Colton, chosen by Stockton to serve as alcalde at Monterey. For three years, Colton filled his office, the duties of which he thus described, quote, By the laws and usages of the country, the judicial functions of the alcalde of Monterey extend to all cases, civil and criminal, arising within the middle department of California. He is also the guardian of the public peace, and is charged with the maintenance of law and order, whenever and wherever threatened or violated. He must arrest, fine, imprison, or sentence to the public works the lawless and refractory, and he must enforce, through his executive powers, the decisions and sentences which he has pronounced in his judicial capacity. His prerogatives and official duties extend over all the multiplied interests and concerns of his department, and reach to every grievance and crime from the jar that trembles around the domestic hearth to the guilt which throws its gloom of the gallows in the grave. 
Colton's apt description shows plainly enough why the American population of California, trained as it was to cherish the jury system and the constitutional limitation of authority, vigorously criticized the arbitrary powers lodged in the hands of the alcaldes, and did not willingly accept any other institutions of Spanish origin. As a result of this attitude, except in those communities like Monterey, where the newcomers formed a comparatively small element of the population, the Mexican laws were never applied, or, having been put into effect, were speedily rendered ineffectual by the strong opposition that developed against them. So it came about that in most of the distinctively American settlements, such as Sacramento or the mining communities, whatever government existed was almost wholly of local origin. In San Francisco, where the government for a time was lodged in the hands of an alcalde and ayuntamiento, or town council, the settlers finally took matters into their own hands, following a period in which two rival councils each claimed to be legally elected, and established a body new both to American and Spanish law known as the Legislative Assembly. This assembly, consisting of 15 members chosen by popular vote, sought to abolish the former ayuntamiento and alcalde, and with three justices of the peace, exercise all the functions of a city government. The members of the two rival councils resigned, but the alcalde, Thaddeus M. Leavenworth, refused to recognize the authority of the assembly and appealed to General Persifor F. Smith, military commander, and Governor Riley, who held his office under federal appointment, for support. Both Smith and Riley pronounced the assembly an illegal body and advised Leavenworth to maintain his office. The result was a temporary deadlock in San Francisco politics, that brought to a head one of the most perplexing questions, both from a legal and practical standpoint, that the United States government has ever faced in its dealings with new territory. In the technical sense of the term, California was plainly neither a state nor a territory, and yet, after the ratification of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, it was scarcely possible, in any constitutional sense, for the federal authorities to hold her people under military rule. But this latter form of government, however unconstitutional it might be, was the only alternative to anarchy. And with good Anglo-Saxon common sense, the president prolonged it until the people of California themselves made its continuance no longer necessary. Naturally, there was opposition to a form of government which owed its existence to circumstances rather than to law and many of the California immigrants by 1849 were advocating a kind of squatter sovereignty under which the settlers themselves should set up a government to supersede the authority exercised by the federal officials. Locally, as in San Francisco, this popular assumption of authority developed into a conflict with the government already in existence. As the months went by and Congress, deadlocked by the slavery issue, failed to set up a territorial form of government, or meet the situation in any other way, California faced a dubious future. Military authority was fast outliving its usefulness, and there seemed no prospect of having it displaced by a regularly organized territorial government. To save themselves from anarchy in this emergency, the people were compelled to act upon their own responsibility. As early as December 11, 1848, the citizens of San Jose came together to consider the propriety of establishing a provisional territorial government for the protection of life and property. San Francisco, Sacramento, and Sonoma from time to time held similar meetings, and by the spring of 1849, only the expectation that the National Congress then in session would fulfill the promises of the federal government and establish a territorial organization restrained the people from framing a government of their own. When this hope failed with the adjournment of Congress in March, California, so long sans law, sans order, sans government, definitely set about organizing her own government and making an end of a situation that had always been anomalous and was now fast becoming desperate because of the turbulent, restless hordes the gold migration was daily bringing within her borders. With unexpected and not entirely welcome suddenness, the leadership in this new movement was taken by Governor Riley, 
who issued a proclamation for the election of delegates to a general constitutional convention. At the same time, the governor condemned the settlers' organization in San Francisco as an illegal body. This resulted in an immediate conflict between Riley and the leaders of the squatter sovereignty program. And for a time, it looked as though the whole movement would end in failure. Fortunately, however, the settlers were more interested in securing order and settled government than in maintaining a technical right, and when common sense had gotten the better of local pride, they prepared to carry out the plan proposed by Riley. The election of delegates to the convention was set for August 1st, and on the same day the people were instructed to choose the local officials known to Mexican law to serve until the state government should formally be established. The territory was divided into 10 districts, from which a total of 37 delegates were to be returned. Of these 37, Monterey, San Jose, and San Francisco were each to send five delegates, Sacramento, Sonova, San Joaquin, and Los Angeles, four each, and San Diego, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo, two each. When the convention finally met, however, it was found that the number of delegates specified in the governor's proclamation had been disregarded by many of the districts, and a total of 48 representatives had been returned instead of 37. As most of these additional delegates came from northern districts, the final apportionment in the convention gave the north 38 members and the south only 10. As a whole, the convention was typical of the people who made up California in the 50s. Its membership included eight native Californians, among whom the most conspicuous were Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo of Sonoma, Jose Antonio Carrillo of Los Angeles, and Santa Barbara's sole delegate, Pablo de la Guerra. All of these were excellent representatives of the Mexican regime. Thomas O. Larkin and Don Abel Stearns of Los Angeles belonged to the older foreign residents who had come to the coast long before the conquest and had acquired something of a common interest and a common outlook with the Californians. Most of the delegates, however, were typical of the new day and the new order ushered in by American occupation. They were nearly all young men of serious purpose, not exceptionally well-versed in political affairs, but practical enough to frame a constitution suited to the needs of the time and little influenced by peculiar hobbies or personal political ambitions. From the standpoint of occupations, lawyers, ranchers, and merchants predominated, but nearly every other profession or business was also represented, for in its composition the convention was a true cross-section of the entire population. In accordance with the date set by Riley's proclamation, a few of the delegates met at Monterey on September 1st, but it was not until the following Tuesday, the 4th, that the convention was formally organized. Dr. Robert Semple, of tall stature and bear flag fame, was elected president, and Captain William G. Marcy of the Stevenson Regiment was chosen secretary. The meetings of the convention were held in a schoolhouse newly erected by the American Alcalde through the labors of convicts, the taxes on rum, and the banks of the gamblers. In honor of its builder, it was known as Colton Hall. The convention met in the upper story, which consisted of a single room some 60 feet long by 25 feet wide. The following paragraph, from a contemporary description, gives a picture of the convention and its meeting place. Quote, a railing running across the middle of the hall divided the members from the spectators. The former were seated at four long tables, the president occupying a rostrum at the further end, over which were suspended two American flags and an extraordinary picture of Washington, evidently the work of a native artist. The appearance of the whole body was exceedingly dignified and intellectual, and parliamentary decorum was strictly observed." Unquote. The most skillful member of the convention in the art of political manipulation, and in many respects the most capable statesman as well, was William M. Gwynn of Tennessee, whose future for ten years was to be inseparably connected with the history of the state he was then helping to create. Through Gwynn's foresight, Copies of the recently drafted Iowa Constitution were printed for the use of the convention, and the document thus became a sort of working model for the guidance of the delegates. 
Other state constitutions were also made use of, notably that of New York. But for some of the peculiar needs of the new commonwealth, there was no pattern. To meet these, the delegates were forced back upon their own ingenuity and common sense. It is scarcely necessary here to attempt a further description of the Constitution of 1849. Drafted under peculiar conditions by men little used to politics and designed to meet an emergency, the document was naturally defective in many particulars and nearly thirty years later had to be abandoned for a new instrument. Nevertheless, it met the needs of the time with a fair measure of satisfaction and was not an unworthy product of the earnest and conscientious, if not brilliant, men who framed it. On most matters, the convention worked without friction, but an occasional hotly debated issue broke the otherwise harmonious sessions. One of these disturbing questions was that of the eastern limits of the state. To the west, the Pacific Ocean settled the boundary beyond dispute. The northern boundary had been definitely fixed along the 42nd parallel by the Treaty of 1819 with Spain. Similarly, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had determined the international line to the south. But on the east there was an empire of uncertain extent, vaguely known to the Spaniards as part of their province of Alta California. Whether the territory to be included in the new state should follow these old boundaries to the Rocky Mountains, or stop at the Sierra Nevada was the vital question before the convention. Two parties soon formed over this issue. The one led by Gwynne, Halleck, Sherwood, and a few others might properly be called the Large State Party from their advocacy of the Rocky Mountains as the eastern limit. The second group sought just as vigorously to confine the state between the Pacific and the Sierra. After prolonged debate, by a vote of 32 to 7, a compromise line was chosen, fixing the boundary as we have it now. The motives behind this division of the convention into large and small state parties were not particularly complex. Those who advocated the wider boundary believed that it more nearly approximated the historical limits of California under Spanish rule, a view entirely correct, and that the larger state could eventually bear the expenses of a government more easily than one of smaller size. There was also an immediate need for courts in the enforcement of law in the region beyond the Sierra through which the immigrants were coming into California. Finally, the members of this party believed that Congress would more readily admit the state if the convention set its eastern boundary at the Rockies instead of at the Sierra Nevada. The small state advocates, curiously enough, argued from the same premises to a directly opposite conclusion. It would be impossible, they said, for a state located on the Pacific to administer a government for the vast semi-desert region across the Sierra. Nor did they believe that the people of California had any right to extend their boundaries so far as to include the Mormon inhabitants of Utah, who were already seeking to establish their own state of Deseret. Furthermore, it would be utterly preposterous for the convention to expect Congress to admit California to the Union with the larger boundaries proposed and the attempt to secure congressional sanction for the Constitution under such circumstances would only result in a complete rejection of the plea for statehood. It should be remarked also that the older historical writers commonly ascribed to the party advocating the larger boundaries a sort of Machiavellian shrewdness by which, through subsequent division of the enormous state, they hoped to provide for the extension of slavery to the coast. This tradition, which never had much foundation, in fact, of late years has been so thoroughly disproven as to require little comment here. The truth is, the people who emigrated to California from the eastern states, whatever may have been their views in the older communities from which they came, realized clearly enough that slavery had no place in the new environment and never supported it in any way as a local institution. The unanimous vote of the Constitutional Convention in favor of a clause which read, quote, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, unless for the punishment for crimes, shall ever be tolerated in this state, unquote, ought to be clear enough evidence of the attitude in California toward this question and one feels free to dismiss the whole subject without further consideration. Amid the firing of salutes and an impromptu celebration, 
the members of the convention completed their work and signed the constitution on saturday afternoon october thirteenth eighteen forty nine bayard taylor who was present at the scene paid tribute to the framers of the document in the following words quote, the questions they had to settle were often perplexing from the remarkable position of the country and the absence of all precedent besides many of them were men unused to legislation some had for years past known no other life than that of the camp others had nearly forgotten all the law and the wild life of the mountains others again were familiar only with that practiced under the rule of a different race yet the courtesies of debate have never been wantonly violated and the result of every conflict of opinion has been a quiet acquiescence on the part of the minority now at the conclusion the only feeling is that of general joy and congratulation quote. november thirteenth a tuesday was fixed as a date for submitting the constitution to the people for ratification at the same election state officials including a governor and member of the legislature were to be chosen and also the two federal congressmen to which the state according to its population was entitled the first legislature provided the constitution carried was to meet at san jose the capital on december fifteenth eighteen forty nine rain apathy difficulty in reaching the polling centers and various other causes reduced the vote on election day to an unsatisfactory minimum from a population of approximately one hundred thousand most of whom were men of voting age only twelve thousand eight hundred and seventy five ballots were returned the lightness of the vote however was much more than counterbalanced by the percentage in favor of the constitution only eight hundred and eleven votes were cast against it while the total affirmative vote was twelve thousand sixty four from among a number of candidates peter h burnett a former oregon pioneer was chosen governor and gilbert and wright were elected to congress from all accounts the election was conducted with reasonable honesty but circumstances and public sentiment alike threw embarrassing legal regulations to the wind some of the candidates spent both money and energy in their campaigns and in addition governor riley halleck and president tyler's personal representative thomas butler king waged a very vigorous fight to ensure the ratification of the constitution in the mining sections which then contained the bulk of the state's population the event was regarded with that semi-humorous attitude typical of the western pioneer toward most political questions Quote, the choosing of candidates from lists nearly all of whom were entirely unknown was very amusing wrote bayard taylor names in many instances were made to stand for principles accordingly a mr fair got many votes one of the candidates who had been on the river a few days previous wearing a high crowned silk hat with a narrow brim lost about twenty votes on that account some went no farther than to vote for those who they actually knew one who took the opposite extreme justified himself in this wise when i left home said he i was determined to go it blind i went it blind in coming to california and i'm not going to stop now i voted for the constitution and i've never seen the constitution i voted for all the candidates and i don't know a damned one of them End quote. the ratification of the constitution and the election of state officials by no means solved california's problem of statehood the great difficulty was to secure the sanction of congress for an act which no congressional statute had authorized and for which no precedent could anywhere be found the chief obstacle however in the way of california's admission to the union was slavery the same barrier that had prevented congress from establishing a territorial form of government for the province and which now for a number of weary and dangerous months threatened the state with a chaos bordering upon revolution it was once pretty generally believed that the annexation of california was due to the sinister influence of the south which forever reaching out for more slave territory finally brought about the mexican war in order to obtain california as a slave state this view which neither facts nor logic ever justified has been elsewhere effectually disproved 
but while slavery did not figure as a motive for the acquisition of california it undeniably did figure in the heated conflict over the disposition of the territory once it had come into the possession of the united states little thought seems to have been given to the establishment of slavery in california even by the most radical southern members of congress until david wilmot of pennsylvania introduced his famous amendment to the appropriation bill which president polk had requested from congress to enable him to open confidential negotiations with mexico the wilmot proviso first brought forward in august eighteen forty six aimed at the exclusion of slavery from all territory which the united states might secure from mexico as a result of the war the southern representatives were at first strangely apathetic regarding this amendment a measure which assuredly would have caused an immediate storm of opposition had any southerner at that time attached much importance to california as a slave-holding state and the house voted favorably upon it its passage through the senate also seemed assured until in the closing minutes of a very crowded session one of its own supporters honest but loquacious john davis of massachusetts talked it to an unexpected death in the next session of congress the pro-slavery element were in a very different temper regarding the mexican session without much hope that slavery would flourish on a large scale in new mexico or california because of the natural obstacles in its path the south was almost a unit in demanding the right to share at least nominally in the fruits of the conquest the practical question as to whether negroes could be carried to california and profitably used there was wholly lost sight of in the determination to maintain the equality of slave states with free the fight over california in the acquisition of which the south was much less interested than new england in the west thus became an intense bitter struggle over a principle that involved far more than the status of the territory in question by eighteen fifty the question whether california should be free or nominally slave had brought the union face to face with one of the few real crises in its history three parties were definitely in the field following the earlier lead of polk who believed that slavery in any part of california could never be more than an abstract question a very large group of moderates wished to extend the line of the missouri compromise thirty six degrees thirty minutes to the pacific a radical southern element however was demanding the whole area for slavery and advancing the new doctrine that congress had no authority to legislate against slavery in any of the national territory finally a decidedly vigorous party in the north was insisting that the principle of the wilmot proviso should be adopted and that the whole of the ceded region must be kept free for at least once in the course of history the force of circumstance aided the cause of right. Following international law, since California had been free under Mexican rule, it was difficult to see how slavery could exist in the territory after its acquisition by the United States unless Congress specifically imposed it there. Such positive laws, the anti-slavery majority in the House, would not pass under any consideration. Furthermore, the action of the people of california in definitely excluding slavery by their constitution made it doubly certain that congress would never force the system upon the state the south however was too thoroughly antagonized to yield even before these odds threats of secession were freely made and thus strangely enough the union faced disruption as a consequence of the great territorial gains of the mexican war with the country as a whole hotly divided over the slave or free state issue and the situation in california demanding a speedy settlement to prevent grave consequences among that impatient population congress came together again on december eighteen forty nine among the members of that body however was a spirit of antagonism and discord that augured ill for the immediate admission of the state during this session, President Taylor, whose special agent had done so much to encourage the adoption of the Constitution, repeatedly urged upon Congress the necessity of admitting California and denied the right of that body to interfere with the free choice of the people of the prospective state whether they favored or opposed slavery. 
His plan called for the settlement of the California question on its own merits, divorced from other troublous issues connected with slavery which were then agitating the country. But Taylor was not to succeed in his plan intent not only upon solving the california problem but also upon settling the other questions in which slavery was concerned henry clay the great compromiser insisted upon an inclusive program that embraced nearly all of the critical issues then before the nation linked thus with some half a dozen other questions the admission of california experienced a prolonged delay the debate on clay's compromise continued month after month in the Senate, the great triumvirate of Webster, Clay, and Calhoun, the country's foremost statesmen for half a century, met in battle array for the last time. Calhoun died before the session closed. Webster marred a reputation and undeservedly lost political favor by his 7th of March speech. Clay, an old man worn out by sickness and anxiety, labored incessantly to effect the compromises through which alone he believed the Union could be preserved. Before the summer was well begun, President Taylor, who had consistently adhered to the admission of California, divorced from all other issues, was taken suddenly ill and died. Fillmore, his successor, favored the plan of finding a common solution for all of the slavery problems. But even with the support of the executive, the compromise measures proposed by Clay could not be passed. The admission of California, the chief stumbling block in Clay's plan, was opposed on the ground that the people there had no shadow of authority to frame a constitution, that the boundaries of the proposed state were too large and could be fixed only by congressional action, that the election at which the constitution was adopted was both irregular and unlawfully conducted, and finally that the president had brought improper influence to bear upon the drafting and adoption of the Constitution. For some weeks longer the deadlock continued until at last the compromise measure, in which Clay alone saw hope of adjusting the nation's difficulties, began to fall apart. Depressed in spirit and almost ready for death, the old Kentuckian left Washington for the seacoast, where he hoped to regain a little measure of his fast-ebbing strength. In the meanwhile, the internal situation in California had become acute. For two years, the people had waited in vain for Congress to establish a territorial form of government. Another year had almost passed since the drafting of their constitution, and statehood seemed as far as ever from realization. It was during these months of debate and delay in Congress, while the problem of law and order and settled government was daily becoming more critical around them, that the people of the state talked openly of declaring their independence and of setting up a separate republic on the Pacific, thus bringing to pass the old idea of Langsford W. Hastings and of other empire dreamers in the days before the Mexican War. But the measures Clay failed to carry in combination were finally voted favorably upon when presented separately. One by one, the items of his compromise were embodied in separate bills and passed by Congress. The admission of California was finally carried in the Senate on August 13, 1850, by a vote of 38 to 14. On the 7th of the next month, it was ratified in the House by a vote of 150 to 56. Two days later, September 9, 1850, the bill was signed by Fillmore, and California had become a state. To California, this, of course, meant the dawn of a new and glorious era. And to the nation, also, it meant ultimately more than ever men dreamed of at that time. But with this lasting blessing came a temporary curse, for out of the admission of California, grew that dark sequence of slavery and free soil issues, the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, the question of squatter sovereignty, and the Dred Scott decision, which led up to the election of 1860 and the Civil War. The local significance of California's admission was thus for a decade actually secondary to its national importance. End of chapter 18
by Robert Glass Cleland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. Mines and Miners. Society and population in the new state, which had so vigorously thrust itself into the Union, were far from homogeneous. After excluding the native Californian and Indian elements, the citizenship was divided, both by geography and occupation, into three distinct types. First of these was the mining population, isolated for the most part from the rest of the state, with its own peculiar manner of life, its problems, and its unique institutions. Next came the tumultuous, hurrying life of San Francisco, full of corruption, generous impulses, and every other contradictory thing. Lastly, there was the long stretch of coast and valley land, as yet thinly populated and given over chiefly to cattle raising, which lay between Monterey and San Diego. Here a type of society developed which was neither that of the mines nor of San Francisco. It can best be studied, after the others have been described, in the local annals of Los Angeles from 1850 to 1860. Roughly speaking, the mining regions of California during the first three years of the gold rush embraced the mountainous portions of the territory lying between the San Joaquin River in the south and the Klamath and Trinity Rivers in the north. This area was later somewhat enlarged by the opening of mines in the Kern River district, but as late as 1852, Governor Bigler, in his annual message, classified as mining counties only those of Tuolumne, Calaveras, Sacramento, Yuba, and Butte. In this mountainous region, which until 1848 had been uninhabited except by Indians, a population of many thousands sprang up as if by magic. Quiet river bars watched the development of cities overnight, and many a lonely canyon visited some morning by a handful of prospectors, the first white men to traverse its course since the mountains themselves were made, by sundown had become the center of an excited, roaring camp. Here, along the American, the Feather, the Yuba, the Stanislaw, and a hundred kindred streams, a new chapter was written in American history. Life was lived for a few brief years without the restraints of civilization. Democracy, as literal as the world has ever known, flourished on every hand. Romance came down and walked openly among men, leaving behind a record of heroic accomplishment that can never be blotted from American tradition. To supply the manifold needs of this suddenly arisen mining population, the rest of California found full outlet for its energies for several years. Monterey and other seaport towns, after the first rush to the mines, when shops were closed and labor became almost unobtainable, experienced a phenomenal revival in business. Merchants became wealthy, supplying miners' demands for every kind of goods. Real estate underwent an unheard-of boom. The miserable village of Yerba Buena suddenly developed into the populous, crowded city of San Francisco, with life and activity everywhere. Even Southern California, far removed from the mining fields as it was, felt the stimulus of the gold excitement. At the entrance to the gold regions, two cities, springing out of nothing, profited from the mining train more than any others, with a possible exception to San Francisco. These were Stockton and Sacramento. The latter, laid out on a portion of Sutter's Grant, had as many as four houses in April 1849. By November, its population fell but little short of 10,000. At that time, according to a contemporary writer, each store in town was daily taking in from $1,000 to $3,000 from its sale of mining supplies and provisions. Drinking and gambling saloons paid a monthly rental of $1,000. Wages were so high that carpenters receiving $12 a day went on strike for better pay. In the more remote interior, where lay the actual mining fields, other cities rivaling Sacramento and Stockton came into being. Many of these, such as Marysville, Placerville, Auburn, and Grass Valley, still survive. But relatively speaking, their glory has long since departed, and the position of supremacy they once occupied 
has been preempted by the less romantic cities of seacoast and plain. In many cases, too, these thriving communities of the gold rush now live in tradition and memory alone. The following analysis of the election returns of 1852 casts an interesting light upon the distribution of population in the mining day. San Francisco, as might be supposed, headed the list with 8,000 odd votes. Sacramento City, not just Sacramento, if you please, came next with 5,000. Nevada boasted 1,700, Stockton 1,500, Marysville nearly an equal number. Placerville, ne Hangtown, 1,300, Columbia, 1,200, Sonora, something over 1,000, Downeyville, with 746 to its credit, outnumbered San Jose by 131. Shasta City and Santa Clara were almost equal. Mokalumna Hill cast 459 votes, while Oakland had only 300. Los Angeles straggled far to the rear of Murphy's, whose total was 519. San Diego came at the tail of the list with 167. Two more, and she might have claimed half the voting strength of the flourishing city of Volcano, mistress of Sutter Creek. Every camp had its name, perpetuating the memory of some unusual incident or given in the broad spirit of humor that came with the ox trains across the Sierra, where it found a more congenial soil than it had ever known before. Poker Flat, as was fitting, was not very far from Gomorrah. Hell Out for Noon City was offset by Alpha and Omega. Groundhog Glory was almost as prettily named as Mug Fuzzle Flat or Slum Gullion. Port Wine, Brandy, and Delirium Tremens perhaps had a certain logical connection. You Bet and Poverty Flat were bona fide names and not the products of Bret Hart's imagination. Hangtown long since selected to be known as Placerville, and the respectable citizens of Red Dog, with commendable civic pride, changed its name to Brooklyn and imposed a fine on anyone who ventured to use the former name. Mining itself in California was at first of the most primitive kind. Pick, shovel, crowbar, tin pan, and running water were the only requisites. Soon it was found that gold could be dug out of the crevices in rocks so a long-bladed knife was added to the list. The cradle, or rocker, also came into use in very early times. This was a wooden box or a hollowed log closed at one end and mounted on a rocker six or eight feet long, like those of an old-fashioned cradle. A second box with a perforated sheet iron bottom, making sort of a sieve or hopper, was fitted into the closed end of the cradle, leaving sufficient space beneath for the gravel and water to escape. The rocking was done by means of a stout pole fixed about the middle of the machine. This operation left the coarse rocks in the hopper and deposited the finer materials on the bed of the cradle. Here and there were a number of cleats or riffles which served to catch the gold as it was slowly washed along. The following account by one of the 49ers of the methods employed by himself and his companions will perhaps give a clearer idea of some of the more homemade types of these machines. Quote, Our machine was the half of a hollow log, resting on two cross logs, a crooked manzanita stick lashed around for a handle, and a sloping screen of split sticks at one end. The dirt had to be carried about a hundred feet. From a canvas sailor bag, two poles, and a cross sticks, I made a hand barrel. In the forenoon, we would dig and carry to the rocker by the river about 10 or 12 barrel loads, and in the afternoon, wash it out. One would keep the rocker rocking, and another lay the gravel on the screen, and a third one of us throw water on the gravel with a tin pan fastened on a forked stick. Our machine was so imperfect, we saved no gold finer than birdshot. I am sure we lost one half." End quote. The rocker, which was a great improvement over the pan, about 1850 began in its turn to give place to another machine. This was the tom, or long tom as it was often called. The tom consisted of a wooden trough some 20 feet long and 8 inches high. Near one end, the wooden floor was displaced by a sheet iron riddle, perhaps 6 feet long, containing holes about the size of a large walnut. Beneath this riddle was a second trough, 
some ten feet long and six inches high, called the riffle box. Earth was shoveled into the head of the tom and carried by a stream of water to the riddle, where it was kept constantly stirred. This caused all but the coarsest material to pass through to the riffle box beneath. Here the gold, mixed with heavy black sand and gravel, was caught by cleats nailed across the bottom, while the lighter earth was washed away. A later improvement, which largely displaced both the rocker and the long tom, was the sluice. This was merely an open trough or flume twelve or fourteen feet long and from a foot to three feet wide. One end was somewhat narrower than the other, so that several sluices might be joined together, making a continuous line, sometimes a hundred feet in length. Each box was supplied with riffles of various patterns, but all easily removable, and as the earth was forced along by a current of water, the gold fell to the bottom and was caught by these riffles. In most cases, it was customary to operate the sluices several days at a time before cleaning up. Then the water was turned off, the riffles taken out, and the gold carefully swept from the sluice boxes into a pan at the lower end. The first miners also learned that much gold lay hidden in pockets and crevices of the bedrock over which ran mountain streams. Where these streams were small, the miners easily turned them aside and dug out the virgin gold thus exposed with a butcher knife. But where the diversion of a large stream was undertaken, the task became one of great labor and uncertain outcome. Dams had to be built, races or flumes constructed to carry the water, and sometimes tunnels driven into which the river could be directed. In seasons of low water, these measures were reasonably successful, and the arduous and unproductive labor of the preceding months would find its reward many times over when the gold deposited year after year for untold centuries by one of the Sierra streams was dug out of the cracks and potholes for a half mile of newly exposed river channel. Even at best, however, the outcome of this type of mining was on the lap of the gods. A dozen men, toiling day after day without a cent of reward from early spring until late in the fall to prepare for the diversion of a stream, might some night see the work completed and a fortune awaiting them the next day when the river should be turned from its old channel. Before morning, if the fates were unkind, and they often were, a sudden storm would sweep away dams, ditches, and hopes alike, and render the months of toil barren of reward. Most of the first placer mining in California was done on the bars of sand and gravel in which the mountain streams abounded. Scores of such bars, Bidwell's on the Feather, the Lower Bar on the Mokolumna, Park's Bar above Marysville, to mention only a few at random, enjoyed brief notoriety and proved incredibly rich. It was soon found, however, that the sides of the canyons yield as good returns as the bars, and afterwards that the very hills themselves, entirely apart from the watercourses, were full of the precious stuff. Hence, there arose a division among the mines in 1849 and 1850 between the wet diggings, or those of the river beds and bars, and the dry diggings of the gulches and flats, where water could be had only in limited quantities, if at all. Among the most famous of the dry diggings were those surrounding Placerville, from which one writer says 300 men in three months took out a daily average of from three ounces to five pounds a man. Others scarcely less famous were opened up near the sites of Auburn and Georgetown. Dutch Flat, Dry Town, and Mokalumna Hill were only a few of the innumerable camps of similar kind. In 1852, the discovery of the famous Blue Lead, a deposit of very rich gravel apparently marking the course of an old riverbed, greatly increased the practice of drift mining, which sought to reach the primitive granite underlying such pre-Adamite rivers, as they were called in that day. Quartz mining, practiced for generations in Mexico before the California rush, began to be introduced in the Grass Valley region about 1850, and the old Mexican arastra, or grinding mill, became a familiar object in other sections shortly afterward. The system did not attain great significance, however, until 1855. Hydraulic mining, another great advance over the old placer methods, was practiced at least as early as 1852 at American Hill in Nevada County. 
it soon came to supersede all other forms where conditions favored but the land so treated was ruined eternally for every other purpose no idea of the destruction wrought by the hydraulic process can be gained until one sees with his own eyes the boulder-strewn desolation left behind the yield of the mines after eighteen forty eight continued to be phenomenal what the annual total amounted to there is no accurate means of determining Hittel, probably the most reliable authority gives the following figures for the amount exported through the san francisco customs house in eighteen forty nine four million nine hundred and twenty one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars increasing yearly until eighteen fifty three at fifty seven million three hundred thirty one thousand thirty four dollars the california state mining bureau in nineteen twelve published the following estimate of production eighteen forty eight two hundred and forty five thousand three hundred one dollars increasing yearly to eighteen fifty two at eighty one million two hundred ninety four thousand seven hundred dollars and then in eighteen fifty three decreasing to sixty seven million six hundred and thirteen thousand four hundred and eighty seven dollars after eighteen fifty three there was a slow decline in production but the total yield of the first decade was probably little short of half a billion dollars the incredibly rich strikes which characterized the late months of eighteen forty eight were equaled or surpassed in succeeding years but because of the larger number of gold hunters after the rush of eighteen forty nine good fortune from that time on was far from universal and in truth while dazzling success came to a few and fair returns to many privation and hard work waited on all for the life of the forty-niner glossed and painted as one may was not particularly pleasant except to that small number who found delight in its very hardships tents which seldom kept out either rain or cold and crude log cabins made up the typical miner's abode floors were generally of earth window glass was rare and not infrequently empty fruit jars were made to serve as a substitute furniture was of the simplest kind and commonly the owner's handiwork boxes and barrels serving as the material upon which he exercised his ingenuity clothing especially in the early years was of every description but the typical miner's garb consisted of flannel shirt heavy trousers stuffed into thick leather boots soft flannel hat and generally a belt containing knife or pistol shaving was a lost art food was generally abundant and of surprising variety the staples were sugar bacon beans coffee ham mackerel potatoes onions salt and flour beef and butter were sometimes on hand wild game such as pigeons quail fish venison and bear meat could easily be obtained by the miner himself or purchased from professional hunters many of whom made more at their occupation than the miner did at his canned goods and liquors were very plentiful bread was baked in the indispensable dutch oven which with coffee pot and frying pan completed the ordinary kitchen equipment where gold was the chief stock in trade and men reckoned values in ounces instead of dollars prices necessarily attained unheard of levels the old standards of value simply did not apply a few instances will sufficiently illustrate this point on the stanislaus river in eighteen forty eight flour sold for a dollar and a half a pound a like amount of brown sugar brought three dollars onions were a dollar a pound and candles fifty cents each two barrels of liquor netted the fortunate owner seven thousand dollars in six days time a firm on the middle yuba in eighteen fifty one had the following account against one of the pegsville miners whose taste both for liquids and canned seafoods was perhaps more marked than that of most of his contemporaries one can of lobsters three fifty one bottle of brandy three dollars three drinks seventy five cents one box sardines four dollars ten drinks two fifty seven drinks one seventy five one bottle of whiskey three dollars one pair of boots eighteen dollars five drinks one twenty five two bottles whiskey six dollars 
five drinks one twenty five a half pound of onions seventy five cents three bottles whiskey nine dollars one drink twenty five cents nine drinks two twenty five two drinks fifty cents three bottles of porter six dollars six drinks one fifty seven drinks one seventy five one box sardines four dollars one box lobsters four dollars two pair of blankets twenty eight dollars early travel to the mines was largely on horseback or by river steamer every sort of craft was pressed into the service on the sacramento and san joaquin and the parts of many small vessels were brought around the horn on the decks of steamers to be reassembled at san francisco in eighteen forty nine the fare between sacramento and the bay was twenty five or thirty dollars meals cost two dollars each staterooms were ten dollars and freight paid forty or fifty dollars a ton at such prices one of the sacramento boats the senator is reported to have cleared sixty thousand dollars monthly for her owners but the decrease of traffic and increased competition afterwards brought on a rate war which at one time reduced the cabin fare to a dollar travel in the mountains was at first on foot or by horseback goods were carried by pack train or on the owner's back but later with the building of roads instead of trails the stagecoach so inseparably connected in the public mind with the mining days and the heavy freighter came into use hotels so called existed in every mining community of any size they lacked naturally in refinement but made up for this deficiency in rates hinton r helper better known as the author of impending crisis who spent a weary and unprofitable sojourn of three years in various parts of california during the gold excitement thus describes the public house of sonora Quote, the best hotel in the place is a one-story structure built of unhewn saplings covered with canvas and floored with dirt it consists of one undivided room in which the tables berths and benches are all arranged here we sleep eat and drink four or five tiers of berths or bunks one directly above another are built against the walls of the cabin by means of upright posts and cross pieces fastened with thongs of rawhide the bedding is composed of a small straw mattress about two feet wide an uncased pillow stuffed with the same material and a single blanket when we creep into one of these nests it is optional with us whether we unboot or uncoat ourselves but it would be looked upon as an act of ill breeding to go to bed with one's hat on unquote. even at such hotels however the meals were generally bountiful and the fare varied furnishing a welcome change from their own home cooking to the miners of the surrounding country when they came to town to celebrate or purchase supplies. Gold mining, even in 49, was full of the monotony of hard work, and those engaged in it naturally sought whatever diversion they could find. The field of amusement, however, was rather limited, though much of it made up in intensity what it lacked in variety. The most common and prosaic relaxation was the hour of talk and storytelling after supper, with pipes lit and campfire throwing a bit of enchantment over the little circle of tired men. Where there was music, the songs most frequently sung were those old favorites of pre-Civil War days, Ben Bolt, Highland Mary, The Last Rose of Summer, Life on the Ocean Wave, or even Coronation and Old Hundred. Other songs of a more temporary character also had wide popularity. One of these, Joe Bowers from Pike, was universally sung from Shasta to the Stanislaw. It had an interminable number of verses, four of which will probably be sufficient to illustrate the general character of the masterpiece. My name it is Joe Bowers, I have a brother Ike. I come from old Missouri, came all the way from Pike. I'll tell you why I left thar and why I come to Rome and leave my poor old mammy so far away from home. I used to court a gal there. Her name was Sally Black. I asked her if she'd marry me. She said it was a whack. She says to me, Joe Bowers, before we hitch for life, you ought to have a little home to keep your little wife. Oh, Sally, dearest Sally, oh, Sally, for your sake, I'll go to California and I'll try to raise a stake. 
says she to me joe bowers you are the man to win here's a kiss to bind the bargain and she threw a dozen in at length i went to minin put in my biggest licks went down upon the boulders just like a thousand bricks i worked both late and early in rain and sun and snow i was working for my sally twas all the same to joe the last verse recorded how poor joe received word of sally's fickleness she had jilted him for a red-headed butcher and become the mother of a red-headed baby extemporaneous compositions that had rich local flavor were also produced in moments of deep inspiration this chorus for example was an especial favorite with the miners of selby flat to be properly appreciated it should be heard shouted over and over again as a midnight serenade by a hundred lusty miners each one beating his own accompaniment on a tin washpan with a stick it ran thus on selby flat we live in style we'll stay right here till we make our pile we're sure to do it after a while then good-bye to california the more exciting diversions were drinking gambling and dancing so much has been written of the part these played in the life of a mining community that little additional can be said of course the picture has been overdrawn for not every miner lost his pile at poker and faro or drank himself into a drunken stupor every night many a forty diner indeed was as strict an abstainer as the straightest sect of prohibitionists could desire and also kept himself free from the vice of gambling except as his profession itself was one great game of chance Yet the common notion, so thoroughly standardized in modern motion picture scenes, that every mining town was merely a collection of saloons and gambling houses, adjoined by more saloons and gambling houses, has behind it an element of truth. The moderate use of liquor was looked upon in 1850, even by the sedate society of the States, in much the same light that coffee drinking is regarded in our own generation a population of young men from which the accepted restraints of public opinion were largely absent working long hours at the hardest kind of physical labor craving excitement to break the monotony and loneliness and despair which many of them experienced or else seeking an outlet for excess of animal spirits would scarcely set for themselves more rigid standards in the new environment than they were accustomed to in the old and so the miners of california drank almost as unthinkingly as they ate or slept but among the better element constituting probably ninety per cent of the population actual drunkenness found little place except perhaps on those rare occasions when the mob spirit or some kindred influence swept whole communities into one grand spree in nearly all the mines sunday morning was observed as wash day or perhaps given over to baking the week's supply of bread, while Sunday afternoon was spent at such amusements as the town afforded. Gambling was the universal pastime. The miner had his choice of roulette, monte, faro, poker, twenty-one, all fours, lansquenet, and as many other games of chance as were known to the world of that day. Whatever the miner's selection, however, the professional gambler, with all the tricks of his trade, was pretty sure to take from him in the long run the gold he had managed to accumulate. Even where the professional element was absent, gambling between the miners themselves for surprisingly large stakes was often indulged in. One of the most interesting diaries of the time, yet published, has this description of a poker game at Coyoteville, on the south fork of the Yuba. Quote, there were four partners in one of the richest claims on the hill, and they got to gambling together. They started in playing $5 ante and passing the buck. Then they raised it to $25 ante each, and Jack Breedlove, one of the partners, cleaned out the rest of them, winning $22,000. Not satisfied with this, they staked their interest in the claim, valuing a fourth at $10,000, and when the game quit, Zeke Rubier, another of the partners, won back $8,000 and held to his fourth interest. The other two went broke, and Breedlove ended by owning three-fourths of the claim and winning $14,000, so that altogether he was $34,000 ahead. He offered his old partner's work in the mine at an ounce a day, which they refused, 
packed their blankets, and started out in search of new diggings. End quote. The establishment of a government and the preservation of a fair degree of law and order were naturally among the most serious problems faced by the mining communities. Neither federal nor state officials were strong enough to meet the situation, and indeed for several years the regularly constituted authorities made no attempt to deal with it. Each mining camp, accordingly, almost literally did that which seemed right in its own eyes, without let or hindrance from the outside. Under such conditions, political institutions were necessarily very simple, and government was designed to meet only the most fundamental needs of the society which gave it origin. These needs were, chiefly, the protection of life and property and the creation of some clear-cut, non-technical rules by which the business of mining might be carried on. Such regulations, though lacking the sanction of formal law, had behind them the stronger authority of custom and public opinion. Violations were generally punished with startling directness and vigor, but only after conviction according to established rules. In all of this, there was no great miracle of political evolution. It was due entirely to a certain Anglo-Saxon aptitude for self-government mixed with a large amount of common sense. Nearly all authorities agree that the mining communities were remarkably free from crime during the summer and fall of 1848. But the migration of the next year wrought a decided change. Deserters, desperados, professional gamblers, undesirables from the states, men who deliberately shed their moral standards as they left civilization behind, criminals and outlaws from Mexico and other Hispanic American countries, the riffraff of Europe and Asia, all these helped make up the later mining population, and in the chaotic social conditions around them, found free play for all their vicious tendencies. Drunkenness and gambling were responsible for much of the crime committed. Moreover, the very abundance of gold and the universal practice of carrying it on one's person or leaving it in scarcely concealed hiding places tempted the theft. Many men, not naturally lawbreakers, were driven to desperation by misfortune or hardship. Others, though not necessarily professional criminals, belonged to a discontented, restless class which moved continually from camp to camp looking for a fortune without work, and naturally they drifted into crime. Society was reckless, drunkenness common, and everyone went armed with knife or pistol. Murder was therefore the commonest of crimes, and wherever self-defense could be pleaded was seldom punished. Theft was practiced in various forms, especially in the rifling of sluice boxes or the robbing of tents. Claim jumping was frequently attempted, usually with disastrous results to one or the other party. Disputes over water rights sometimes led to pitched battles and numerous deaths. But among all the violators of the law, the highwayman was the most distinguished in the days of 49. No mining camp or stagecoach but had its experience, frequently ending in tragedy with this enemy to society. Much romance has been written about him, most of which is sentimental rot. For the average highwayman of that day was like his successor of today. He was brutal, callous, and anything but sportsmanlike. He took his victims unaware and often shot them down in cold blood for the pure delight of murder. Sometimes he worked alone, but more often in company with a few debased villains like himself. Occasionally these criminals were brought together by some conspicuously able leader into a highly organized, effective company whose depredations terrorized the whole mining area. The most notorious of these gangs was that led by Joaquin Murrieta. The operations of Murrieta and his cutthroat followers extended at one time or another almost from Siskiyou to San Diego. Other bands, like that led by Real Foot Williams in the neighborhood of Downeyville, confined their attentions to a more restricted district. Suspected criminals, at least in the more settled communities, were nearly always given what, under the circumstances, must be regarded as a fair trial. The most extreme form of lynch law, however, sometimes prevailed in newly established camps, especially in those cases where Chinamen or other foreigners were involved. 
but generally speaking even here the offender was tried by judge and jury and punished according to established custom hanging was the recognized punishment for serious offenses such as murder and robbery once the criminal had been declared guilty justice knew no delays and was commonly meted out within a few hours nor is there any record of a plea of emotional insanity having saved a murderer's neck in the primitive days of forty nine minor offenses were punished with whipping and exile or sometimes even by death yet in spite of the salutary effects of these self-constituted courts and conditions would have been intolerable without them even though they had their defects lawlessness each year became an ever more serious problem in the mines as indeed it was throughout the entire state delano wrote in his life on the plains that robbery and murder were a daily occurrence in eighteen fifty one and that organized bands of thieves existed both in the towns and mountains the writer of the shirley letters as delightful literature it may be remarked as ever came out of the mining regions found that social life had deteriorated so seriously by eighteen fifty two that within the short space of three weeks her own little community of rich bar had witnessed murders fearful accidents bloody deaths a mob whippings a hanging an attempt at suicide, and a fatal duel. The truth is that all California, the mining regions as well as every other section, was compelled to fight out the old battle between law and disorder which every frontier society has had to face. The rapid increase of population, the many attractions held out to the lawless element of every land, the weakness of the regular government institutions, and the large size of the state over which these institutions were supposed to spread all made the problem in california one of peculiar difficulty yet all things considered life and property were probably as secure in the mining regions during these uncertain years as anywhere else in the state certainly lawlessness was not the exclusive prerogative of the gold seeker rivals in the cities and cattle sections broke down as monopoly for dealing with questions of boundaries rival claims and such matters each mining camp established its own customs ordinarily there were definite local regulations covering these points which were written into a sort of code these were enforced by a committee of the miners acting through a president and secretary while disputes were decided by a jury the following articles enacted by the miners of jackass gulch on october sixteenth eighteen fifty two will serve to show the nature of these local regulations, which for several years constituted the only mining law that the mountain regions knew. It may be remarked, parenthetically, that Jackass Gulch, five miles north of Sonora, was one of the richest camps in California and for several years enjoyed great notoriety. Here, many a lucky miner struck a bonanza that yielded him a fortune in a few hours. The regulations read thus. Article 1. Each and every person shall be entitled to one claim by virtue of occupation, the same not to exceed 100 feet square. Article 2. To hold any claim or claims by virtue of purchase, the same must be in good faith and under a bona fide bill of sale, certified to as to the genuineness of the signature and the consideration given by two disinterested persons. Article 3. Any question arising under Article 2 shall be decided on application of either party by a jury of five members. Article 4. Any claim located on any gulch may be held by putting up notices with the names of the parties thereon and renewing the same every ten days till water can be had. Footnote. In most cases, a pick or shovel left in the workings was sufficient to hold a claim. In footnote. Article 5. Any claim upon which there is sufficiency of water to be worked in the usual manner, if not worked for the space of five days, shall be forfeited, unless provided the party interested is prevented from working by sickness or other good and sufficient cause. Article 6. These rules and bylaws shall extend over jackass and soldier gulches and their tributaries. Charles Gibson, President. Jazz Corniff, Secretary. One of the most fertile causes of trouble in the mining regions 
was the question of water rights. In many of the dry diggings, water could be obtained only by constructing costly wooden flumes or open ditches, and not infrequently companies were formed to undertake this work, finding their profit in the sale of water to the various claims. The main ditch or flume, upon reaching the diggings, was divided into as many smaller streams as it could adequately supply, and these in turn were made to serve two or three long toms apiece. From four to ten percent of the gold secured by the miners went to pay these water charges, so that the profits of the ditch companies were generally very large. The companies supplying Timbuktu, for example, paid annual dividends of 40% on an investment of $600,000. In this case, the ditch through which the water flowed was 35 miles long. The dependence of the miners upon such companies for the water, without which operations were impossible, the rival claims for stream rights, the question of prior use, and a score of similar issues made water almost as much a source of wrangling and bloodshed as the gold itself. To settle these disputes, the state at last built up a most elaborate ripperarian code, which became much more complex when the long, bitter struggle began over the use of streams for irrigation purposes. But in the hectic days of California's youth, the question of water ownership and use was generally settled by force, rather than by legal technicalities. The foreign element in the mines was also the cause of a vast amount of trouble. In the great rush of 1848 and 1849, almost as many vessels came from foreign ports as from the United States. Japan seems to have been practically the only country of importance not represented in the heterogeneous population that crowded into the Sierra. And before many months, racial antagonism began to appear in various forms. As early as January 1849, General Persifor F. Smith, who was then at Panama en route to California to take command of the United States forces, urged that all non-citizens who sought to mine on the public domain should be treated as trespassers. But his efforts failed and the foreign influx still continued. Generally speaking, persons of European birth were not regarded as aliens by the American miners. Footnote. The French miner, however, was not very popular in most Anglo-Saxon camps. In footnote. Indeed, if one omits the Indians, the only foreigners against whom real prejudice existed were Mexicans or Hispanic Americans generally, and the Chinese. The former were very numerous, coming into California by the thousands overland from Mexico and by sea from every country of Central and South America. The states of Chihuahua and Sonora were especially well represented in this migration and the fame of the latter still lingers in the name of one of the most important of mining towns. These Hispanic Americans, whether from Chile, Peru, Mexico, or any other country south of the Rio Grande, were skilled miners and trained for generations in a business with which most American immigrants were experimenting for the first time. Many of them were decent and law-abiding enough, but without prejudice, it must be admitted that a considerable portion belonged to a class ranked as undesirable, even in the countries from which they came. They were inveterate gamblers and utterly reckless when intoxicated. Robbery and murder were common enough with them before they came to California, and the new environment furnished both cause and opportunity for carrying on these crimes on a larger scale. From them came many of the most desperate criminals of the mining days and as a natural consequence, the cruelest and most treacherous deeds were always laid at their door. In addition to the evils for which the Hispanic Americans were actually responsible, the old anti-Spanish prejudice of the Southwest also worked against them in California. Frequently, this antipathy was mutual, resulting in a small race war accompanied by much bloodshed. More often, however, race prejudice, stimulated by the helplessness of the victims, led the rougher element of a mining camp, many of whom were quite likely to be foreigners themselves, to seize the claims which Mexicans or Chileans had opened up and drive the latter away from the community without resorting to actual bloodshed, unless the dispossessed owners were foolish enough to resist such high-handed acts of justice. Later on, many mining camps passed laws like that enacted at El Dorado Branch House, 
that no Asiatic, Mexican, or South American shall hold a claim in our minds. From a political standpoint, this feeling against the Mexican miners and their kindred culminated in the famous Foreign Miners Tax Law of the First California Legislature. The chief feature of this statute was a monthly tax of $20 upon each foreigner engaged in mining. This was collected under a system of licenses and forced many foreigners to abandon claims of their own to work for day wages. Others refused to pay the fee, forcibly resisting the officials sent to collect it. Evasions were also common, and scoundrels, masquerading as state officials, often obtained large sums from false collections or through various other forms of graft. Altogether, the tax proved such a failure and troublemaker that it was speedily repealed. Some time afterward, however, it was revived at a much lower rate. Agitation against the Chinese did not begin until 1851, since previous to that time they were not present in the mining camp in sufficient numbers to arouse prejudice. But opposition developed fast enough when the Hong Kong migration set in on a large scale. Unlike the Mexican, the Chinaman was seldom guilty of bloodshed unless his victim was a fellow countryman. He was peaceful, inoffensive, and nearly always content to work over claims that his superiors had abandoned. While passionately fond of gambling, he won or lost without resorting to violence. About the most to be said against him was that he kept to himself, wore peculiar clothes, worked long hours for relatively small returns, and sometimes robbed a white man's claim or cleaned up a sluice box 24 hours before the disappointed owner got around to do it for himself. For all these faults, the Chinaman paid very dearly, and for many others which criminals of other races fastened upon his defenseless person. As a consequence, he was lynched singly or in groups when some mining camp lost its head or surrendered its sense of justice to the baser element. His most common misfortune, however, was to be driven off the claim he had taken up or bought. This was sometimes done by men of the professional claim-jumping class, who could too often, though not always, count upon anti-Chinese prejudice among the miners to prevent any defense of the unlucky owner. At other times, whole camps united to drive the Chinese out of their district. For example, 200 Chinamen on the American River were expelled from their claims by 60 miners from Mormon Bar in the spring of 1852. The same 60 next descended upon 400 Celestials who were hard at work farther down the river at Horseshoe Bar. To accomplish the work properly in this particular case, it was considered necessary to engage a band to accompany the expedition. To conclude this chapter, which in limited space has sought to summarize the most crowded and energetic period of California history, one can do no better than to quote the following paragraph from Howard Shin, a recognized authority of the mining days. Quote, the typical camp of the golden prime of 49 was flush, lively, reckless, and vigorous. Saloons and gambling houses abounded. Buildings and whole streets grew up like mushrooms almost in a night. Every man carried a buckskin bag of gold dust, and it was received as currency at a dollar a pinch. Everyone went armed and felt fully able to protect himself. A stormy life ebbed and flowed through the town. In the camp, gathered as one household under no law but that of their own making, were men from the north, south, east, and west, and from nearly every country of Europe, Asia, and South America. They mined, traded, gambled, fought, discussed camp affairs. They paid 50 cents a drink for their whiskey and $50 a barrel for their flour and thirty dollars apiece for butcher knives with which to pick gold from the rock crevices. Shin might also have added that thus the miners played their part in one of the most romantic episodes of American history and helped in no mean way to lay the foundation for a very noble state. End of chapter nineteen. Chapter twenty a History of California, the American Period, by Robert Glass Cleland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20. San Francisco the Boisterous. 
Many cities in the United States boast a more ancient lineage than that of San Francisco, but none can look back to a more vigorous, boisterous, or interesting youth. In 1835, Captain W. A. Richardson laid the foundation for the modern San Francisco by erecting a rude building on the beach known as Yerba Buena. The next year, Jacob P. Lease built a comfortable frame house near the same site. As time went, Lease added a store and made the place something of a trading center for ships taking on wood and water across the bay at Sausalito. In 1841, however, Lease sold his property to the Hudson's Bay Company, which thereafter, for four or five years, became the chief factor in the commercial life of the little village. With the American occupation, Yerba Buena rapidly began to increase its scant population, and by the spring of 1848 could boast nearly 900 inhabitants. Telegraph, Rincon, and Russian Hills marked the town's western boundary, and the narrow plain on which its adobe and frame buildings stood merged into the waterfront where Battery and First Streets now touch market. By this time, the town had changed its name from Yerba Buena to San Francisco, established a number of newspapers, opened a public school, and become somewhat of a commercial rival to Monterey. The first rush to the mining regions, however, brought this promising growth to a sudden end, for like all other towns of California, the would-be metropolis was virtually deserted by its inhabitants during the first few months of the gold excitement. Stores were closed, labor became almost unobtainable, and real estate depreciated woefully in value. But before the year's close, prosperity and population came back with a rush like that of the tide in the Bay of Fundy. Immigrant ships began to dump hundreds of passengers upon the shore. Tons of merchandise were piled in the streets. Men were clamoring for places to eat and sleep, and there were eager, hurrying, insistent crowds where all before had been empty streets or unoccupied beach. Never since the days of Aladdin and his wonderful lamp did a city arise so full of activity and life in so short a time. In this sudden growth, naturally enough, beauty and comfort for a long time found little place. The dwellings were chiefly of canvas or rough lumber, affording only the flimsiest of shelter and utterly devoid of attractive qualities. They straggled from waterfront to hillside, for a time paying but little attention to the street lines marked out by official survey, or grouped themselves in a compact, disorderly mass behind the shelter of the sand hills in the area now bounded by First, Second, Market, and Mission Streets, in what was then known as Happy Valley. In summer, the streets were dusty, windswept, and rendered almost impassable by the boxes and bales of merchandise whose owners had no other place of storage. In winter, especially that of 1849 and 1850, the dust became a sea of mud in which, incredible as it may seem, animals not infrequently disappeared from sight, and even drunken men were known to have died of suffocation. At the corner of Clay and Kearney Streets, so it is said, the mud became so serious that someone posted a warning which read, This street is impassable, not even jackassable. W. T. Sherman also recounts in his memoirs that he was afraid to ride down Montgomery Street after a rain because of the danger of being drowned in the mud and water if his horse should stumble. Almost every race and costume could be met with in the shops or gambling places of the new metropolis for even as early as 1849, the cosmopolitan character of the city's population had become firmly established. Moor, Chinaman, Kanaka, Malay, Mexican, as well as immigrants from all the European countries, touched elbows with Americans from every state in the Union. In the medley of strange dress which resulted from this variety of race, the flannel shirt, soft hat, and high boots of the miner easily predominated. Top hats, frock coats, jewelry, and other marks of a more elegant civilization were also much affected by certain types. And thus it happened that sameness of dress was as foreign to those early days as monotony of life. In San Francisco, as well as in the mining regions, democracy flourished on every hand. 
Men sloughed off their class distinctions as instinctively as a snake sheds its skin. Work was honorable, and a man standing was not affected by his occupation so long as he remained reasonably honest. The term menial disappeared from speech, and those who had once been accustomed to servants now did their own cooking and mending, carried their own trunks, worked with pickaxe and shovel, or drove mule teams for employers who had not long since been day laborers in the eastern states. The business life of this period can scarcely be described. It both partook of the characteristics of the people and helped in no small way to intensify their predominant traits. Speculation, open-handedness, startling success or equally swift failure, hurry, rush, and disregard of caution were its chief features. Two streams flowing through the city constantly enriched its economic life and day by day added to its amazing wealth. Every shipload and overland party of immigrants brought a new demand for food, lodging, drink, and mining equipment to the San Francisco merchants. Of even more importance was the never-failing influx of miners returning from the Sierra with the precious dust upon which the whole business life of the city depended. Whether bound for home with his pile or merely seeking a brief relaxation at the city's flesh pots, the average miner spent his money generously and without much regard for what he got in return. Small change was seldom requested. Few articles could be had for less than fifty cents. Prices were almost never challenged. Higgling was a lost art. Commodity prices in the city were normally about the same as at the mines themselves. But when the market became glutted through excessive importations, or when goods could not be shipped to the mountains because of impassable roads, violent fluctuations made the merchants' profits as uncertain as the miners' luck. Flour, which sold on December 1, 1848, for $27 a barrel, within two weeks had fallen to 12 or $15. Beef and pork dropped at times with even greater swiftness. Molasses, which one month cost $4 a gallon, sold the next for 65 cents. More than one cargo was thrown into the bay because prices would not pay for its unloading, and several of the muddiest streets from time to time were rendered passable by dumping into them barrels of unsaleable provisions and other commodities not often used as paving material. Wages, immediately after the first rush to the gold fields, reached and maintained high levels. Ordinary labor brought from 8 to $10 a day, while mechanics and carpenters easily commanded 12 or 16 Restaurants and hotels charged what, for that period, were unheard of rates. The cheapest and best eating places in the city were run by Chinese proprietors who gave ample and well-cooked meals for a dollar each. But American houses, like the Alhambra or Delmonico's, had nothing to offer for less than five. The rooms at the more pretentious hotels, like the Ward, the Graham, or the St. Francis, brought as high as $250 a month, and even a bunk in a tent or garret could be disposed of for $10 or $20 a week. Rentals and real estate values were correspondingly high. According to Bayard Taylor, the Parker House was leased for $110,000 annually. A canvas tent, 15 by 25, occupied by gamblers who called it the El Dorado, brought $40,000. A small broker's house, known as the Miner's Bank, rented for $75,000 a year. A one-story building with a 20-foot frontage on the plaza, then known as Portsmouth Square, brought $40,000. And a cellar, 12 feet square and 6 feet deep, was offered for a law office at $250 a month. Any room 20 by 60 feet, wrote Sherman, would rent for $1,000 a month. Even though the cost of labor was high and lumber brought from Oregon or from the Graham Mills at Santa Cruz sold for $500 a thousand, when such rentals could be obtained for buildings of every description, the price of vacant property naturally mounted with skyrocket speed. Lots which only a few years earlier had gone begging at $12 each, now sold for as many thousand. Men, bankrupt and unfortunate mercantile ventures, suddenly found themselves rich through the possession of real estate 
previously considered worthless. More than one citizen, who had rushed off to the mines in 1848 and failed to make his fortune, came back to San Francisco to find his property so risen in value during his absence as to make him a wealthy man. Some of the shrewder Argonauts of 1849 thus found their true El Dorado in San Francisco real estate, which afforded early investors much surer and easier profits than the gold mines of the Sierra. In most cases, at least up to 1853, when a decline in values began, almost the only cloud on the investor's horizon was the validity of the title. To go into the innumerable disputes over land claims which troubled early San Francisco would crowd all other material from this volume. Yet, though it cannot be written here, the story of San Francisco's real estate transactions has in it much beside technical details relating to land titles and lawsuits. A large part of the story, especially after 1850, would deal with official corruption and public indifference, a combination that has injured many another American municipality. And in the case of San Francisco, cost her most of her patrimony and threw her early land titles into unfortunate confusion. The subject is interesting, also, because it gave rise to some very clever attempted land frauds. One of these was the so-called Lemontour Grant, a claim brought forward in 1853 by Jose Lemontour of Mexico before the California Land Commission to 600,000 acres of land in California. Included in the claim were a number of islands and some four square leagues in the heart of San Francisco. The grants were signed by Governor Miquel Torrena, to whom Limontour had furnished aid in the early 40s, and seemed, on their face, to be unmistakably genuine. So far at least as the San Francisco claims were concerned, they were upheld by the Land Commission. But after months of litigation, during which Limontour collected over $300,000 from property holders for quiet title, the United States District Court adjudged them fraudulent and ordered Lamontour's arrest. The latter, after giving bond for $30,000, forfeited his bond and fled to Mexico. Another spurious claim to three square leagues in the San Francisco limits was also brought forward about the time of the Lamontour excitement and served still further to cloud the titles of property holders and cause a semi-panic. This was known as the Santian Grant, so called from the name of a priest Jose Santian, who produced a grant to the property in question, purporting to have been signed by Governor Pio Pico in 1846. The claim was sold by Santian, and after passing into the hands of a company known as the Philadelphia Association, was approved by the Land Commission. Subsequent court proceedings, however, as in the case of the Lamontour scheme, invalidated the claim and declared the grant a forgery. Though the Lamontour and Santian claims were repudiated, the mere fact that frauds could be attempted on so large a scale and come so near of success showed plainly enough the uncertainty and confusion surrounding the land titles of early San Francisco. Even an act of the state legislature in 1851, recognizing the city's right to certain beach and water lots and confirming previous sales of such property, failed to clear away the difficulties. Court decisions for a long time were too conflicting to furnish any basis of adjustment. Squatters disputed the rights of legitimate owners, and for many years rival claimants settled the respective merits of their claims by resort to force as often as by appeal to law. In addition to these private disputes over land titles, there was much juggling of the city's property by corrupt officials. All sorts of fraudulent practices were resorted to by which the municipality's valuable real estate, inherited from the old Spanish days or ceded to it by the government, was transferred to private individuals, many of whom thus became rich and infamous at the same time. So, through the first decade of San Francisco's history as an American municipality, along with all its splendid virility and optimism, ran the scandal of a city robbed of its heritage by conniving officials and unprincipled citizens. Whatever its government might be doing, however, year after year the city continued its surprising growth and added to its wealth by leaps and bounds. 
Misfortunes, however, were not lacking to test the real mettle of the new community. Chief of these were the six great fires which, one after another, swept over the city in 18 months, beginning with December 1849. The total loss entailed by these fires, most of which were thought to be of incendiary origin, was close to $25 million, none of which was covered by insurance. But with the spirit of courage and determination that showed itself again to the admiration of the world after the great disaster of 1906, the citizens each time rebuilt their devastated city, making it more substantial and desirable after every catastrophe. The last of the six great fires started June 22, 1851, on the north side of Pacific near Powell, and destroyed, wholly or in part, some 16 blocks, causing a loss of over three million dollars. This, and the previous conflagrations, changed completely the San Francisco of tents and flimsy structures which had sprung up in the first months of 1849. Docks, wharves, sewers, sidewalks, paved streets, commodious and fireproof business houses, attractive and substantial homes took the place of the rude buildings and primitive structures of an earlier day. Business still continued to rely upon the mines for much of its prosperity, but a more widely diversified interest in shipping, lumber, agriculture, and other lines of productive activity promised a broader and more secure foundation for the city's future. Gold dust ceased to be the chief circulating medium, but gave place to ten and twenty dollar gold pieces privately coined and to the fifty dollar slugs issued by the assay office in San Francisco. A motley list of silver coins drawn from almost every country under the sun served for small change and readily passed from hand to hand with only a rough attempt to fix approximate values. The smallest coin in use was a bit, or Spanish real, supposed to be equal to twelve and a half cents in American money. But as a matter of fact, nearly every small silver coin, whatever its face value, was classed as a bit and so accepted for the San Franciscan still refused to think in terms of nickels and cents. The year 1853 was marked by a feverish business activity and inflation of real estate values such as even the boom of 1849 had scarcely known. But in the midst of this hectic prosperity were signs of coming trouble. The mining industry, though still producing many millions annually, was not able to support the thousands of persons who had made it their livelihood in previous years. Consequently, men were coming back from the mountains in large numbers and seeking employment in other lines, or turning to other occupations, especially to agriculture, for a livelihood. This transition could not be accomplished without a considerable strain upon the machinery of business. Merchants found their sales curtailed, and ready money far more difficult to obtain. Goods had to be sold in the interior largely on credit, and gold continued to flow out of the state to meet bills already contracted with eastern merchants. The season of 1854 was unusually dry, bringing ruin not only to many ranchers, but also seriously reducing mining operations through lack of water. This and other difficulties led to nearly 300 business failures in one year. In addition, there occurred the very serious defalcation of Henry Meigs, ex-councilman, public benefactor, and leading citizen of San Francisco, whose unpaid debts and fraudulent treasury warrants cost his creditors fully $800,000. In spite of these adverse factors, however, San Francisco experienced no actual crisis until the sudden collapse of several leading banking houses at the beginning of 1855. The crash happened shortly after the middle of February, when the firm of Page, Bacon & Company, probably the leading banking institution of California, became insolvent through the embarrassment of its parent company in St. Louis. This precipitated a run on the great banking and express house of Adams & Company, whose branch offices were in every mining center of California, and forced that institution to close its doors. At the time of this failure, Adams & Company owed nearly $2 million to depositors, and as there was then no national bankrupt law, 
the assets still on hand were successfully manipulated by means of receivers attachments and other legal devices to the great benefit of a few favored creditors and the complete disappointment of the rest litigation over the spoils lasted for seven years but most of the depositors gained little or nothing from the proceedings the law's failure to remedy the situation or to punish those responsible for the disappearance of more than two hundred thousand dollars of the company's assets aroused public opinion to the danger point and served as one of the contributing motives for the creation of the vigilance committee in eighteen fifty six the financial panic did not confine itself to the two firms already mentioned three other leading houses including those of wealth fargo and robinson and company closed their doors on the same day that Adams and Company announced its failure. A run was also started on the remaining banks of the city, but either through good fortune or wiser management, these were able to meet the demands of their excited depositors. These bank failures also forced many mercantile houses into bankruptcy, so that a general and very acute business depression followed the fat years of prosperity and speculation from 1849 to 1854. The activity and feverish energy which characterized the material development of San Francisco between 1849 and 1855 also showed itself in the social side of people's life. The amusements, or perhaps one should say forms of relaxation, were generally strenuous and most unconventional if judged by modern standards. They were of a nature, too, that inevitably fostered lawlessness where a community tolerated them too long, and in the end became the source of viciousness and evil of the worst sort. Though even from the beginning harmless pleasures were common enough, and year by year the better class of San Francisco turned with increasing eagerness to amusements of moral worth, patronizing concert lecture and drama with true liberality establishing gardens and parks and seeking in many ways to encourage culture and refinement yet the characteristic amusements of those early days were not of the uplifting type men found their chief delight in drinking gambling and association with loose women the saloons and gambling houses which stood open day and night were indeed the recognized centers of the city's social life their furnishings were tawdry and vulgar, but of a kind to appeal to unrefined masculine taste, and provided an enticing contrast to the bare, cheerless rooms in which most of the people lived. Entertainment of various sorts was also supplied by most resorts, such as the Bella Union, the El Dorado, or the Veranda, to serve as an additional attraction to the crowds. To these features were added light, warmth and the opportunity for companionship, and an atmosphere surcharged with excitement. Stronger than all, however, was the appeal of bar and gambling table. As was to be expected, women of an undesirable character began to make their appearance very early in San Francisco society. Many of these were first brought in from Mazatlan or similar West Coast Latin American cities, and others came from the seaports of Asia. Later, the underworld of Paris, London, and New York added to the stream, until the prostitute became a familiar figure on every San Francisco street. Here again, as in the other aspects of social life, the old restraints and conventionalities were cast utterly aside. Men of prominence and eminent standing in the community appeared openly in the company of these daughters of Rahab, without exciting unfavorable comment, or even attracting much attention. Few condemned them because few thought evil of what they did. Old standards were temporarily abandoned. San Francisco had, for the time being, adopted a new code of ethics and behavior. In this society, with its lack of restraint and emphasis upon the individual, the maintenance of one's rights became largely a personal matter with which the commonplace law had little to do. As a matter of course, Nearly every man went armed, choosing knife or revolver according to the individual taste. Disputes were settled on site or made the subject of formal duels. The 500-odd saloons with which the city was blessed by 1855 did not tend to a condition of quietness and peace, 
nor did the excitement bred in gambling houses or the influence of immoral women prove of much assistance in this regard homicide was too common to excite much comment and as almost no attempt was made to enforce the law by regularly appointed officials men almost ceased to take it into consideration principals in a quarrel were shot or stabbed to death and bystanders who failed to get out of the way quickly enough were accidentally killed without society holding anyone responsible. The law could not keep pace with the hurried rush of life, so that each man became his own protector, and not infrequently another man's judge and executioner as well. Such conditions inevitably gave the vicious elements of society free rein for their activities, and there were enough of these lawless characters and to spare before the city had long outgrown its village state. A criminal community known as Sydney Town, in honor of the ex-Australian convicts who founded it, had sprung up between Broadway and Pacific near the waterfront, to which all manner of evil characters resorted. But this community, bad as it was, did not have a monopoly of the undesirables, for they were too numerous to be confined to any one quarter of the city. Like most criminal classes, that of San Francisco was very cosmopolitan in its makeup. The riffraff of Europe, Asia, and South America, which followed in the wake of the gold rush, were continually augmented by American rowdies from the eastern cities or scoundrels from the southern and western states. To these was added a steady stream of weak or desperate characters with whom life in California had dealt too hard. Failures from the mines, men who had lost fortune and self-respect through gambling or drink, and all the unpleasant by-products which California, Interpocula, necessarily produced. Another factor in the creation of lawlessness was the lax administration of the municipal government. From the American occupation down to May 1, 1850, the city was governed, for the most part, under the primitive Mexican institutions of Alcalde and Ayuntamiento. During much of this period, there was considerable waste of public funds and something akin to chaos in municipal affairs. The status of the government in 1849 was thus described by one of the early alcaldes. Quote, At this time we are without a dollar in the public treasury, and it is to be feared that the city is greatly in debt. You have neither an office for your magistrate nor any other public edifice. You are without a single police officer or watchman, and have not the means of confining a prisoner for an hour. Neither have you a place to shelter while living sick and unfortunate strangers who may be cast upon our shores, or to bury them when dead. Public improvements are unknown in San Francisco. In short, you are without a single requisite necessary for the promotion of prosperity, for the protection of property, or for the maintenance of order. End quote. The change from Mexican to American institutions brought about by the first city charter affected no permanent improvement in the city's government. Except for an occasional attempt at reform, conditions, in fact, grew worse instead of better. Elections became a farce. Contractors and officials grew rich at public expense. Criminals caught red-handed were almost never convicted. The whole machinery of law enforcement and the right of the city's inhabitants to be secure in their persons and property were surrendered to the worst elements of the population. Lawyers, politicians, shrewd businessmen, with much to gain from the control of city government, furnished the leadership for this evil domination, and under them were petty grafters, lawless bullies, and criminals of every kind. So long as the city remained under such control, it was utterly impossible to bring men to justice in the ordinary courts of law. The statement of a recent author that between 1849 and 1856, 1,000 murders were committed with only a single legal conviction will scarcely be challenged by those conversant with the times. Yet it is obvious that a community essentially Anglo-Saxon will not tolerate such conditions beyond a certain point. The first outburst of public opinion, which amounted to something more than talk, came in July 1849 and resulted in the overthrow of a lawless group known as the Hounds or Regulators 
a semi-political organization whose activities bore an indistinguishable resemblance to robbery, especially when applied to inoffensive foreigners. A particularly brutal attack one Sunday afternoon upon the settlement known as Little Chile led the better element of San Francisco to unite for the suppression of the organization. The leaders of the hounds were accordingly seized, tried by a citizen's court, and driven from the community. The rest of the gang never again attempted to reorganize. It was not until 1851, however, that the first of the actual vigilance committees came into being. Lawlessness had been on the increase for months, expressing itself not only in robbery and murder, but also, or so at least it was suspected, in starting the great fires which swept the city from time to time. Arrests of even the most notorious criminals were seldom made and never accompanied by conviction. At last, with a sound common sense that placed the welfare of society above the sanctity of unenforced law, some two hundred of the best citizens effected an organization known as the Committee of Vigilance to rid the city of the criminals and assist in the enforcement of the law. Sam Brannan, former leader of a Mormon contingent that came to California in the ship Brooklyn, was elected president, and Isaac Bluxom, Jr., secretary of the organization. A few of the many other influential members were William T. Coleman, James King of William, Selen and Frederick Woodworth, and Colonel J.D. Stevenson of the New York Volunteers. A constitution was adopted on June 9th, and the Vigilance Committee entered upon its difficult and dangerous task. It should be borne in mind that this committee, even though self-constituted, was not a mob, but a carefully organized body of respectable men who openly avowed responsibility for what they did, and acted only after careful investigation of each case. Until its work was accomplished, some of the committee constantly remained on duty. The rest could be summoned at any time, day or night, by the tolling of the Monumental Engine Company's bell. Beginning with the execution of John Jenkins, an Australian ex-convict of evil notoriety who was caught while attempting a daylight robbery, the committee continued its careful, methodical work, making arrests with its own police, holding trials under an established procedure, placarding the city with warnings for the criminal classes to leave, and watching incoming ships to prevent the landing of desperate characters, until, for a time at least, San Francisco could boast a law-abiding population. In this first purification of the body politic, 91 persons were taken into custody. Of these, quote, the committee hanged four, whipped one, deported 14 under direct supervision, ordered 14 more to leave California at their own expense, delivered 15 to the authorities for legal trial, and discharged 41. End quote. The good accomplished by the first vigilance committee could be made permanent, however, only by continued interest in the city's welfare on the part of its better citizens. This, unfortunately, was not forthcoming. For like too many reform movements, that of 1851 was merely a spasmodic outburst of indignation instead of a sustained effort at civic improvement. So, almost as soon as conditions became endurable, the good people of San Francisco turned again to their own affairs, and the city's control slipped back into the hands of evil men. Lawlessness once more became the order of the day. The criminal class, augmented by the hard times of 1854 and 55, began a reign of robbery and murder such as the community had not known even in the worst days of 1851. More than ever, the law was made a mockery by corrupt or inefficient officials and dishonest lawyers, and thoughtful men despaired of finding in it any relief from the conditions with which they found themselves surrounded. The vicious circle was rendered complete by a union of wealth and respectability in the person of certain business and financial leaders who needed to control municipal elections and the city's treasury, with the rowdy element. Altogether, therefore, the state of San Francisco in 1856 was worse than in 1851, and drastic measures were again required to bring about a restoration of law and order. Public opinion was quickened to this new task by the death of James King of William, 
This man's character, like his name, had about it a certain individuality that set him apart from his companions, and near the close of his career, especially made him a sort of gadfly in San Francisco to arouse the city from its moral apathy. John Randolph of Roanoke occupied a place no more unique in the Senate of the United States than James King of William held in the San Francisco of the middle fifties. King began his California career in the Sierra. Afterwards, he came to San Francisco, where he established a private bank and later entered the employ of Adams and Company. The failure of this house thrust him into the editorial profession, and October 8, 1855, he issued the first number of the Daily Evening Bulletin. Almost immediately, this paper set the city by the ears. With a directness which must have delighted the heart of a society still very much in the pioneer stage, King attacked those whom he considered guilty of corrupting the city's morals or of defrauding the people through political power. He dealt in personalities rather than in general charges and published the names of offenders with a boldness that made the victims of graft and crooked politics rejoice and take heart. Palmer, Cook and Company, whom he called the Uriah Heaps of San Francisco Bankers, and many other epithets no less complimentary, furnished King his first target. But his tastes were Catholic, and evildoers great and small soon took their places in the bulletin's gallery of rogues besides the arch-enemies to all good society, Palmer, Cook and Company. King's attacks did not, of course, immediately dethrone vice, but he gradually taught the people where the sources of corruption lay and steadily developed a strong undercurrent of public opinion against the prevailing abuses. The shooting of William Richardson, a United States Marshal by a notorious gambler named Charles Cora, who escaped the consequences of his act through a split jury, nearly precipitated a mob uprising in the early part of 1856. Cora was known to have killed at least six men besides Richardson. But it was not until the following May that the cold-blooded murder of James King himself by a detestable politician named Casey brought back the old vigilante days of 1851 and restored to the city its self-respect. King was shot about five o'clock on the evening of May 14th as he was walking homeward from the office of the bulletin. Casey immediately gave himself up to his friends at the police station, where he thought he would be secure. But the tolling of the old monumental fire bell brought together so great a crowd that the assassin's confederates thought it best to move him to the county jail for safekeeping. Here, protected by a large force of armed deputies and a considerable body of militia, he was temporarily safe. But the city was aroused to too high a pitch to quiet down, Matters, indeed, had come to such a pass that, as Dempster, one of the advocates of a new vigilance committee, truly said in his appeal to a better class of citizens, quote, we must either have vigilance with order or a mob with anarchy, unquote. Members of the committee of 1851, led by one of its active members, W.T. Coleman, served as a nucleus for the new organization. The old Know-Nothing Hall at 105 and a half Sacramento Street was used as temporary headquarters, and notices in the newspapers announced the reassembling of the committee. Before nightfall, a thorough, swiftly working organization had been perfected. Hundreds of persons had been enrolled, sworn to an oath of secrecy, and given a number by which they were henceforth to be designated instead of by name. Arms were later provided in sufficient number to equip some 2,000 men. The volunteers were organized into regular military companies, each with its own officers, but the actual direction of affairs rested with a central executive committee of 33 members. The purpose of the organization can best be expressed in the committee's language. Quote, we do bind ourselves, read their declaration, to perform every just and lawful act for the maintenance of law and order, and to sustain the laws when faithfully and properly administered. But we are determined that no thief, burglar, assassin, ballot stuffer, or other disturber of the peace shall escape punishment, either by quibbles of the law, the carelessness or the corruption of the police, or a laxity of those who pretend to administer justice." 
to sum up in a single sentence one of the most dramatic periods of all san francisco's stirring career one may simply say that the vigilantes of 1856 succeeded in carrying out the foregoing resolution upon the day of james king's funeral after a fair though non-technical trial they hanged casey and cora from the windows of the headquarters building and later executed two other rascals of similar kidney their chief work however lay in clearing the city of undesirables both prominent and obscure by means of warnings and deportations and in putting the fear of god into the hearts of the lawless characters who remained the process of regeneration was not accepted in the spirit of meekness by the victims nor wholly unopposed by the regularly constituted authorities a counter-movement headed by so-called law and order men sought and secured the aid of governor j neely johnson and the state militia against the vigilantes and even the president of the united states was requested to use federal troops to put down the insurrection w t sherman of later civil war fame was then engaged in banking in san francisco and for a time led the anti-vigilante party associated with him were general volney howard judge terry of the state supreme court who afterwards nearly forfeited his own neck by stabbing a member of the committee named hopkins and a number of other citizens equally well known twice at least civil war seemed inevitable between the state authorities backed by the law and order party and the vigilant supporters but fortunately this catastrophe was averted the city however for some months was like an armed camp the vigilantes had fully nine thousand members all of whom were regularly drilled and organized into infantry cavalry and artillery units the committee's permanent headquarters on sansom street in expectation of a siege had been turned into a well-defended fort known as fort gunnybags from the sacks of earth with which it was protected some thirty cannon ranging from six to thirty-two pounders were in the hands of the organization besides large stores of ammunition and thousands of muskets under such circumstances suppression of the movement whether by state or federal troops would have been a very bloody and costly business and luckily it was not attempted by a singular coincidence the committee of eighteen fifty six hanged the exact number of criminals that the committee of eighteen fifty one had hanged Quote, but the committee did not stop there says mary floyd williams it laid its hands upon an incriminating ballot box that was still stuffed with forged ballots it obtained confessions from the ward healers who had done the bidding of the powerful and efficient bosses and then it announced its intention of cleansing the city from the plague of political corruption it sent into exile over a score of the most valuable members of the machine fortunately as soon as the work in hand was done the leaders of the committee disbanded its followers even though the organization was then at the height of its power and thus saved the movement from becoming the tool of men eager to use it for selfish or partisan ends those who created it had shouldered a grave responsibility and taken a great risk only the utter demoralization of government and social conditions could have justified such a step but for many years thereafter the salutary influence of the committee's work was felt in the city's political and social life and few today will deny that san francisco profited from this overriding of law to save law end of chapter twenty a history of california the american period by robert glass cleland this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. The Queen of the Cow Counties While Northern California was rejoicing in the prodigal riches of the Sierras and establishing a commercial and financial supremacy destined to last long after the close of the gold excitement, the southern part of the state found itself almost entirely cut off from any share in the newly discovered wealth. There was, it is true, a material increase of population in the southern counties, due in part to the immigration over the southern routes, much of which, though originally bound for the Sierras, actually got no farther than San Diego or Los Angeles. 
and to a considerable backdrift from the mines. The southern merchants also enjoyed a season of prosperity, so long as the overland caravans had to be supplied with food and other necessaries for the journey northward. But only in these or similar indirect ways did the south profit from the golden wealth with which the north was enriched. When the first excitement of the gold rush died out, the people of the coast counties accordingly turned their attention more and more to the industry which had been the mainstay of California's economic life from the beginning of the Spanish occupation, and for more than a decade longer. Cattle raising remained almost the sole industry of Southern California. From Monterey to San Diego, indeed, the population was so thoroughly devoted to this distinctive business that the counties were derisively dubbed the cow counties by the commercial and mining communities of the more prosperous north. Chief of these cow counties was Los Angeles, whose ranges alone, according to one authority, supported over 100,000 cattle in 1854. Next came Santa Barbara with approximately 50,000 head, and a very lordly group of cattle barons whose control of that county's politics and business was complete. Monterey had nearly as many cattle as Santa Barbara. San Bernardino boasted close to 30,000 head, and San Luis Obispo claimed perhaps half that number. The maintenance of this industry required the same large land holdings that had characterized the old days of Spanish-Mexican control. The methods of raising cattle were still much the same, and the range had to supply feed through all the seasons without assistance from granary or haystack. In the South, as in every other section of the state, land titles were thrown into confusion by the transition from Mexican to American control, and the adjudication of claims by the land commissioners and the courts left many of the original holders with only a scant remnant of a once princely heritage. In these proceedings, so much of the land went as lawyers' fees that as early as 1852, the Los Angeles Star estimated that one-tenth of the disputed holdings had been paid out in defense of the possessor's titles. One of the most serious causes of these disputed titles, and of the endless boundary litigation that characterized the decade of the 50s, was the undefined limits of the land grants under the old Spanish-Mexican regime. A typical case of this kind is cited by J.M. Gwynn. Quote, as an example of indefinite boundary lines, he says, take those of La Habra Rancho, formerly in Los Angeles, but now in Orange County, and these are not the worst that might be found in the records. Commencing at the Camino Viejo, or Old Road, and running in a right line 550 varas, more or less distant from a small corral of tuna plants, which plants were taken as a landmark, thence in a direction west by south, running along the Camino Viejo 18,200 varas to a point of small hills, at which place was fixed, as a landmark, the head of a steer. From thence, east by north, passing a cuchillo, or wasteland, 11,000 varas, terminating at the right line of the small corral of Tunas aforesaid, the point of beginning. In the course of time, the Camino Viejo was made to take a shorter cut across the valley, the corral of the tunas disappeared, a coyote or some other beast carried away the steer's head, the three oaks were cut down and carted away for firewood, the small stone was lost, the cuchillo was reclaimed from the desert, and the La Habra was left without landmarks or boundary lines. The landmarks lost, the owners of the adjoining ranchos, if so inclined, could crowd them over onto the La Habra, or its owner in the same way could increase the area of his possessions, and the expanding process in all probability would result in costly litigation. End quote. Yet despite squatters, litigation, and mortgage foreclosures, some of the native families succeeded in retaining their far-stretching leagues of grazing land, upon which still roamed vast herds of long-horned, slim-bodied cattle. Among the American rancheros, too, were a number of those early immigrants who came to Southern California in the 30s or early 40s and established a friendship and close identity of interest with the Californians. Thus, for several years after conditions in Northern California had been completely revolutionized by the gold discovery, 
and all of the changes the Great Migration entailed, life in the South retained much of its pastoral, unhurried character, partaking more of the characteristics of the native epoch than of the excitement, stir, and manifold business activities of the North. The large ranches, however, whether of Californian or American ownership, were not looked upon with favor by the settlers who came to Southern California to acquire land for agricultural purposes. Conflicts between squatters and rancheros were not at all uncommon, and on more than one occasion, whole communities of the new settlers banded themselves together to resist dispossession. Paragraphs similar to the following appeared frequently in newspapers of the time, showing the inevitable conflict of interests between the newly arrived Americans and the old-time landholders. This particular notice was dated at El Monte, December 4, 1854. It read as follows, quote, We, the undersigned citizens and residents of the San Francisco Ranch, do hereby agree to protect each other in our present claim lines until there is a final decision by the courts of the United States either for or against it, and that we will not allow Mr. Dalton or any other man to sell the land so claimed or intrude upon said lines in any way until such decision is made. Other difficulties, besides those presented by the squatters and small farmers, kept the cattle barons from finding life altogether monotonous. The demand for beef in the mines and by the newly arrived immigrants at first furnished a highly profitable market for the southern cattle. But this very demand, with the ensuing high prices, stimulated competition from an unexpected quarter. Large droves of cattle and sheep soon made their appearance in California from the ranges of Sonora, Chihuahua, and New Mexico. And although such an overland drive at best required weeks of time, and not infrequently resulted in heavy losses from flood, starvation, or Indian attack, the last sometimes indeed destroying the entire enterprise, men and animals alike. Yet, whenever the California market promised a satisfactory price in those early years, sheep and cattle from beyond the Colorado sooner or later reached the coast. In 1855, this form of competition, together with a large increase of Southern California herds due to several satisfactory rainy seasons, threw the industry into a severe depression. Values fell some 75% until prime cattle could be bought for four or five dollars a head. But within the next year or two, prices again reached normal levels and a revival of the business brought the herds back to normal size. Yet the cattle industry, even when most prosperous, was not an unmixed blessing for the southern part of the state. So long as the business showed a profit, the owners of the large ranches were in no hurry to break up their holdings into small ranches for the benefit of settlers. Other forms of agriculture were accordingly discouraged, and the increase of population retarded. Fortunately, before these evils had reached serious proportions, a trick of nature destroyed the supremacy of the cattle barons and forced a subdivision of many of the largest ranches. A severe drought in 1856 following the low prices of the preceding year, caused a good deal of temporary discomfort to the cattle owners, and many of them lost a considerable percentage of their herds. But these losses were trifling compared to those which occurred in the early 60s. The season of 1860-61 to 61 was unusually dry. Cattle died by the hundreds for lack of grass and water, and the owners, anxious to save as much as possible from the wreckage, flooded the markets with such half-starved animals as they were able to drive to the cities. The price of beef dropped to four, three, and even two cents a pound in the shops, and on many of the ranches, the cattle were killed for what their hides, horns, and bones alone would bring. This severe drought, which not only destroyed many animals, but also left large numbers too weak and emaciated to withstand an unfavorable winter, was followed by one of the most prolonged rains the state has ever known. Beginning on December 24, 1861, the storm continued almost without interruption for nearly a month. So rarely was the sun visible during that time that the star published the following bit of interesting news. Quote, A phenomenon. On Tuesday last, the sun made its appearance. 
The phenomenon lasted several minutes and was witnessed by a great number of persons. Unquote. The floods which resulted from this storm drowned hundreds of cattle in the lowlands, but the damage was much more than offset by the benefit received by the ranges and underground sources of water supply. During the two succeeding seasons, the cattle found an abundance of grass, and the losses suffered in the preceding years were almost forgotten. Then came the great disaster, the drought of 1864. The fall of 1863 was unusually dry, and even the winter months, during which California normally receives her chief rainfall, brought no relief. Day after day went by with cloudless skies, and the grass failed to sprout from the famished earth. The springs and water holes dried up, and the great ranges were eaten bare of every kind of feed. Quote, the loss of cattle was fearful, says the historian of early Southern California in speaking of this drought. The plains were strewn with their carcasses. In marshy places and around the Cienegas, where there was a vestige of green, the ground was covered with their skeletons, and the traveler for years afterwards was often startled by coming suddenly on a veritable Golgotha, a place of skulls, the long horn standing out in defiant attitude as if protecting the fleshless bones. It is said that 30,000 head of cattle died on Stern's ranchos alone. The great drought of 1863 to 1864 put an end to cattle raising as the distinctive industry of Southern California. Unquote. The Sacramento Union estimated that from one-half to three-fourths of the cattle in Los Angeles County died of starvation in this great drought. The news stated that 5,000 head had sold in Santa Barbara for 37 and a half cents apiece. Only one rancher held a rodeo in all Los Angeles County during that disastrous season. Rangelands fell so low in value that some of the southern counties assessed them at 10 cents an acre, the same valuation that was placed on each individual grapevine in the wine vineyards. The cattle industry could not survive this disaster. Many of the ranchers, who had borrowed money at the usurious rates then in vogue, were forced to give up their holdings. The new owners found it more profitable and less risky to divide the ranges into small ranches and sell them in this fashion to the ever-increasing number of settlers than to attempt to maintain the business of cattle raising in the old way. So while the drought of 1864 brought loss and in many cases ruin, and changed the whole economic life of Southern California, it was, after all, a blessing in disguise, for it led to those diversified and highly productive forms of agriculture which have so long furnished the basis of Southern California's prosperity and determined her whole mode of life. In the 50s, however, outside of the cattle industry, the agricultural productions of Southern California were decidedly limited, Grain was grown in considerable quantities in nearly all of the southern counties, and some flour was ground in primitive mills for local consumption. In a small way, there was, likewise, some production of vegetables and of the commoner varieties of deciduous fruits for commercial purposes. A few seedling oranges were also shipped north from the trees planted by William Wolfskill and the other pioneers in the citrus industry. By way of contrast to this insignificant production of deciduous and citrus fruits, however, the vineyards of the South were already yielding very heavily. By 1860, a million pounds of fresh grapes, packed in sawdust, were being shipped annually from San Pedro. In addition, a considerable quantity of wine was manufactured in each season in southern wineries. After supplying the local demand, much of this was sent north to San Francisco in the mines. Manufacturing was almost non-existent. A little lumber was sawed in the San Bernardino Mountains, but most of that required for building purposes was brought down from the north. And even in those early days, the annual importations were heavy enough to make San Pedro one of the largest lumber ports along the coast. The lack of a customs house at San Pedro, however, for some time, seriously interfered with the prosperity of Southern California and increased enormously the cost of all goods imported from other countries. Such imports, under the circumstances, had first to be landed at San Francisco 
and then were brought down to the southern port. The hardships imposed by this requirement were strikingly shown in a memorial from the merchants of Los Angeles in 1850, asking Congress to establish a customs house at San Pedro. Part of the memorial read as follows, quote, The conditions of the country in which your memorialists reside are peculiar, and hence results a marked singularity in the state of its trade. Its proximity to the mining regions has caused it to be substantially denuded of all its laboring population, and hence, although strikingly agricultural in its natural features, it has for the last two years been dependent upon a foreign supply for not only the greater proportion of its breadstuffs, but for even the coarser articles such as peas, beans, oats, barley, etc. These are brought usually from some of the South American ports, taken to San Francisco, and thence reshipped to San Pedro. It thus appears that not only are the people of this region compelled to obtain the more costly fabrics of manufacturers at another port, but even articles of the most common consumption, at what additional cost the following facts will testify. The freight alone from San Francisco to San Pedro for the last two years has never been less than twice the amount of what is charged for conveying the same articles from New York to San Francisco. The expenses upon a cargo of flour for sending it from the warehouse in San Francisco to San Pedro have been as high as $10.25 per barrel, and have never been less than $5.75. One of your memorialists has paid for the expenses of a single cargo of goods from San Francisco to San Pedro $14,000. In fine, the average additional cost upon goods purchased at San Francisco is not less than 30% upon their being landed at San Pedro. End quote. Perhaps the most serious drawback to the material development of the South was its deplorable lack of money. Interest rates as high as 5% a month failed to bring in sufficient capital to meet the demand, and under such a handicap, Economic progress was necessarily slow. Footnote. Harris Newmark, who came to Los Angeles in 1853 and died there in 1916, states that interest rates of from 2% to 12.5% per week were not unknown. End footnote. Twice, however, the hopes of the South were greatly stimulated by the excitement of nearby mining booms. In 1855, gold was discovered in considerable quantities on the Kern River. This at once attracted miners from the entire state and led to a rush of no mean proportions. The Southern California merchants were naturally jubilant over this event, in which they saw an opportunity of reaping some of the rich harvest which their San Francisco, Stockton, and Sacramento rivals had previously monopolized. The Los Angeles papers played the boom up for all it was worth, perhaps for a little more. The Southern Californian of February 8, 1855, for example, contained this paragraph, quote, The road from our valley is literally thronged with people on their way to the mines. Every description of vehicle and animal has been brought into requisition to take the exultant seekers after wealth to the goal of their hopes. Immense ten-mule wagons strung out one after another, Long trains of pack mules and men mounted and on foot with picks and shovels, boarding house keepers with their tents, merchants with their stocks of miners necessary, and gamblers with their papers are constantly leaving for the Kern River mines. The opening of these mines has been a godsend to all of us, as the business of the entire country was on the point of taking to a tree. The greatest scarcity of money is seen in the present exorbitant rates of interest, which it commands. Eight, ten, and even fifteen percent a month is freely paid, and the supply, even at these rates, is too meager to meet the demands. End quote. A month later, the same editor wrote, quote, Stop the press! Glorious news from Kern River! Bring out the big guns! There are a thousand gulches rich with gold and room for 10,000 miners. Miners average $50 a day. One man with his own hands took out $160 in a day. Five men in 10 days took out $4,500. 
The Kern River excitement was short-lived, and it was not until 1860 that a new rush, but on a much smaller scale, again swelled the hopes of the Los Angeles merchants. This was a result of the opening of mines in the Bear and Holcomb Valleys back of the Mormon settlements at San Bernardino. A thousand persons were said to have been on the ground at one time during this rush, but the deposits were soon exhausted and the boom collapsed. But if the mines proved a disappointment, and the South remained far behind the North in population and wealth, she at least knew the value of publicity, and even before the state was five years old, Los Angeles County had acquired a reputation and a name, and incidentally possessed a group of citizens who were not at all backward in proclaiming the greatness of the section in which they lived. Quote, the queen of the cow counties bangs all creation in her productions, one of the Los Angeles editors wrote. Whether it be shocking murders or big beats, jail demolishers, expert horse thieves, lynch justices, fat beeves, swimming horses, expounders of new religions, tall corn, mammoth potatoes, ponderous cabbages, defunct Indians, secret societies, bright skies, mammoth pumpkins, Shanghai chickens, grizzlies, coyotes, dogs, smart men, office seekers, coal holers, scripper fights. She stands out in bold relief, challenging competition, end quote. The city which gave its name to this marvelous queen of the cow counties was little removed during the first decade of the state's history from the primitive appearance and manner of life that it had known under Mexican rule. Its houses were still chiefly of the familiar adobe type, their flat roofs covered with asphalt from the nearby Brea pits on what is now the Hancock Banning Ranch. The general appearance of these early Los Angeles homes has fortunately been left us in minute detail by one of the city's pioneers. Quote, Most of the houses were built of adobe or mud mixed with straw and dried for months in the sun, wrote Harris Newmark. The composition was such a nature that, unless protected by roofs and verandas, the mud would slowly wash away. The walls, however, also requiring months in which to dry, were generally three or four feet thick, and to this, as well as to the nature of the material, may be attributed the fact that the houses of the summer season were cool and comfortable, while in the winter they were warm and cheerful. They were usually rectangular in shape, and were invariably provided with patios and corridors. There was no such thing as a basement under a house, and floors were frequently earthen. Conventionality prescribed no limit as to the number of rooms, an adobe frequently having a sitting room, a dining room, a kitchen, and as many bedrooms as were required. But there were few, if any, frills for the mere sake of style. Most adobe houses were but one story in height, although there were a few two-story houses, and it is my recollection that in such cases the second story was reached from the outside. Everything about such an abode was emblematic of hospitality. The doors, heavy and often apparently homemade, were wide and the windows were deep. In private houses the doors were locked with a key, but in some of the stores they were fastened with a bolt fitted into iron receptacles on either side. The windows, swinging on hinges, opened inward and were locked in the center. There were few curtains or blinds, wooden shutters an inch thick, also fastening in the center, being generally used instead. If there were such conveniences as hearths and fireplaces, I cannot recollect them, although I think that here and there the brasero or pan and hot coals was still employed. There were no chimneys, and the smoke, as from the kitchen stove, escaped through the regular stacks leading out through a pane in the window or a hole in the wall. The porches, all spoken of as verandas and rather wide, were supported by equidistant posts, and when an adobe had two stories, the veranda was also double-storied. Few, if any, vines grew around these verandas in early days, largely because of the high cost of water. For the same reason, there were almost no gardens. End quote. Everything in the town was primitive, society, business, and government. The chief amusements were balls, bullfights, gambling, and horse races. Footnote. Theatrical performances were later added to the list. 
These, for the most part, were given by companies brought down from San Francisco. In footnote. A hop at the Bella Union Hotel, which stood on Main Street above Commercial and served as a center of social gaiety, was thus described by the local editor. Quote, a large assemblage of elegant ladies, good music, choice refreshments, gay gents, all that contributes to a merry meeting was there, and it was fully enjoyed. End quote. On a similar occasion, at the home of Don Abel Stearns, the enjoyment was not quite so unalloyed, for certain unbidden guests, apparently annoyed at their failure to receive an invitation, surrounded Don Abel's residence and fired upon the dancers. A pitch battle then ensued in which two men were killed and two seriously wounded. The occurrence called forth the following curiously worded comment in the next morning's star. Quote, Men hack one another to pieces with pistols and other cutlery as if God's image were of no more worth than the life of one of the two or three thousand dogs that prowl about our streets. End quote. Of the primitiveness of the courts and city government of that time, there is humorous and ample evidence. Probably no better illustration can be given, however, than a municipal ordinance enacted March 8, 1852, when Manuel Requena was president of the Common Council and B.D. Wilson was the mayor. It read as follows, quote, All persons who may find it necessary to wash articles of any kind near the habitable portions of the city will do it in the water canal that runs from the little river, but will be careful to place their board or washer on the outer edge of the canal, by which means, although they use the water, Yet the washings from the dirty articles are not permitted under any pretense to again mix with water intended for drinking purposes. The infraction of this ordinance will subject the delinquent to a fine which shall not pass three dollars at the discretion of the mayor. End quote. The population of Los Angeles was composed mainly of three races Indians, Mexicans, and Americans but the lines of social cleavage did not follow this racial division. The better-class Americans and the wealthier Mexican families were closely associated in control of the city's political, business, and social life. The poorer Mexicans and a rough American element came next in the scale, while lowest of all were the Indian laborers. Gambling dens and saloons operated without restraint, and neither San Francisco nor the worst of the mining camps furnished a more fertile field for vice than Los Angeles. A short street, leading from the plaza to Aliso Street, and known to fame as Calle de los Negros, or Nigger Alley, constituted the center of the city's wickedness. The only houses on it were brothels, saloons, and gambling halls. Murder and robbery were almost nightly occurrence in this notoriously evil street but no one ever thought of bringing the criminals to justice. The Indian laborers came to town each Saturday night to spend their week's pay for liquor or to lose it in any one of the number of equally unfruitful ways. How many of these poor unfortunates were murdered in the dives of Nigger Alley or died in drunken brawls or perished as a result of unbridled debauchery, poison drink, cannot be known but one has only to read the brief newspaper notices of such deaths by violence and disease to understand the rapid disappearance of the Indian population from Los Angeles County. It is one of the tragic episodes in California history. Crime and violence, however, were not confined to Nigger Alley or indulged in solely at the expense of the hapless Indians. For the whole of Southern California, like the rest of the state, suffered seriously from lawlessness and disorder during these rough years of adjustment and changing conditions. Human life at this period was about the cheapest thing in Los Angeles, says one who lived through this exciting period. Murder and robbery were the commonest of the major crimes and were due in large part to drunkenness, the universal practice of carrying arms, and the general unsettled state of society. A definite criminal element, consisting chiefly of renegade Mexicans, also existed in Los Angeles, and after the first vigilante movement in San Francisco, this class received considerable reinforcement from the undesirables driven down out of the north. 
The law, unfortunately, did little to punish even the most notorious offenders, with the inevitable result that always follows such a failure. Crime increased at such an alarming rate that the people themselves undertook at last to administer justice with a hangman's noose. The star of September 27, 1851, printed this pointed interrogation, quote, during the past year, no less than 31 murders have been committed in the city of Los Angeles and its vicinity, and who today can name one instance in which a murderer has been punished? End quote. Two weeks later, the same editor published the following indictment of the county officials. Quote, the deputy sheriff has handed us a list of 44 homicides which have been committed in this county within the last 15 months. With very few exceptions, the perpetrators of the murders remain undiscovered. No person has been convicted, and if we are correctly informed, there has been but one person tried for murder since the county was organized and the defendant was acquitted. Prisoners confined in the city jail were nearly always able to escape with the aid of friends or through the connivance of the guard, and in the case of at least one notorious criminal, a Mexican named Camarillo, the obliging jailer himself furnished the necessary tools with which the prisoner dug his way to freedom. Such conditions could not long be endured by the respectable citizens of the county. So in 1852, when a prominent American named Bean was held up and murdered not far from San Gabriel, a citizens' committee took the punishment of the criminals into their own hands and shortly afterward hanged three men suspected of the act. Later, the committee expressed some regret when they discovered that one of these was innocent. Many of the most atrocious crimes during the first few years of the decade were committed by regularly organized bands of desperados, most of which were Mexican in membership. One of the earliest of these bandit organizations was led by Solomon Pico. Beginning its operations in 1851, this band for months terrorized the highways and smaller settlements within a radius of several hundred miles of Los Angeles. A little later, the famous Joaquin Murrieta, of whom fiction and romance have made a sort of California Robin Hood, began to favor Southern California, as well as the Sierra mining camps, with his attentions. So dangerous did this young Mexican and his cutthroat followers ultimately become, that the Committee on Military Affairs of the State Legislature voted a reward of $5,000 for his capture, dead or alive. A minority of the committee, however, objected to the reward on the ground that it might tempt unscrupulous and unprincipled men to palm off by purchased evidence the head of another for that of Joaquin, and thus defraud the state treasury. Besides, the objection continued, the danger of mistaking the identity of individuals in this country is very common. The $5,000 reward, however, was at last offered, and after an unparalleled career of daring and crime, covering almost the entire state, Murrieta was run to earth and killed near the Tahoe Pass by a small company of rangers under command of Captain Love. Murrieta's head, in the hand of one of his chief lieutenants, called Three Finger Jack, were pickled in alcohol for purposes of identification, and afterwards auctioned off at a sheriff's sale for $36. The relics were eventually sold for $100 to a merchant known as Natchez, who, having sold a great many revolvers in the lifetime of the bandit for his destruction, now proposed to use the head as a drawing card in his show window. The year 1854 was one of the worst in the criminal annals of the South. Los Angeles City alone, it is said, averaged one homicide a day for every day of the year. The citizens organized a company of rangers under command of A.W. Hope and set to work to remedy the intolerable situation. As a result of their activities, quote, the gallows tree on Fort Hill bore gruesome fruit and the beams over corral gates were sometimes festooned with a hangman's noose. In less than a year, 22 criminals, bandits, murderers, and thieves were hung in accordance with the law or without the law, whichever was most convenient or most expeditious, and more than twice that number expatriated themselves for the country's good and their own. End quote. 
Yet despite such heroic measures, the two years succeeding showed little, if any, improvement over 1854. The Southern Californian of March 7, 1855, carried this brief notice, quote, Last Sunday night was a brisk night for killing. Four men were shot and killed, and several wounded in a shooting affray, end quote. Roads were unsafe because of regularly organized companies of highwaymen who robbed and murdered almost at will. Chief of these was a band of Mexicans, fully a hundred in number, led by Juan Flores and Pancho Daniel. For more than a year, this band operated almost unmolested. In January 1857, Sheriff James R. Barton of Los Angeles set out with a small posse to arrest certain of the Flores' Daniel bandits, who had murdered a storekeeper at San Juan Capistrano. Though warned against an ambuscade, Barton and his men were trapped by the outlaws and all but two of their number killed. This so aroused public sentiment that at least 200 men, including a large company of native Californians led by Andreas Pico, set out to break up the band. A number of the outlaws were killed outright. Some were captured and hanged on the spot. At least 52 others were lodged in the Los Angeles jail. Eleven of these, among whom was the 22-year-old Juan Flores himself, were later executed. Pancho Daniel temporarily escaped the fate of his companions, but he was later arrested near San Jose and, after some delays, hanged by outraged citizens. Another menace to life and property was the frequent Indian raids with which the southern ranches were threatened during the pioneer 50s. Crossing from the Colorado River, bands of these marauders slipped through the Cajon Pass and drove off the cattle and horses of the Mormons at San Bernardino. Settlers were frequently killed in these attacks, and more than once the little colony was in danger of being exterminated. Other bands of Paiutes made a specialty of stealing horses from the large ranches nearer Los Angeles. The stolen animals were driven back into the desert or mountainous regions east of the Sierras, where they were killed and eaten in keeping with the custom of the horse-thief Indians of the San Joaquin in earlier days. A small tribe, inhabiting the mountains between Owens Lake and the headwaters of the Kern, were especially active in these depredations and won for themselves an evil reputation among the harassed ranchers. So severe became the losses from this source that in the month of March 1853, Pio Pico alone lost 500 horses from his Santa Margarita ranch. Posses, of course, were organized to pursue the raiders, and in some cases a large number of the stolen animals were recovered. Pitch battles often occurred, and though the Indians generally suffered severely in these encounters, the pursuing party seldom came off unharmed. In 1856, an ominous riot, commonly spoken of as the Great Mob, broke out in Los Angeles and threatened to develop into a serious race war between the turbulent Mexican element of the population and the American residents, who had organized a vigilance or citizens committee to check the growth of crime. The trouble arose over the killing of a Mexican prisoner by a deputy constable named Jenkins. An angry crowd of Californians and Mexicans gathered on a hill behind the Plaza Church and as the marshal was seeking to reconnoiter their position with a handful of men, shot him to death. The mob then marched to the plaza, but broke up before the citizens' committee attempted to disperse them. The situation for a time, however, seemed so grave that the Americans in Los Angeles sent an appeal to El Monte for aid. Thirty-six men were sent by this little community as reinforcements. The city remained under guard for several days, during which time the most intense excitement prevailed. The year of 1856, described by the Pacific Sentinel as a strange, curious, excitable, volcanic, hot, windy, dusty, thirsty, murdering, bloody, lynching, robbing, thieving season, in the early months of 1857, seemed to have marked the climax of lawlessness and crime in Southern California. Yet the successful enforcement of law and the orderly functioning of the courts came but slowly, and as late as 1863, seven men, one of whom alone was known to have killed six persons, were lynched in Los Angeles during a single month. 
as we remarked elsewhere in this chapter during these early years social conditions in los angeles were extremely primitive in this they were typical of all southern california business life in the fifties was conducted in much the same leisurely fashion that had characterized the old days when los angeles was a mexican pueblo the city with an abundance of land inherited from the original grant of the spanish crown sought for two years with poor success to dispose of thirty-five acre tracts in what is now the main business section at the exorbitant price of a dollar an acre the plaza as in the period of spanish mexican rule still remained the center of civic activities from it radiated most of the principal businesses and residential streets of the little pueblo these were unpaved poorly lighted at night and filled with all manner of unsightly rubbish the city's water supply came from the los angeles river in an open ditch or zanja and on its course through the town collected impurities of every kind there were no banks in the town and much of the small change in circulation was of foreign origin merchants generally closed their shops during the slack hours of the day either to go home for meals or to indulge in a friendly game of cards with some competitor. Quote, to provide a substitute for a table in these games, wrote one of the contemporaries of that day, the window sill of a thick adobe wall was used, the visitor seating himself on a box or barrel on the outside, while the host within at the window would make himself equally comfortable. End quote. Much of the business of the merchants was done with the better-class native families who lived on the ranches surrounding the Pueblo. Travel was still largely on horseback or by the old solid-wheel ox carts known as carretas. The picturesque arrival of one of these lumbering vehicles is thus described by a pioneer chronicler. Quote, the sharp squeaking of the carreta, however, while penetrating and disagreeable in the extreme, served a purpose after all as the signal that a buyer was approaching town for the vehicle was likely to have on board one or even two good-sized families of women and children and the keenest expectation of our little business world was consequently aroused bringing merchants and clerks to the front of their stores a couple of oxen by means of ropes attached to their horns pulled the caretas while the men accompanied their families on horseback and as the roving oxen were inclined to leave the road, one of the riders, wielding a long pointed stick, was kept busy moving from side to side, prodding the wandering animals and thus holding them to the highway. Following these caretas, there were always from twenty-five to fifty dogs, barking and howling as if mad. Some of the caretas had awnings and other tasteful trimmings, and those who could afford it spent a great deal of money on saddles and bridles. Each caballero was supplied with a riata, sometimes locally spelled riata, or leathern rope, one end of which was tied around the neck of the horse, while the other, coiled and tied to the saddle when not in use, was held by the horseman when he went into a house or store. For hitching posts were unknown, with a natural result that there were many runaways. When necessary, the riata was lowered to the level of the ground to accommodate passers-by. Riders were always provided with one or two pistols to say nothing of the knife, which was frequently a part of the armament, and I have seen even sabers suspended from the saddles. End quote. With the exception of Los Angeles, there were few towns of any importance south of Monterey. San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara were but little changed either in population or in any other particular from the days of the old California regime. San Diego, even where the remarkable natural harbor, grew but slowly. Aside from a premature attempt by William Heath Davis to move the town to its present site, and occasional Indian tax on nearby ranches, there was little to record in the city's annals. Footnote. This was in 1850. At one time, there were really three San Diegos, Old Town, Middle Town, and New Town. The last name, where Davis built his wharf and attempted to found a city, is the site of the modern San Diego. In footnote. The prospect of a Pacific Railroad, so often predicted and so long postponed, brought about momentary bursts of excitement, but otherwise business and life went on their unhurried and uneventful way. 
Nearer Los Angeles, three new communities were established before 1860. The first of these was founded by a Mormon colony in 1851 on a tract of land not far from the Cajon Pass. This town, laid out somewhat like the city of Salt Lake, was divided into eight-acre blocks with open irrigating ditches running parallel with the streets. The settlement was called San Bernardino and soon grew to be a thriving agricultural center. The town was also important because of the strategic position it occupied relative to the overland trade with Salt Lake. About the same time that San Bernardino was founded, a company of Texans established themselves on the east bank of the San Gabriel River, some 12 miles from Los Angeles. The settlement was known as Monte or El Monte. It never grew to large size, but its inhabitants very early acquired an enviable reputation for success in agriculture, unanimous loyalty to the Democratic Party, and an enthusiastic readiness to hang suspended criminals. In 1857, a German settlement known as Anaheim was established about 25 miles southeast of Los Angeles on a large tract of land lying close to the Santa Ana River, from which the colony derived its water for irrigation. Quote, the colonists, says one writer, were a curious mixture, two or three carpenters, four blacksmiths, three watchmakers, a brewer, an engraver, a shoemaker, a poet, a miller, a bookbinder, two or three merchants, a hatter, and a musician. End quote. But in spite of this medley of professions, the colony flourished almost from the beginning, and for many years its name was almost a synonym for prosperity and industry throughout the South. End of chapter 21「Chapter twenty two of A History of California, the American Period by Robert Glass Cleland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two California and Sonora, the Day of the Filibuster. The annexation of California and New Mexico in 1848 represented only a partial realization of the territorial ambitions of American expansionists. During the negotiation of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, a vigorous party had sought the acquisition of the whole of Mexico, and a somewhat more conservative group had urged the absorption of the states of Coahuila, Chihuahua, Sonora, and Lower California. Footnote. It is highly probable that only the political rivalries and the dispute over slavery in which American politics were then involved prevented the annexation of these four states. End of footnote. The American expansionists did not immediately abandon their ambitions with the ratification of the treaty. Rather, they looked upon the boundary fixed by that agreement as only a temporary stopping place in the southward progress of the United States. Manifest destiny still called for the further extension of American democracy, American institutions, and American rule. Conditions in Mexico after 1848 were also such as to invite interference from the outside. The central government was torn by frequent revolutions, chronically bankrupt, and on the verge of anarchy. So hopeless was the outlook that thoughtful American and European observers generally agreed that some form of foreign intervention could alone prevent the complete disintegration of the nation. Footnote. As an illustration of this attitude, Senator Houston of Texas proposed to the 34th Congress the establishment of a United States protectorate over Mexico. The object of this measure, as he said, quote, was not to increase our dominions, but to improve our neighborhood. End quote. End of footnote. Conditions in the frontier provinces of northern Mexico were especially the object of American concern during these years. Almost abandoned by the federal government, distracted by factional struggles for the control of local offices, harassed and kept in constant dread by Indian forays, the inhabitants of these outlying states were ready for almost any change that promised security and peace. The extension of American control over the sparsely settled and harassed territory across the border 
was not the most illogical method of solving its many problems. The view of many Americans toward these Mexican border states was clearly set forth in 1848 by an American physician attached to Colonel Donovan's expedition. In his memoir of a tour, Dr. Wislessness wrote, quote, The greatest part of this territory has never been occupied or even explored by the Mexicans, and the thin population in the settled parts of it proves that they never had put any great value on it. The greater inducements which the south of Mexico offered on account of mines, climate, commerce, etc., have concentrated there the seven or eight millions of inhabitants that compose the Mexican nation, allowing but a small portion of them for the northern provinces. One half of this northern territory may, in fact, be a desert and entirely worthless for agriculture. But to a great commercial nation like the United States, with new states springing up on the Pacific, it will nevertheless be valuable for the new connections that it would open with the Pacific, for the great mineral resources of the country, and for its peculiar adaptation for stock raising. Mexico itself would lose very little by the states composing this territory, as they always have been more of a burden to it than a source of revenue. All the connections which heretofore has existed between Mexico and those states was that the general government taxed them as highly as they would submit to, which was never very great, and dragged them as far as possible into the revolutionary vortex in which the south of Mexico was constantly whirling. But it never afforded them any protection against hostile Indians, never stopped their internal strifes, or never promoted the spread of intellect or industry. In short, it heaped, instead of blessing, all the curses of the worst kind of government upon them. Policy, as well as humanity, demands, in my humble opinion, such an extension of the area of freedom for mankind. If deserts and mountain chains are wanted as the best barriers between states, this line affords both these advantages by the Bolson de Mapimi in the east and the extensive Sierra Madre in the west. On the Gulf of California, the important harbor of Wymus would fall above that line. What sort of communication between Wymus and the Rio Grande might be considered the best, a closer exploration of the country must decide. But a railroad would most likely, in the course of years, connect the Rio Grande with the harbor, and give new thoroughfare from the Atlantic to the Pacific for commerce as well as for the emigration to California and Oregon. The distance from Laredo to Wymus in a straight line is about 770 miles. The plan of such a railroad, even if the height of the Sierra Madre in the west would not allow it to be carried in a straight line to the Pacific, but from Chihuahua in a northwestern direction to the Gila, would therefore be less chimerical than the much-talked-of Great Western Railroad from the Mississippi to the Columbia River. And if the above-mentioned country should be attached to the United States, we may in less than ten years see such a project realized. This boundary line would, at the same time, allow an easy defense. Proper military stations at the Rio Grande and near the Gulf of California would secure the terminating points of that line. Some fortifications erected in the mountain passes of the Sierra Madre, where but one main road connects the state of Chihuahua with the south of Mexico, would prevent invasions from that direction, and some smaller forts in the interior would be sufficient to check and control the wild Indians. End quote. Thus, with a certain measure of public opinion in the United States favorable to further expansion at the expense of Mexico, and with the frontier provinces of that country almost defenseless and apparently ready for revolt, it is not to be wondered at that filibustering movements became the order of the day. As might have been expected, the most important of these found their origin in California. Here the disturbed conditions of society furnished a fruitful soil for reckless undertakings of every kind, and men were ready for any enterprise in which lay the promise of profit and excitement. Because of its proximity, unusually rich mineral resources, and rumored antagonism to the central government, Sonora became the natural objective of the California filibusters. It is to be supposed, also, that the leaders of these movements saw a striking likeness in the case of Sonora to the situation presented by California in the early 40s. 
Both territories were rich in undeveloped natural resources. Both suffered from revolution and disturbed political conditions. Both were neglected by the central government. It is true that Sonora always maintained a closer connection with Mexico City than did California, possessed a larger native population, and was less consistently disloyal. On the other hand, her inhabitants had suffered much more severely from Indian attacks and were apparently almost as ready for some form of intervention in 1850 as the Californians were five years before. To conquer this state outright, or to plant American colonies along its frontier, which in time might bring about a movement for independence, consequently became the ambition of more than one adventurous California leader. The first expedition to Sonora were led not by Americans, however, but by Frenchmen. There were many representatives of this nationality in California in the 50s. Some of these had been attracted to the coast by the prospect of the gold fields. Some came to take advantage of the commercial opportunities offered by the new state. Others had been driven over by the upheavals of French politics in the years succeeding the Revolution of 1848. Among this large French element, naturally enough, were adventurers of many sorts. Not finding conditions in California altogether to their liking, a number of the more restless of these turned to Mexico as a field of larger opportunities. The first Sonoran expedition of any importance was composed of about 150 French recruits under the command of the Marquis Charles de Pondre. The latter has been described as a man of noble family, handsome, courageous, gifted with gigantic strength, and very much of a prodigal. As a matter of fact, however, it is doubtful if Pendre's expedition should be classified as a filibustering venture at all. He and his men seemingly had no ambition to stir up a revolt against Mexican sovereignty, but proposed merely to open the rich mining territory in what is now southern Arizona and northern Sonora. In return for certain land and mineral concessions in this frontier area, they were under obligation to establish a number of semi-military colonies to defend the unfortunate inhabitants of Sonora from the devastating attacks of Apache and other Indian tribes. The expedition reached Wymus on December 26, 1851. Here they were greeted with the greatest enthusiasm by the Mexican inhabitants and obtained considerable quantities of supplies and ammunition as well as the promise of financial support from the local authorities. At Arispe, one of the chief cities of the state, Pindre met the governor and other officials who assured him of their heartiest cooperation in his undertaking. The march from Arispe toward the northern frontier, however, was anything but a holiday affair. Privation and danger led to disagreement and of insubordination. At last, Pindre was taken sick in one of the little settlements of northern Sonora, and there either killed himself in a fit of despondency or died at the hands of one of his disgruntled followers. This misfortune ended the expedition. The dispirited survivors either straggled back to the sea coast or found an opportunity to enlist in another expedition, also led by one of their countrymen, which shortly afterward made its appearance in Sonora. This second French enterprise was of much greater magnitude than the Pindre undertaking. The leader of the expedition was an adventurous nobleman, small of stature, decayed in fortune, but full of courage and enthusiasm, known as Count Raousse Bourbon. Whatever may have been Raousse's later intentions, this first expedition was apparently organized as a bona fide mining and colonizing scheme. Dillon, the French consul at San Francisco, was one of the original backers of the venture, and largely through his influence, Raousse was led to lay his plans in person before the Mexican government. In Mexico City, Raousse received a cordial reception from President Arista and also obtained the enthusiastic support of Lavoisier, the French minister. Here, he organized a company known as La Restauradora and obtained for it a concession for the development of the mineral deposits lying south of the Gila River in what was then the northern Sonora. The important banking house of Jecker & Company agreed to finance the undertaking in return for 50% of the company's grant. Rousset, on his part, 
engage to equip an expedition of a hundred and fifty men, establish a defense against the Indians on the Sonora frontier, and open up the valuable mineral resources which the country was said to possess. President Arista and two leading officials of Sonora, named Aguilar and Cubias, were also to share in the profits of the enterprise. When Rousse returned to San Francisco, he had no difficulty in securing the required number of volunteers for his company, and on June 1, 1852, landed at Wymas with 260 men. Here, however, unforeseen difficulties awaited him. The British house of Baron Forbes and Company were stirring up opposition to the plans of the Compañía Restauradora in order that they themselves might obtain the concessions which Rousse had secured from the Mexican government. The contest which ensued was simply the familiar story of two rival foreign companies in Mexico, each seeking to profit from a coveted concession by promised rewards to Mexican officials. In this struggle for political favoritism, the Restauradora's rivals succeeded in enlisting the support of the military governor of Sonora, General Blanco. Under various pretexts, Blanco succeeded in delaying Rousset's advance to the interior, and when he finally gave permission for the expedition to proceed, it was only that he might still more seriously embarrass it before it reached the Arizona mines. The climax came in August, when the company was encamped on the Altar River in northern Sonora. Here, Rousset received a message from Blanco which compelled him either to defy the governor's authority or to abandon the entire enterprise. In Blanco's communication, the French commander was ordered to choose one of three courses. His men might renounce their French citizenship and sign as Mexican soldiers under Blanco's command. They might obtain proper passports from the city of Mexico, allowing them to enter the Arizona Territory, but conferring upon them no right to denounce mineral properties. Or they might reduce their number to 50 men and, under the direction of a Mexican leader, proceed to carry out the plans of the Restauradora. Blanco's orders were interpreted by Rousse as an unwarranted cancellation of the terms of the concession he had received direct from the central government. It was a question, then, whether he should obey a state official and sacrifice all he hoped to acquire for himself and his associates, or rely upon the authority of the federal administration and defy the local governor. The choice was not difficult, especially as Rousset was convinced that Blanco was acting in the interests of his English rivals. Up to this time, the expedition had about it none of the earmarks of a filibustering enterprise, but from now on it began to assume the characteristics of such a movement. Rousset's next step was to appeal to the inhabitants of northern Sonora to join him against the Blanco government. Receiving some measure of support from the Apache-ridden districts in which he was encamped, he next prepared a flag for an independent state and started to march against Blanco's headquarters at Hermosillo. The attack on this city, garrisoned by some 1,200 men, was made by a beggarly force of 240 Frenchmen. As Rousset's command approached the town, the prefect sent a deputation offering a considerable sum of money if the French would retire without bringing on an engagement. Rousset's answer was slightly melodramatic. Holding his watch in hand, he replied, It is now eight o'clock. In two hours I shall attack the city. At eleven o'clock I shall be master of it. Go tell this to your prefect. Due to Rousset's impetuous leadership, and the savage enthusiasm of his followers, half of whom were heroes and half bandits, this pledge was almost literally fulfilled. A short, sharp skirmish drove the defenders out of their positions and gave the city into Rousset's hands. His loss was 17 killed and 23 wounded, against 200 killed and wounded among the Blanco forces. The capture of Hermosillo marked the climax of Rousset's career. Seriously ill and weighted down by the responsibilities of an undertaking which had suddenly changed from a peaceful colonizing enterprise to a victorious military campaign, the French leader was in no position to press forward for the conquest of the state, if indeed at the time he had any actual ambition to carry out such a program. By an agreement with a new governor of Sonora, Gandara, 
Rause agreed to evacuate Hermosillo, provided his men might retire unmolested to the sea coast. Once at Guaymas, most of the expedition were glad to return to San Francisco. Thither the leader himself sailed after some months of convalescence at Mazatlan. Rause, however, by no means abandoned his Sonora ambitions with the dissolution of his first expedition. His countrymen, Dillon and Lavoisier, who had backed him in the Restoradora enterprise, again urged him to go to the city of Mexico and secure the permission of the central government for the establishment of a French colony on the frontier. Santa Anna had succeeded to the presidency and was reported to be much in favor of such an enterprise. Accordingly, Rause again made his appearance in the Mexican capital, and after some negotiations secured Santa Anna's consent to the establishment of a colony of 500 French citizens in northern Sonora, to better serve as a barrier against the Indian forays. Before the details of the concession could be arranged, however, the Mexican dictator and the volatile Frenchman had a serious falling out, and Rause returned to San Francisco with a brand of an outlaw fastened upon him. But in no sense discouraged by the hostility of the Mexican government, Rause set about the organization of the Sonoran expedition. Though at first he met with very poor success, fate at last played directly into his hands. When prospects were most discouraging, the attack of William Walker upon Lower California aroused Santa Ana's apprehensions against the American advance into Sonora, and as the only means of offsetting this danger, the Mexican dictator fell back upon the plan of establishing a French colony on the frontier. To carry out this measure, Luis de Valle, the Mexican consul at San Francisco, was instructed by his government to enlist a maximum of 5,000 Frenchmen in California for the Sonora colony. These were to be sent down to Guaymas at public expense, and after a year's service would receive a grant of land from the Mexican government. Del Valle carried his instructions to the French consul, Dillon, who in turn enlisted the support of Rause. As a result of the combined efforts of the three, some 800 Frenchmen were enrolled for the enterprise. The British ship Challenge was chartered to transport the expedition down the coast. But before she could sail, certain United States officials at San Francisco had taken a hand in the game, libeled the challenge, and indicted the Mexican consul for a violation of the neutrality laws. After some legal maneuvering, the challenge, with her passenger list reduced by half, was allowed to depart. Some weeks later, Rausu quietly sailed out of San Francisco with a handful of companions in a schooner of less than 10 tons burden. After trying hardships, including shipwreck on the island of Santa Margarita, he at last reached Wymus, only to find that most of his countrymen who had preceded him very lukewarm toward any attack against Mexican authority. Nor did Rousset's attempt to induce Yanez, the Mexican commander, to join with him in a revolt against Santa Ana meet with any better success. With a few of the French contingent more venturesome or less sensible than the rest, Rause next planned to drive the Mexican forces from the city, but a Quixotic sense of modesty kept him from taking personal command of the attack. Less than 200 Frenchmen engaged in the affray, and most of them were badly demoralized at first fire. All of Rause's bravery and exhortations could not check the rout. The filibusters were scattered, and many of them killed. The remainder took refuge at the French consulate, where they had laid down their arms when the Mexican commander pledged himself to spare their lives. Rause himself was included in this pledge. A score of times during the engagement he had courted death, and only when his followers fled like frightened sheep had he broken the blade of his sword in disgust and followed the mob to the shelter of the consul's office. Except in the case of Rause, the Mexican commander kept his promise of immunity to the French prisoners. But due in part to the treachery of the French consul, Calvo, the unfortunate leader was excluded from the general amnesty and received the sentence of death at the hands of a military court. The execution took place at six o'clock on the morning of August 12, 1854. 
the bravery and composure of Rousse, who secured the special favor of facing his executioners unblindfolded, so unnerved the soldiers who composed the firing squad that their shots failed to reach a vital spot, and a second volley was required to complete the execution. With Rousset's death, the French ambitions in Sonora, for a time, came to an end. Soon after Rousset's execution, an expedition undisguisedly filibustering in its character was set on foot against Sonora by way of Lower California. This was led by the redoubtable William Walker, in some respects the most inveterate filibuster the United States has yet produced. Walker was born in Nashville, Tennessee, the son of a Scotch banker. He received a very thorough university training and also spent some time in European travel. He later began his professional career as a physician, but soon took up the study of the law and afterwards turned to journalism as a more congenial occupation. In 1849, Walker came to California and for some time maintained a connection with the San Francisco Herald. In 1851, he went to Marysville, where he formed a law partnership with Colonel Henry P. Watkins, the nephew of Henry Clay. While thus engaged, Walker and a few companions met at Auburn, California, and talked over a plan similar to that proposed by Rousset Bourbon of establishing a colony on the frontiers of Sonora. One may reasonably conclude, however, that the political features of this enterprise were more attractive to the Marysville lawyer than the prospect of material gain. Two representatives were sent to Wymas to obtain the necessary concession for the establishment of the colony, and perhaps to sound out the Sonora governor regarding a more ambitious plan of independence. But these agents accomplished nothing. First, because Rousset had already preempted the field, and second, because the San Francisco capitalists, who were backing the enterprise, withdrew their support on account of changed political conditions in the Mexican capital. Not long after this fruitless mission, Walker resolved to go to Wymas to spy out the land on his own account. At this time, there was little about the future filibuster to mark him as a popular leader. He was a taciturn, reticent man who would often sit for an hour in company without opening his lips. As much as possible, he kept himself apart from men and appeared indifferent to their opinions. Physically, too, he was poorly equipped to appeal to the popular imagination. He was below the average in height and weighed not much over a hundred pounds. A contemporary described him as, quote, a small, red-haired, white-eyed man, freckle-faced, slow of speech, very observant, rather visionary, but possessed of a species of perseverance which is most uncommon. His courage is unquestioned, and although one of the most modest men in his manners, he is as bold as a lion in his measures." Quote. On his visit to Wymas, Walker met with a suspicion bordering upon open hostility from the Mexican officials, nor did his appearance greatly commend itself to their admiration. An American named Warren, who was there at the time, thus described his peculiar costume. Quote, his head was surmounted by a huge white fur hat, whose long nap waved with the breeze, which, together with a very ill-made, short-waisted blue coat with gilt buttons and a pair of gray, strapless pantaloons, made up the ensemble of as unprepossessing-looking a person as one would meet in a day's walk. I will leave you to imagine the figure he cut in Wymus, with the thermometer at a hundred degrees when everyone else was arrayed in white. End quote. Before the close of Walker's stay at Wymus, there was evidence of a more friendly attitude on the part of the Mexican governor. But Walker refused to meet his advances and returned to San Francisco intent upon another plan of operations. This, in brief, involved an advance against Sonora by way of Lower California. After considerable difficulties with the United States government officials at San Francisco, Walker succeeded in putting to sea in the brig Caroline, having on board some 45 men belonging to the 1st Independence Battalion, as the expedition was bravely called. The Caroline arrived at the harbor of La Paz, where Cortez had established his short-lived colony more than 300 years before, early in November 1853. 
Here, Walker's men effected a landing without opposition. They next proceeded to seize the governor, Espinosa, haul down the Mexican flag, and proclaim the Republic of Lower California. After a brief stay at La Paz, the expedition embarked for a new field of conquest. Before quitting the harbor for good, however, a detachment of Walker's men engaged in a small skirmish with the La Paz citizens, and about the same time he seized another governor who had been sent from Mexico to succeed Espinosa. After a brief stop at Cape San Lucas, the Caroline continued up the coast until she reached the harbor of Ensenada. Here, Walker made his headquarters and proceeded to organize his new government. One of the first steps in this process was to issue the appended declaration justifying his course of action to the American people. Quote, in declaring the Republic of Lower California free, sovereign, and independent, wrote Walker, I deem it proper to give the people of the United States the reasons for the course I have taken. The Mexican government has for a long time failed to perform its duties to the province of Lower California. Cut off as the territory was by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo from all direct communication with the rest of Mexico, the central authorities have maintained little or no interest in the affairs of the California Peninsula. The geographical position of the province is such as to make it entirely separate and distinct in its interests from the other portions of the Mexican Republic. But the moral and social ties which bound it to Mexico have been even weaker and more dissoluble than the physical. Hence, to develop the resources of Lower California and to effect a proper social organization therein, it was necessary to make it independent. On such considerations have I and my companions in arms acted in the course we have pursued. And for the success of our enterprise, we put our trust in him who controls the destiny of nations and guides them in the ways of progress and improvement. William Walker, President of the Republic of Lower California. End quote. The government which Walker established consisted of the following officials. William Walker, President. Frederick Emery, Secretary of State. John M. Jernigan, Secretary of War. Howard H. Snow, Secretary of the Navy, and Charles H. Gilman, Captain of the Battalion, and William P. Mann, Captain of the Navy. While Walker was thus occupied in Lower California, his partner Watkins was busy organizing reinforcements in San Francisco. The Brig Anita was chartered to carry the men down the coast, and in order to avoid detention by the authorities, some measure of secrecy was maintained in the preparation. On December 7th, everything was in readiness and the actual work of embarkation began. It was carried out with more than usual dispatch if the following account is to be relied upon. Quote, About halfway down from Front Street, a door was thrown open and as if by magic, drays and carts made their appearance. Files of men sprung out and passed quantities of powder from the shore besides ammunition of all kinds. A detachment stood guard the while in utter silence, and the movements were made with such celerity that the observer could scarcely perceive how and where the articles made their appearance. End quote. The arrival of the Anita at Ensenada brought Walker both relief and difficulties. The reinforcements were badly needed, for already Walker had engaged in a serious skirmish with the Mexican forces. But the Anita had scant supplies on board, and the problem of securing food was rendered all the more acute by the hundred additional soldiers who must now be fed. An attack upon a notorious Mexican bandit named Menendez enabled Walker to secure a considerable number of cattle, and the flesh of these, with a little corn, constituted the sole provisions of the company. Necessity and choice alike now drove Walker to proceed with the real purpose of the expedition, namely the invasion of Sonora. As a preliminary to the actual conquest, he proclaimed the establishment of a new government called the Republic of Sonora. Lower California and Sonora were the states of the new republic, and a flag with two stars was unfurled as its emblem. Walker announced himself the president of the republic, and Watkins became its vice president. 
The conquest of Sonora, however, proved much more difficult than the proclamation of the Republic. Discontent and desertion seriously reduced the effectiveness of Walker's force. The activities of United States officials in California prevented the sending of badly needed reinforcements from that quarter. Supplies and provisions were almost exhausted, and the inhabitants of Lower California were becoming increasingly hostile to the American interlopers. Walker planned to advance against Sonora by crossing the peninsula of Lower California and then rounding the head of the Gulf. A more difficult and inhospitable route can scarcely be imagined. Mountains, desert, and the broad waters of the Colorado all alike offered formidable obstacles to the struggling handful of men who had tempted the march. Worn out and in rags, the company reached the river early in April. In seeking to ford the Colorado, most of the cattle were drowned, thus leaving the invading army with almost no source of food. Even Walker, though now actually in Sonora, saw the hopelessness of further conquest. Half his men deserted and straggled northward to Fort Yuma. The remnant turned back over the weary route they had come, and on April 17th reached the small town of San Vicente, where a garrison of 25 men had been left at the beginning of the Sonora campaign. This garrison had been destroyed by the bandit forces of Menendez, and the latter now began to threaten the reduced company under Walker with the same fate. The filibusters therefore turned their dispirited steps toward the American border, and though constantly menaced by the irregular troops under Menendez, succeeded in reaching the safety of American soil without having to face a serious engagement. The border was crossed May 8, 1854, at a point close to the modern Mexican resort of Tijuana. Walker's army at this time consisted of 33 men. They were sent north to San Francisco, where in June their leader was brought to trial for violation of the neutrality laws of the United States. After deliberating for eight minutes, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. So far as Mexican territory was concerned, this ended Walker's career as a filibuster. For a time, he resumed his profession of journalism and also played an active part in California politics as a member of the Broderick Wing of the Democratic Party. Footnote, this was the anti-slavery wing of that party. The old-time view that the filibustering expeditions against Mexican territory were for the purpose of extending slavery is untenable. In footnote. A year later, however, his dreams of empire again drove him to re-enter the dangerous calling in which he had served his apprenticeship in Lower California. On May 4, 1855, Walker once more sailed out of the Golden Gate, bent on great deeds and high emprise. His goal was a troubled Republic of Nicaragua. Here he was destined to meet with a full tale of adventure, experience, countless vicissitudes of fortune, and eventually realized to some extent the restless ambitions to which he had surrendered his career. Success, however, was only fleeting. On the morning of September 12, 1860, William Walker, freebooter, pirate, soldier of fortune, and international outlaw, as he was variously called, was led out of the little Honduran town of Trujillo as a prisoner. Just beyond the town, in an angle of an abandoned fort, Erect and unafraid, he was shot to death by a firing squad. Perhaps this was the fate Walker deserved, but wonders what his judgment history would have passed upon him if his dreams had become realities, even as one wonders what place Sam Houston would hold today if the Texas Revolution had been a failure. Following Walker's fiasco in Lower California, one other Californian sought to carry through the familiar plan of establishing an American colony in Sonora. The leader in the enterprise was Henry A. Crabb, one of Walker's former schoolmates in Nashville who had come to the coast in 1849. Crabb soon won for himself a respected name in Northern California and was elected to a number of important political positions. Through his marriage into a Spanish family, which had formerly owned large holdings in Sonora, Crabb became interested in the political and economic future of that harassed state. Footnote. Crabb's wife was a member of the Ainsa family, 
claiming descent from Juan Batista de Anza, a pioneer explorer from Sonora to California. In, in 1856, he organized a colonizing company and took some 50 persons from California into Sonora over the Los Angeles Yuma Trail. On this visit, Crabb came in contact with Ignacio Pesquiera, the leader of one of the two rival political factions in the state. At that time, Pesquiera was involved in a revolution against the local government, headed by Gandara, and sought to enlist Crabb's aid in the effort to unseat his rival. Crabb was apparently won over by Pesquiera's representations, including a promise to seek Sonora's annexation to the United States, and returned to California with the idea of gathering together an expedition to carry out the undertaking. Early in 1857, he organized the Arizona Colonization Company and enlisted nearly a hundred men in the enterprise. Many of these were gold seekers from the mines in Tuolumne County, and others were recruited in San Francisco. At least half a dozen were men of marked political prominence in the state. The expedition reached San Pedro on January 24th. They then marched overland to El Monte, where provisions, wagons, and horses were secured, and a few additional recruits enlisted from among the reckless Texas settlers who had made up the little community. Leaving El Monte, the company proceeded by way of San Gorgonio Pass in the Coachella Valleys to Fort Yuma. Here the company remained until March. Crabb then led his men, by this time a fairly well-disciplined force, into the little Sonoran town of Sonoita. Here he learned with some surprise that the Mexican officials were preparing to resist his advance and that his colonizing enterprise was sure to be attended with some difficulty. The explanation of this unexpected Mexican hostility lay in Pesquiera's change in attitude. After Crabb's return to California from his first visit to Sonora, Pesquiera and Gandara had reconciled their differences and divided the spoils of office between them. Pesquiera, consequently, had no longer any use for Crabb's services and feared lest his former relations with the American might prove a serious embarrassment if they became known. He therefore bent all his energies toward defeating the plans of the expedition and destroying those who composed it. Crabb, perhaps ignorant of Pesquiera's change of heart, or else regarding his expedition as a legitimate colonizing enterprise based on an established Mexican law, had difficulty in understanding the critical danger in which he and his men were now involved. Leaving Sonoita, the expedition began its march from the border, but near the town of Caborca, they were fired upon by a party of Mexican troops lying in ambush. In a short time, the entire company was fighting for its life in the narrow streets and adobe houses of the little pueblo. After several of his men had been killed and others severely wounded, Crabb sought terms of surrender. The Mexican commander, Gabilondo, promised the Americans a fair trial and agreed to furnish proper medical attention for their wounded. Crabb unwisely accepted these terms. His men, one by one, crossed the street from the American position to a church occupied by the Mexican forces. No sooner had they laid down their arms than they were securely bound and taken to the Mexican barracks. The surrender occurred about 11 o'clock on the night of April 6th. The next morning, the Americans were taken out in squads of five and ten and mercilessly executed under Gabalando's orders and at the instigation of Pesquiera. The details of the massacre are too barbarous to be repeated. For heartless cruelty, the incident is unsurpassed, even by the slaughter of the French at St. Augustine or the butchery of the Texans at Goliad. The bodies of the Americans were left unburied, and subject to the most shameful and revolting treatment. Footnote. Only one of the party, a boy 14 years of age named Charles Evans, escaped. Other Americans, two of whom at least were on American soil, were seized and killed by Mexican troops after the Caborca massacre. In footnote. Crabb himself faced death as a gentleman should, as calmly and quietly as though we were going to a pleasant home. The Mexican commander had reserved for him a special form of execution. He was tied to a post with his hands raised above his head 
and his back to the Mexican troops. In this position, his body was riddled with nearly a hundred balls. His head was then cut off and preserved in mezcal as a trophy of the occasion. Certain American historians have shown a peculiar tendency to applaud the massacre of American citizens at Caborca as a justifiable outburst of Mexican patriotism. Such an attitude is difficult to account for. Crabb and his men were not executed by patriots, driven to a terrible act of vengeance by a violation of the country's rights. The true explanation of the tragedy lies in Pesquiera's antagonism to the Ainsa family, with which Crabb was allied, and in his desire to restore his tarnished reputation and destroy those whose testimony might convict him of traitorous dealings. John Forsyth, American minister to Mexico at the time of the massacre, correctly summed up the motives of the massacre as follows. Quote, I think there is little reason to doubt that Mr. Crabb was invited to Sonora and that he was the victim of deception, treachery, and surprise. The sequel of history, I fear, will prove that the extermination of himself and his party was designed to cover up the complicity and treason of some of the Mexican public men of Sonora. This is only surmise on my part, colored, however, by some dark hints that have come to me to that effect. It is not easy upon a different hypothesis to account for the conduct of Crabbe. He was a man of sense and energy and cannot be supposed to have gone with his eyes open into the snare that was set for him. He must have been betrayed. End quote. Elsewhere, Forsyth, who was decidedly hostile to Crabbe's expedition, made this interesting comment. Quote, the expeditionists have certainly chosen an unfortunate time for their movements as regards the interests of the United States and their relations with Mexico. The invasion is calculated to produce an unhappy influence adverse to the efforts which I have constantly and perseveringly made to eradicate from the Mexican mind the deeply seated distrust of Americans and to establish in its stead a confidence in the friendly and honorable sentiments of our government and people toward them. My observation has taught me to believe that nothing but this distrust and fear of our people has prevented the states bordering the United States, especially those like Chihuahua and Sonora, overrun by savages and receiving no protection from the Mexican government, from breaking their feeble ties with the central government and seeking an annexation with us, that security for life and property of which they are now wholly destitute. The people of Mexico have been taught to believe, from the examples cited to them in California and Texas, that their property titles, especially the land, would not be respected by their new rulers. I have the opinion of the most intelligent man I meet here that this circumstance alone has saved to the Republic of Mexico the fidelity of Tamaulipas, New León, Chihuahua, and Sonora. End quote. Crabbe's death marked the end of expeditions from California into Mexican territory. The coming of a more settled state of society and the outbreak of the Civil War brought this particular phase of the state's history to a close. Sonora, the land of romance, the land of tragedy, the dreamland of the filibuster, was destined to retain her Mexican statehood, instead of adding another name to the long list of those Mexican provinces which the United States acquired in the days when manifest destiny was something more than a popular phrase. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 A History of California, the American Period by Robert Glass Cleland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23. The First Decade of Politics During the decade immediately following the establishment of state government in California, politics never attained a very high level. Only a lukewarm interest was taken in national affairs, except as an action of Congress or the President promised to affect some matter of local concern. Even in the workings of their own state government, the people showed such little interest that political control passed almost entirely out of their keeping into the hands of a few skillful, energetic men whose bitter rivalry for control of party machinery 
added an exciting though unedifying element to the otherwise monotonous course of local politics curiously enough the first california legislature had met performed its duties and adjourned almost a year before california became a state the capital had temporarily been fixed at san jose by the constitutional convention and here the two houses met on december fifteenth eighteen forty nine with 16 members in the Senate and 36 in the Assembly. Footnote. Each legislator received $16 a day during the session, with an allowance of the same amount for every 20 miles traveled to and from the state capital. In footnote. The chief work of this legislature consisted in drafting a code of laws, providing revenue to meet the government's immediate needs, and electing William Gwynne and John C. Fremont to the United States Senate. The body also attained a certain unique position in the state's history as the Legislature of a Thousand Drinks, a name which owed its origin, so it is said, to the oft-repeated motion of Senator Thomas J. Green, late of Texas, to adjourn and take a thousand drinks. The chief issues in state politics after the government was in actual operation included the location of a permanent capital, a conflict of interest between the mining counties on the one hand and the agricultural and commercial sections on the other, the grievances of the South against the North, especially in connection with the levying of taxes, appointments to office, and apportionment of public funds, the question of state aid for stage and immigrant roads across the mountains, the sale of waterfront lots in San Francisco, the difficulty of enforcing law, and the protection of frontier counties from Indian depredations. The permanent location of the state capital caused considerable stir both in the legislature and among the rival cities contesting for the prize. San Jose and Monterey were the best known of these, but two as yet in embryo cities also offered their appeal. One of these, called by its sponsors New York on the Pacific, made up in name what it lacked in size. The other, like the ancient city of Nehemiah, was large and great, but the people were few and the houses not yet builded. The site of this second prospective capital was a tract of land on the Straits of Carquines belonging to General Vallejo. The latter offered to donate 156 acres to the state for public purposes, and within two years provide $370,000 in cash for the erection of buildings if the capital should be located on the proposed grant. A popular election authorized the change from San Jose to Vallejo, as the new site was called, and after a good deal of wrangling and some further offers from Vallejo, the legislature accepted the general's proposal. When the legislature came together in January 1852, however, some six months after Vallejo had agreed to provide proper accommodations for its sessions and living quarters for its members, they found that none of these things had been done. Nor was Vallejo able to live up to the other obligations he had undertaken. So the state government, after much confusion, departed bag and baggage from the Carcanes metropolis to Sacramento. It was not until 1854, however, that this city was made the permanent capital. When it became known that the government proposed to move to Sacramento, the people of that city chartered a river steamer, the Empire, to convey the members of the legislature to the new scene of their labors. The departure from Viejo was thus described by a humorous and disrespectful correspondent of one of the contemporary newspapers. Quote, Bright and early, therefore, the next day, the whole town was in commotion. Carpets were torn up from the floor, Stoves and the long stovepipes came down on the run. The china chairs were tumbled in a heap out of the state house and carried in homogeneous masses on men's heads down to the wharf. The barkeepers, finding their occupation was gone, decided to stick by the legislature as their only safeguard, and decanters and tumblers, bars and bar fixtures, stout and bitters, silver twirlers, and champagne baskets went pell-mell into the confusion and down aboard the boat mixed in with the legislatures, judges, and private gentlemen who merely came along to see what the two houses were doing. The barber put his razor, his indiscriminate hairbrush, and his supply of one towel into his pocket, 
shouldered his chair, and marched down to the empire also. Here and there, only, was a long face marking some spectator who was gazing bewildered in the turmoil, and saying to himself, Fallen is Vallejo, Vallejo the Magnificent. While in the midst of the confusion, the shrill notes of the washerwoman were heard, who was hurling elegant epithets against everything in general, the gay deceivers of the legislature in particular, and now and then interlarding her remarks with moral reflections touching unpaid bills, etc. End quote. The rivalry between the mining and agricultural districts of the state was a far more serious affair than the question of the location of the capital. The friction, indeed, which arose out of this conflict of interests, especially that created by the question of taxation, was largely responsible for the frequent efforts at state division attempted during this period. For a while, San Francisco and other non-mining sections in the North had in some degree the same grievances as the South, yet the latter suffered far more keenly from the unjust burdens of taxation and the unequal distribution of state favors. Even as early as the Constitutional Convention, a group of Southern delegates had favored state division and sought the establishment of a territorial government for the counties they represented. In doing this, they were actuated largely by the fear that the South, with its relatively scant population and its large land holdings, would be compelled, if united with the North, to bear a disproportionate share of the state's financial burden, while having but little voice in its government or share in its political rewards. This fear, fed also in some degree by the traditional antipathy of South to North and inherited from the old days of Mexican control, found ample justification as the state government got underway. In Governor McDougall's annual message of January 7, 1852, he pointed out that taxation throughout the state was in no sense proportionate either to population or to representation in the legislature. The six southern counties, with a population of approximately 6,000, annually paid to the state $42,000 in taxes on real estate and personal property. The 12 counties chiefly devoted to mining, which represented 120,000 persons, escaped with only $21,000. In poll taxes, the southern counties contributed nearly $4,000 to the state treasury. The mining counties, though assessed over $50,000 under this form of tax, actually paid only 3500 Yet the southern counties, which combined, paid twice the taxes of the mining sections, had only 12 representatives in the legislature, while the mountain counties sent 44. Figures of a similar nature were compiled from time to time by southern newspapers for the benefit of their already disgruntled constituents, and as a protest against the manifest injustice of the tax and representative apportionments. Quote, the overwhelming influence of the North in the legislature is seen in every act which has been passed within two years, said one Los Angeles newspaper in 1851. The northern counties are engaged almost entirely in mining and contain very little land liable to taxation. As a consequence, the burdens of taxation fall principally upon the South, burdens which our people are poorly able to bear, end quote. Another southern paper declared that the injustice, quote, worked by this unequal apportionment will account for the almost unanimous feeling of the southern people in favor of a separation from the north and the establishment of a territorial government, End quote. Again, the star sarcastically remarked that the legislature at Sacramento never gave a thought to the insignificant cow counties of the south until it became necessary to raise additional revenue for state purposes. Nor was the dissatisfaction confined to the question of taxation and representation alone. The non-mining sections, north as well as south, were united in the feeling that the mining population and their representatives at the capital were ignorant of the state's needs and lacked interest in its welfare. Quote, they make laws for their own government said the Daily Alta in speaking of the miners, and in all things live, move, and almost think separately and apart, 
as though no bond of connection or sympathy existed between their interests and those of the commercial cities and other sources of wealth in our infant state. End quote. But while the non mining counties in the north felt in some degree the injustice of these matters, they at least were able to secure sufficient benefits from the state in the form of appropriations, special legislation, and appointments to public office to offset whatever inequalities they complained of. And as time went on, their growth in population enabled them also to obtain a fair degree of equality of representation with the mining counties. The South, however, found no such compensation for its grievances, and for at least a decade continued to agitation for a division of the state. In 1851, this movement reached such serious proportions that a convention to divide the state of California was summoned to meet in Los Angeles on November 10th. The call to this convention summed up the viewpoint of the South thus, quote, Whatever of good the experiment of a state government may have otherwise led to in California, for us of the southern counties it has proved only a splendid failure. The bitter fruits of it no county has tasted more keenly than Los Angeles, with all her immense and varied natural resources, her political, social, and pecuniary condition at this moment is deplorable in the extreme, her industry paralyzed under the insupportable burden of taxation, her port almost forsaken by commerce, her surplus products of no value on account of the enormous price of freights, her capital flying to other climes, a sense of utter insecurity of property pervading all classes, and everything tending to increase and fasten upon her in the guise of legislation a state of actual oppression. A prey to the incessant Indian depredations from without and destitute of internal protection for our lives and property under laws as applicable to our wants and the character of the population, and with all the continued ruinous taxation impending over us. Our future is gloomy indeed as a community, if we shall fail in this appeal to our brethren of the North for the only redress consonant with our mutual interests, a separation, friendly and peaceful but still complete, leaving the North and South to fulfill their grand destinies under systems of laws suited to each. End quote. The signers of this document were Augustine Oliveira, Pio Pico, Benjamin Hayes, J. Lancaster Brent, Louis Granger, John O. Wheeler, Jose Antonio Carrillo. Though the movement of 1851 accomplished no practical end, the southern counties continued in a desultory fashion to talk of state division until 1859. The failure of the government at Sacramento to check the lawlessness and crime everywhere so prevalent in the state or to provide any adequate defense for the exposed communities of the South against Indian phrase, added to the irritation and discontent engendered by other grievances. Some Southern residents may also have cherished the faint hope of establishing a pro-slave territory, if the state should be divided, but the force of this motive was of minor significance, if indeed it ever had any real existence. By 1859, Conditions seemed favorable for the South to accomplish its long-cherished purpose. A bill proposing state division was presented by Andreas Pico in the legislature, and on April 18th, that body gave its consent to the formation of a separate government for the five counties of San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Bernardino, and a part of Buena Vista. These were to be erected into a territory called the Territory of the Colorado, or by some other name the citizens might select. But in order to become effective, it was necessary for the proposed measure to receive a two-thirds vote in the counties affected, as well as the sanction of Congress. As the last requirement had not been met before the Civil War broke out, the measure died aborting. During this decade, Unfortunately for the later history of the state, political morality was so lax and legislative standards so low that inefficiency and corruption became a sort of traditional heritage of the California legislature for many years to come. 
The details of individual cases of graft and dishonesty of 70 years standing are of no great significance today, but this early surrender of the state to those who sought only personal profit or advantage from political control set an unfortunate precedent whose consequences later decades had difficulty in escaping. Many of the newspapers were outspoken enough in their criticisms of the government during these years, but little good seems to have come from such attacks. The legislature of 1851, to cite a random example, was spoken of by one of the San Francisco papers, an infamous, ignorant, drunken, rowdy, perjured, and traitorous body of men. The Daily Alta Californian, an Oregon of the Independents, rejoiced that the legislature of 1852 would rectify the evil done by its predecessors and, quote, rescue the state from the labyrinth of imbecility, vagueness, and iniquity into which it is strayed with scarcely a clue by which to retrace its erring steps or life and strength enough to vindicate its honor and punish those who have shamelessly abused its confidence, end quote. Before many days, however, according to the same writer, the new body gave unmistakable evidence of following the old system of combinations, arrangements, pledges, promises, log-rolling, scheming, and swapping of votes, which had characterized its predecessor. These charges were doubtless exaggerated. But trustworthy records, not only of these two sessions, but of nearly all other meetings of the legislature during the decade, testified to the low political standards at the time. Federal issues figured but little in the state's politics, though parties were organized along national lines and voters nominally cast their ballots as Whigs, Know-Nothings, or Democrats, depending chiefly on their previous party affiliations east of the mountains. There was also a small group of independents who occasionally held the balance of power between the regular parties, but while this group could sometimes determine the choice of rival candidates, it was rarely of sufficient importance or well enough organized to fill state or national offices with its own men. The regular parties were under a machine control that recognized no shadow of popular responsibility. The Democratic Party, especially, which dominated the state during all but a year or two of the decade, when the know-nothings held a brief supremacy, was led by a group of shrewd dictators who regarded the state as a sort of private preserve for their own political advantage. The struggle for supremacy among these self-constituted leaders furnished the chief element of excitement in state politics until the Civil War, and it culminated in the bitter feud between Broderick and Gwynn, which disrupted the Democratic Party and prepared the way for Republican control. William M. Gwynn was a Tennessean by birth, a physician by education, and a politician by instinct and deliberate choice. His early career had been determined very largely by his close association with Andrew Jackson, who, whatever may have been his faults, seldom neglected to advance the political interests of personal friends. Gwynn, accordingly, had acquired a certain reputation in Tennessee and Mississippi before the close of the Polk administration. But when the gold rush started, he set out for California, resolved to assume the leadership of politics in the new state and secure a seat in the United States Senate. Gwynne's ambitions were quickly realized, for in the first legislative session after the adoption of the Constitution, in the framing of which he had played a prominent part, he was elected to the United States Senate for the full term of six years. As the most conspicuous of California's representatives at Washington, Gwynne served his state with more than ordinary success and at home built up a constituency that seemed to render his position permanently secure. His supremacy, however, did not long go unchallenged. David C. Broderick of New York, son of an Irish stonemason to which trade he himself had been apprenticed as a boy, reached California shortly before Gwynne's election to the Senate and began at once to organize a rival political machine. Broderick, like Gwynne, came to California with the purpose of realizing certain definite political ambitions. Like Gwynne, too, he was already trained in practical politics before he reached the Pacific, 
But his education along this line had been very different from that of his southern opponent, for while Gwynne represented the traditions and practices of the Democrats of the Southwest, Broderick had learned his art in the shrewdest of all political schools, the Tammany Organization of New York. To the training thus acquired, he added a native aptitude for controlling men, an aggressive determination, and a contemptuous disregard for the methods and traditions of the older school of politics. In the rivalry between these two men, the bitterest and most intense in the history of the state, Gwynne found his chief support among the Southern and Western Democrats in California. His followers were commonly dubbed the Chivalry Wing, or more popularly, the Shivs, and were supposed to hold aristocratic ideals of government, as opposed to the more democratic conception of Broderick supporters, most of whom were men of northern extraction. Gwynne's followers were also charged with pro-slavery views, and as Gwynne himself has frequently been styled the arch-champion of the slave-holding interests in California, the Gwynne-Broderick fight is often explained as a contest between the pro-slavery and the anti-slavery forces of the state. As a matter of fact, however, the issue was not so much one of principle as of personal ambition, and neither Gwynne's attitude on the Negro question nor Broderick's much affected it either way. Gwynne's chief advantage, aside from his reputation and established leadership in state affairs, lay in his monopoly of federal patronage and his control, because of this, of a very effective political machine in which federal office holders played an important part. Broderick, on the contrary, though almost shut off from this source of influence, succeeded in building up a powerful following, both through the organization of municipal politics in San Francisco and Sacramento, and by the adroit use of state patronage and the manipulation of nominating conventions for state offices. One of the most notable encounters in the struggle for supremacy between these two men came in the legislature of 1854. Normally, the election of United States Senator was not due until the session of 1855, but Broderick, thinking he controlled the situation, sought to force the legislature then in session to proceed with the election. This plan almost succeeded, but after a bitter and at times an apparently losing fight, the Gwynne faction finally defeated the maneuver and deferred the election until its regular time. In the contest, it is needless to remark, both sides resorted to every means, legal and illegal, at their command, and the money spent to influence the legislative vote ran far ahead of anything the state had ever known before. The bitterness engendered by this fight naturally led to a widening of the breach in the Democratic Party. The next state convention, which met in Sacramento, broke up in confusion, and for a time, since most of the delegates were armed, it looked as though a pitched battle would certainly result. The next day, the two factions held separate conventions, and each put its own ticket into the field, thus apparently assuring success for the Whig Party in the fall elections. The latter party, however, was not able to take advantage of its opportunity, and the election returns gave the Gwynn candidates a decided majority in the legislature. But Broderick was by no means put out of California politics by this defeat. With a persistency and shrewdness seldom equaled, he continued his struggle for the state's mastery, and after throwing the legislature of 1855 into a deadlock over the senatorial election, he succeeded in re-establishing his control over much of the party machinery throughout the state. The continued schism in the ranks of the Democrats was largely responsible, however, for the victory of the Know-Nothing Party in the election of 1856. But this victory left Broderick in a much stronger position when the triumph of the Know-Nothings came to an end in the following year. In the legislative session of 1857, the senatorial election was again the absorbing issue. In this contest, Broderick proved strong enough not only to secure his own election, but in some degree to dictate to the legislature the choice of his colleague. For Broderick's unquestioned authority forced Gwynne into a compromise with his formal rival that might be well called the bargain and corruption episode of California politics. 
Under the terms of this agreement, which was arranged in a secret interview between Gwyn and Broderick personally, the latter undertook to secure for Gwyn the election to the United States Senate, and Gwyn, on his part, pledged himself to turn over to Broderick his monopoly of federal patronage in the state. In previous years, this has been Gwyn's chief political asset and a prize greatly sought after by his rival. The first provision of the compromise was successfully carried out. Despite universal astonishment, much chagrin, and vigorous denunciation of the bargain, Gwyn accepted the senatorial election from Broderick's hands, and even went so far as to publish in the newspapers a formal renunciation of any part of the federal patronage. The question of appointments to federal office in California, however, was not thus easily disposed of, for President Buchanan did not take kindly to Broderick or his recommendations and filled various important positions in California with men to whom the new senator from the coast was opposed. Coupled with this issue of the federal patronage was Broderick's opposition to Buchanan's course in the heated controversy over the slavery issue in Kansas. Broderick vigorously opposed the Lecompton Constitution, to which Buchanan had definitely committed himself, so that the breach between the President and Broderick was still further widened. As an upshot of the situation, Broderick returned to California in 1859, out of favor with the administration and unable to reward his followers with the federal appointments to which they had so confidently looked forward. Gwynne's return to the state a few months later was the signal for a renewal of the old feud to which the bargain of unsavory reputation was supposed to have made an end. The quarrel was pursued on either side with bitter vindictiveness. Each man besmirched his own reputation in order to injure that of his opponent. But public opinion, strangely callous to these open confessions of corruption, failed to drive either of the guilty senators out of politics. It was not long, however, before Broderick's career came to a tragic close. As a result of certain charges made by Broderick against Judge David S. Terry of the state Supreme Court, one of Gwynne's staunchest supporters, the latter resigned his position and challenged Broderick to a duel. The challenge was accepted, and the two men met on the morning of September 13, 1859, in a little valley in the hills of Marin County, not far from San Francisco. The weapons chosen were dueling pistols, and the distance 30 paces. Both men were known to be excellent shots. Broderick had participated in at least two similar encounters in early stages of his career, but at this time his health was undermined and his nerves badly upset by the long-continued strain of the campaign through which he had just passed. Consequently, he was severely handicapped in the duel, and fell an easy victim to Terry's well-directed aim. Broderick's own shot, though fired first, entered the ground barely nine feet from where he stood. The death of Broderick, in some respects like that of Hamilton at the hands of Burr, aroused public opinion as the man himself had never succeeded in doing while alive. Though Terry escaped any legal consequences of his act, his name has not escaped the infamy, which justly or unjustly, it incurred because of Broderick's death. More important still, at least from the political standpoint, the death of Broderick reacted disastrously upon Gwynne. The breach between the two wings of the Democratic Party was now too wide for any possible reconciliation, and as Broderick's followers had all along opposed Buchanan's policy in Kansas, most of them joined with a newly formed Republican organization to bring about the overthrow of the long-continued Democratic domination of the state. This occurred in the election of 1860. In California, as in other states, the campaign of that year was complicated by the confused condition of federal politics. The Democratic Party, divided between the Douglas and Breckinridge factions, with many of the former adherents also voting for Lincoln or Bell, could not stand against the growing power of the Republicans, and the four electoral votes of the state went for Lincoln. With the approach of the Civil War, a critical situation arose in California. The isolated position of the state and the lack of close political or economic ties to bind it to the rest of the nation 
created a feeling of indifference among most of the northern sympathizers regarding the outcome of the great contest in which the national government was involved. A numerous foreign element in the population further accentuated this attitude of aloofness. On the other hand, there was a large and influential body of citizens of southern birth and sympathies that actively worked to bring about the secession of California from the Union. It was not expected, nor even desired by this party, however, that the state should formally join the Richmond Confederacy, but they hoped, by reviving the old plan of a Pacific Republic, to weaken the North through the withdrawal of California's important financial and moral support. The Southern sympathizers also looked to see the new republic serve as a source of supplies for the Confederacy, and it was expected that privateersmen would outfit along the coast for attacks upon Union merchantmen. More important still, the plan promised to divert the badly needed silver and gold bullion of the California and Nevada mines to the southern states. The plans of the Confederate supporters were not defeated without the most vigorous efforts by a few of the state's loyal citizens. The union of many of the Douglas Democrats with the Republicans broke the political power of the Chivalry or Gwynn faction, and so took most of the state offices out of the hands of the Southern sympathizers. The fealty of the federal troops stationed in California was also assured when President Lincoln superseded Albert Sidney Johnston, then in command of the Pacific Division of the United States Army, by General Edwin V. Sumner. But the real burden of keeping the state true to the government fell upon a relatively few Union men, whose intense earnestness and loyalty were largely instrumental in arousing public opinion against the secession movement. San Francisco was the headquarters of this union group. Here, great mass meetings were held and a secret organization formed, known as the Home Guard, to prevent secession. Thomas Starr King, apostle of the union cause, toured the state in a remarkably effective campaign to arouse the spirit of loyalty. The state legislature pledged its support to the Lincoln government. Thousands of volunteers enlisted in the state militia for home defense. Money was freely raised by public and private subscription to meet the state's wartime obligations. More than a million dollars were voluntarily contributed to the work of the Sanitary Commission. Finally, some 15,000 men were enrolled from the state in various branches of the Union Army. Despite such efforts, however, the Northern supporters could not wholly undo the work of their opponents. Many Southerners, among whom the most conspicuous was Albert Sidney Johnston, made their way back to the theater of war to join the armies of the Confederacy. Senator Gwynne, who had come to California shortly after Lincoln's inauguration, proffered his services to the Richmond government and sailed for Havana by way of Panama. After numerous adventures and some months of confinement in a Union prison, he finally reached Mississippi. Afterwards, he represented the Davis administration at the French court. More than one vessel, ostensibly fitted out for Mexican or South American ports, slipped away from California waters to prey upon Union commerce in the Pacific. In certain parts of the state, notably at Visalia and other cities of the San Joaquin, at Sonoma, and in the Santa Clara Valley, the secessionist feeling was far stronger than Union sympathy. In certain of these communities, the newspapers boldly championed the Southern cause, Confederate flags were everywhere in evidence, and military companies were organized to offset the efforts of Union sympathizers. Guerrilla bands, operating under the guise of Southern irregulars, likewise interfered somewhat with the shipment of bullion through the mountains and caused some loss of property to the Northern supporters. The whole air, indeed, during the four years of war, was full of the plots of Southern adherents to overthrow or injure Union influence. Many of these were too fantastic ever to succeed, but the isolation of the state and the indifference of the public mind made the situation one of real danger even as late as 1864. Aside from the issue of secession and the change from democratic to republican control, the politics of California during the Civil War period showed no material change. Some measures of local significance were passed by the legislature, and various laws which profoundly affected the state were enacted by Congress. 
From the standpoint of public morality, however, the government of California underwent but little change from the low level to which it had fallen during the early 50s. Professional politics and public indifference still prevented any radical departure from the accepted policy of turning a public trust to private gain. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of A History of California, the American Period by Robert Class Cleland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty four The Overland Mail and the Pony Express. Before the building of railroads, one of the most serious problems California had to face, from a social and political as well as an economic standpoint, was the development of some means of carrying on local and transcontinental communication. To supply this pressing need for transportation facilities, measures of various kinds were undertaken by unofficial bodies as well as under state and national direction. Road building was naturally regarded as one of the essential means of solving the difficulty, and it was undertaken both at private and public expense. In September 1854, for instance, the people of Los Angeles raised $6,000 for the construction of a wagon road between their city and Fort Tejon. The work was completed in December of the same year. In 1855, the state legislature appropriated $100,000 for a road through Johnston's Cutoff in the Sierra Nevada Mountains, $7,000 for a road from San Diego to the Colorado River, and $20,000 for the old Mormon road from San Pedro through the Cajon Pass to Salt Lake City. Footnote. At about the same time, the federal government set aside $50,000 for the same road. Over it, one of the earliest of the overland mail services to the state was inaugurated. End of footnote. With the increase of population and the building of roads, the transportation companies sprang up like mushrooms to meet the increased demand for more adequate service. Nearly all of these companies carried freight, passengers, express or mail, as the opportunity arose. Many of them grew into large and flourishing organizations and played a very vital part in the upbuilding of the state. It is manifestly impossible to list any considerable number of these lines, but a few may be cited by way of illustration. In 1854, for example, the Adams Express Company began a monthly express service between San Francisco and Salt Lake City by way of Los Angeles. From the last named city, according to the company's advertisements, the route included the following settlements, El Monte, San Bernardino, Cold Creek, Johnston Springs, Parowan, Ked Creek, Fillmore City, Nephthys City, Summit Creek, Payson's, Provo City, and American Fork. The following year, the California Stage Company added a line of stages to this route, and of more importance still, a very considerable freight business sprang up between the two cities. This service was all the more important because heavy winter snows ordinarily shut off communication between Salt Lake and St. Louis on the east and San Francisco on the west, during a large part of the year, leaving the Los Angeles-Salt Lake Road as the only means of outside communication for the Mormon settlements. As a result of this natural monopoly, the Los Angeles merchants profited greatly from the Salt Lake trade and built up a large trade between the two cities. An idea of the importance of this business may be gained from the fact that the single firm of Alexander and Banning frequently set out a train with as many as 15 ten-mule teams transporting merchandise valued at $30,000 or $40,000. Freight charges over the route ranged from 18 to 25 cents a pound. While these local or semi-local lines were a material benefit to the communities they served, the most vital interest of California lay in the development of transcontinental means of communication. In the matter of mail service, for instance, for nearly ten years after the discovery of gold, with a few exceptions to be noted elsewhere, the people of the state were compelled to rely wholly upon the Pacific Mail Steamship Company. 
although this company drew an annual subsidy of seven hundred thousand dollars for carrying a monthly mail between new york and san francisco it performed its functions in a most abominable manner if the literature of the time is at all to be relied upon even when the service was made semi-monthly in eighteen fifty one the southern part of the state still suffered most exasperating delays in receiving its eastern mail letters from new york were sometimes seven or eight months reaching los angeles the pacific mail vessels frequently failed to stop at san diego on either northward or southward voyage but carried the los angeles mail from panama to san francisco and back again to panama with a fine disregard for the impatient citizens of the southern cities consequently letters from new york sometimes required seven or eight months to reach los angeles footnote in eighteen fifty five one of the southern newspapers stated that san luis obispo had had only eight mails in eighteen months End of footnote. naturally the people of the state were anxious to bring such a condition to an end and very early began the agitation for a regular overland mail service to the east prior to eighteen fifty seven however only a few abortive attempts were actually made either by congress or private individuals to inaugurate such a service and from these efforts the people of the state derived little immediate benefit the most ambitious of these early undertakings was that of absalom woodward and george chorpenning with these men the united states government contracted on april twenty fifth eighteen fifty one for a monthly mail service each way between salt lake city and sacramento the first route was along the regular emigrant road through placerville crossing the sierras at carson's canyon then following along the carson and humboldt rivers and around the northern end of the lake to salt lake city thirty days was allowed for the nine hundred mile trip and though this could be made easily enough in summer the winter often found the route impassable so that Chorpenning was obliged to abandon it during several months each year and forward the mails to San Pedro by sea and thence transport them overland to Salt Lake by the Mormon Trail. Indian attacks on the northern route were also frequent. So while the government subsidy, which amounted to only $14,000 a year, was afterwards increased and a shorter road opened between Placerville and Salt Lake through northern Nevada, Chorpenning's project never gave very satisfactory service, nor repaid the contractors by several hundred thousand dollars for the expense and labor involved. One of the reasons for the slow development of the overland mail service was the very powerful and well-organized opposition in Washington of the Pacific Mail Steamship Company to any rival carrier. The intense sectional jealousy between Northern and Southern California and between western and southern states over the location of the route was another retarding influence almost every immigrant trail running into the state had its backers but eventually the contest narrowed down to three main routes the first of these much frequented by early immigrants ran from independence missouri and later from st joseph to salt lake by way of laramie fort bridger and the south pass over the eastern portion of this route from missouri to salt lake a monthly mail service was almost continuously maintained by various contractors after 1850. This supplied both the Mormon settlements in Utah and the United States military forces along the frontier. But from Salt Lake to California, this northern route was frequently impassable during the winter months, as George Penning found by hard experiment. The second proposed route left Springfield, Missouri, and ran in a southwesterly course to the Canadian River. Following the course of this stream, it passed through Albuquerque and held almost directly west until it reached the Colorado. From the Colorado, it continued to the Mojave and then turned northward to the Tahone Pass. From the Tahone, one branch led to Los Angeles, and another continued up the San Joaquin Valley to San Jose and San Francisco. This route, commonly known as the 35th Parallel Route, or Beale's route, was apparently the most favored of the three by mail contractors. The southern route, which eventually obtained the government subsidy, will be described in detail later. It is sufficient here to point out that while considerably longer than either of the others, and running for much of the way through barren or even desert country, 
it had the great advantage of being open the year around and was consequently looked upon as the most available of the three by postal officials over this route a mail service was established from san diego to san antonio texas in eighteen fifty seven Gwynn quotes from the San Diego Herald this description of the departure of the first mail. Quote, the pioneer mail train from San Diego to San Antonio, Texas, under the contract entered into by the government with Mr. James Birch, left here on the 9th instant, August 9th, 1857, at an early hour in the morning and is now pushing its way for the east at a rapid rate. The mail was, of course, carried on pack animals, as will be the case until wagons, which are being pushed across, will have been put on the line. The first mail from the other side has not yet arrived, although somewhat overdue and conjecture is rife as to the cause of the delay. End quote. The government contract with Birch, mentioned in the quotation, was only on a temporary basis, pending the passage through Congress of the long-delayed overland california mail bill and in the closing hours of pierce's administration this measure after a deal of wrangling finally became law under the terms of the act the postmaster general was empowered to select a route determine the frequency of the service and advertise for bids for the transportation of all letter mail from the mississippi to san francisco the contract was to run for six years and called for a subsidy of $300,000 annually for semi-monthly service, $450,000 for weekly service, and $600,000 for semi-weekly service at the option of the Postmaster General. Nine bids were made for this contract, but the award finally went to the Butterfield Overland Mail Company, a concern closely affiliated with Wells Fargo and controlled almost entirely by New York stockholders. The southern route was selected by the Postmaster General, and St. Louis chosen as the location of the Central Depot of Supplies. All sections of the country, as a contemporary newspaper pointed out, thus shared to some extent in the advantages of the contract. The route of the Overland Mail, as Butterfield's company came to be known, can best be shown from the following timetable printed in a newspaper of the period. San Francisco to Los Angeles, 464 miles, 80 hours, 0 minutes. Los Angeles to Fort Yuma, 280 miles, 72 hours, 20 minutes. Fort Yuma to Tucson, 280 miles, 71 hours, 45 minutes. Tucson to Franklin, El Paso, 360 miles, 82 hours. Franklin to Fort Chadbourne, 428 miles, 128 hours and 40 minutes. Fort Chadburn to Colbert's Ferry on the Red River, 283 miles, 62 hours and 25 minutes. Colbert's Ferry to Fort Smith, 192 miles, 38 minutes. Fort Smith to Tipton, 313 miles, 48 hours, 55 minutes. Tipton to St. Louis by railroad. 160 miles in 11 hours and 40 minutes. Between Los Angeles and San Francisco, the route passed through San Jose, Gilroy, Pacheco Pass, Fresno City, Visalia, Fort Tejon, French Johns, San Fernando, and a number of other settlements which at the time enjoyed a reputation and a name. From St. Louis to San Francisco, the postage on first-class mail was three cents for each half ounce three sacks of letters averaging 170 pounds in weight, and a newspaper bag of about 140 pounds were carried by each coach. These coaches were substantially built and at a pinch could accommodate six passengers. From four to six horses or mules were attached to each coach. They traveled day and night, running on a maximum schedule of 25 days for the one-way trip. This maximum time, however, was seldom required except where delays occurred from Indian attacks or flooded rivers. There was likely to be irregularity, however, in the mail service between Memphis and Fort Smith, and as the Butterfield stages picked up the southern mail at this point for conveyance to California, such delays sometimes interfered with the normal schedule. Probably the quickest trip on record was made in 1859, 
when the mail leaving St. Louis on September 16th reached Los Angeles on October 3rd, having been on the road only 17 days, 6 hours, and 10 minutes. The business of the Butterfield Company was conducted in a thoroughly systematic manner and on a very large scale. Nearly 800 men were in the employ of the company. The equipment consisted of more than a 100 Concord coaches, a 1,000 horses, and 500 mules. Stations were built, wherever possible, at 10-mile intervals. These were ordinarily of adobe, and the government allowed 320 acres of land for building and grazing purposes at each station. In sections where there was danger of Indian attack, a guard of 20 or 25 men was placed at each station to protect the company's property and to convoy the mail coach through the hostile country. The fare from Memphis or St. Louis to San Francisco was $200. Passengers had to furnish their own meals, but were given facilities for preparing them at the company stations. Each passenger was allowed to carry 40 pounds of baggage without cost. He was advised to equip himself for the journey with the following outfit, quote, one Sharps rifle and a hundred cartridges, a Colt's Navy revolver and two pounds of balls a knife and sheath, a pair of thick boots and woolen pants, a half dozen pairs of thick cotton socks, six undershirts, three woolen undershirts, a wide-awake hat, a cheap sack coat, and a soldier's overcoat, one pair of blankets in summer and two in winter, a piece of India rubber cloth, a pair of gauntlets, a small bag of needles, pins, etc., two pair of thick drawers, three or four towels, and various toilet articles. End quote. The overland mail was looked upon by all right minded Southern Californians as a local institution, or at least as belonging principally to the southern part of the state. Northern California was somewhat chagrined at the choice of the southern route, and many of the states east of the Rocky Mountains likewise felt aggrieved at the Postmaster General's decision. For although a mail service was maintained between Placerville and St. Joseph, Missouri, by way of Salt Lake, and the line was supposed to run from Stockton to Kansas City by way of Albuquerque, neither of these could compete successfully with a Butterfield subsidy. Partly, therefore, as a result of this sectional rivalry, and partly to meet a real economic need, one of the most spectacular of Western ventures was set on foot in the spring of 1860. This was the famous Pony Express, more important, if the truth be told, from the standpoint of romance than of commercial success. The first trip of this new and short-lived enterprise was begun amid great enthusiasm. The San Francisco Bulletin of April 7, 1860, contained this paragraph, quote, From one o'clock till a quarter to four on Tuesday last, a clean-limbed, hardy little nanking-colored pony stood at the door of the Alta Telegraph Company's office, the pioneer pony of the famous express, which that day began its first trip across the continent. The little fellow looked all unaware of his famous future. Two little flags adorned his headstall. From the pommel of his saddle hung, on each side, a bag lettered Overland Pony Express. The broad saddle, wooden stirrups, immense flappers to guard the rider's feet, and the girth that knows no buckle were of the sort customary in California for swift horsemen who appreciate mud. At a quarter to four, he took up his line of march to the Sacramento boat. Personally, he will make short work of the undertaking and probably be back in a day, but by proxy he will put the west behind his heels like a very puck and be in at New York in 13 days from this writing. At 3 o'clock, the letters he had to carry numbered 53. Probably his whole cargo will be 75 or 80 letters at $5 each. Those which use both pony and telegraph expect to be landed in New York in nine days after quitting San Francisco. End quote. The Pony Express riders were picked with the greatest care and represented the hardiest and bravest of Western men. Each rider was provided with a complete buckskin suit with hair on the outside to shed the rain. He also carried one or more Colt six-shooters, eight inches in length, and a knife 18 inches long. Each man rode a stretch of 100 miles, 
though on occasion riders were known to carry the mail three times the regular distance without rest or sleep. Eleven hours was the maximum time allowed for the hundred miles, and each rider was required to make at least four hundred miles a week. The Pony Express, except in the hardest weather, furnished a much more rapid service than the overland mail, but its charges were high. It had no government subsidy, and its route was subject to serious blockages by snow. This last difficulty sometimes furnished the good citizens of Los Angeles with cause for rejoicing. When, for example, in February 1861, the dispatches brought by the overland mail to Los Angeles were telegraphed to San Francisco, arriving there ahead of the Pony Express, a great celebration was held in the southern metropolis in honor of the overland mail and the Pacific and Atlantic Telegraph. Footnote. This line had been completed between Los Angeles and San Francisco since October 3, 1860. In footnote. And it may be remarked in passing that a celebration in the Los Angeles Society of the 60s was always carried out with spirit and fervor, a large part of which, whatever the occasion, came out of kegs, bottles, and other containers of potential enthusiasm. With the outbreak of the Civil War, the Butterfield Mail Service, since it ran through southern territory the larger part of the way, was discontinued. Part of the equipment owned by the company was seized by the Confederates, and part was sold to the Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express, or COC and PP, a recently organized and very powerful company operating between Salt Lake and Atchison, Missouri. The remainder of the Butterfield equipment was used to establish a line between Salt Lake and Virginia City, Nevada. This last line was later run in connection with the Pioneer Stage from the Virginia City to Sacramento and with the COC and PP from Salt Lake to Atchison. A through mail and stage service from Sacramento to the Missouri was thus at last established. A daily mail service was soon operated over this route and a schedule maintained under which each coach made a minimum of 112 miles a day. The presiding genius of the new overland line was the widely known Ben Holliday, obtaining an annual subsidy of $1 million for the transmission of through and local mails between Atchison and Sacramento. Holliday enlarged his equipment, improved the passenger service, and extended his business so successfully that he finally had some 3,300 miles of stage lines under his control. In 1866, he sold his entire business to the Wells Fargo Interests, a company which had already gotten possession of the Pioneer Stage and the original Overland Mail. In 1868, the government granted Wells Fargo a yearly subsidy of $1,750,000 for a daily mail service to California. And under the incentive of this subsidy, stages were once more restored to the old Butterfield route. But the age of the railroad was at hand, and the day of the overland stage came to an end. It had served its purpose, however, by writing a new chapter in Western romance, and by breaking down to some degree the isolation of a state. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of A History of California, the American Period by Robert Glass Cleland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five Background of the Pacific Railroad On July first, eighteen sixty two, when the nation was beset by the danger and stress of the Civil War, President Lincoln signed a bill entitled an act to aid in the construction of a railroad and telegraph line from the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean, and to secure to the government the use of the same for postal, military, and other purposes. Ten nights later, the city of San Francisco gave itself up to a magnificent celebration in honor of an event for which all California had waited with impatience or despair for nearly fifteen years. A newspaper of the time thus described the jubilation. Quote, a multitude of flaring lamps and torches and blue lights with any number of banners, over fifty transparencies of red and white and other colors, 
fountains of yellow sparks bubbling up here and there, meteoric white and red and blue lights shooting hither and thither from Roman candles, and rockets soaring high into the air, leaving long tracks of yellow sparks, and then bursting in many-colored balls overhead. Thus the long and brilliant procession marched in a blaze of lights, while the air was thick with smoke and loud with the music of clamoring bands, shriekings of the steam whistle, and the thunders of cannons. Among the most interesting features of the procession were fifty or more transparencies borne between the long lines of shouting people. From the wording of these inscriptions, it is possible to gather something of the spirit of the occasion. One read, Quote, the locomotive, his prow is wet with the surge and foam of either ocean. His breast is grim with the sands of the desert. End quote. Another bore these lines. Quote, a union of lakes, a union of hands, a union of states none can sever. A union of hearts, a union of hands, and the railroad unites us forever. End quote. A slightly different theme, as well as a different literary flavor, was contained in such expressions as Cape Horn be blowed, Salt Lake City, the halfway house, and Chesapeake Bay oysters, six days from the water. The boosting spirit was also much in evidence as appeared in California, watering place of the world, and in the following not yet accomplished prophecy. San Francisco in 1862, 100,000 inhabitants. San Francisco in 1872, one million inhabitants. The Pacific Railroad, said another, Uncle Sam's waistband. He has grown so corpulent he would burst without it. But all the transparencies none better express the sentiment of the time than that which ran, quote, The transcontinental railway, its construction no longer promised to our ear to be broken to our hope, end quote. For in truth, the final enactment of the Pacific Railroad Bill was the culmination of a long, vexatious, and at times apparently hopeless struggle. Beginning in 1832, with the publication of an anonymous article in The Emigrant, a weekly newspaper of Ann Arbor, Michigan, advocating the construction of a transcontinental railway, the idea of a road to the Pacific was brought forward from time to time by various visionaries until at last it found a real champion in the person of Asa Whitney. Whitney, fresh from two years' stay in China, had an admirable genius for sustained enthusiasm. On January 28, 1845, he laid before the Senate the first of a long series of memorials dealing with the project of a line from Lake Michigan to Oregon. During the next eight years, he devoted his time and much of his private fortune seeking to educate Congress and the American public to think in terms of a continent. Whitney's plan, while providing for the construction of the road at private hands, called for the grant to the company of a strip of public land 60 miles wide and extending from one terminus of the line to the other. The land covered by this grant, however, was to be sold at a low figure to actual settlers, and the road itself, upon completion, was to become the property of the nation. This proposal, afterwards modified in some important particulars, aroused much popular interest, and by the close of 1848, no less than 17 state legislatures, besides many unofficial bodies, had petitioned Congress for its adoption. The opponents of Whitney's plan, however, even from the beginning, were about as numerous as its advocates. Their objections were based chiefly upon four grounds. The cost and difficulty of building any road across the continent, it was said, made the undertaking a stupendous piece of folly. The land grants sought by Whitney were a colossal robbery of the public. The enterprise ought to be taken wholly out of private hands and made a government affair. And, finally, the proposed route across the continent was much inferior to others that might have been selected. With public opinion divided by these various differences, it was impossible to expect Congress for many years to sanction Whitney's undertaking, or in fact to unite on any plan for the construction of a Pacific Railroad. The chief disagreement arose over the question of routes. 
for nearly every section of the country looking to its own local interests advocated some particular line to the west and denounced other proposals as impractical or sectional after eighteen fifty however upon at least one point opinion was tolerably well united it was generally accepted that the road should terminate in california instead of in oregon a change from whitney's original plan made necessary by the acquisition of the mexican war territory and the inrush of population into california caused by the gold excitement for a time the impression prevailed throughout the country and even in congress that almost any of the transcontinental trails over which wagons could be taken were feasible for a railroad but by eighteen fifty two the choice had pretty well narrowed down to four or five main routes of these the line proposed by whitney from lake michigan to the columbia by way of the south pass with a branch to san francisco was the most northerly it followed in the main course of one of the oldest and most traveled of the western trails somewhat to the south of this running between the thirty eighth and thirty ninth parallels lay a line proposed by senator benton with its starting point at st louis and its terminus at san francisco benton who had long been interested in western transportation especially in its relation to asiatic commerce was known as a vigorous opponent both of whitney's route and of his proposed land grants in lieu of these the missouri senator urged the route mentioned above and the construction of the road at government expense part of the route advocated by benton had been explored by his indefatigable son-in-law john c fremont who had lost a number of his men and nearly perished himself in the undertaking but even without the knowledge of the route obtained by fremont benton was not one to be seriously disturbed by any lack of scientific data Quote, there is a class of topographical engineers he was wont to declare older than the schools and more unerring than the mathematicians they are the wild animals buffalo elk deer antelope bears which traverse the forests not by compass but by instinct that leads them always the right way to the lowest passes in the mountains the shallowest fords in the rivers and the shortest practical lines between remote points the line benton proposed crossed from the upper reaches of the rio grande to the grand and green river basin by way of cuchitopa pass a pass benton's opponents ridiculed as being the highest peak in the range and continued almost due west until it reached the mormon settlements of parowan and cedar city in southern utah footnote the elevation of this pass was ten thousand thirty two feet in footnote from this point the road might either turn south some two hundred miles along the course of the virgin river and then proceed westward to the tohon or walker pass or it could continue westward along its original course from the mormon towns to the sierra nevada skirting south along the base of these mountains until a pass should be found into the san joaquin branches from the main railroad were to be built to santa fe salt lake city and the columbia another transcontinental route persistently urged and popular in many quarters traversed the state of texas to el paso followed the gila to the colorado and thence crossed the desert to san diego over the course followed by colonel emory in eighteen forty seven this is commonly known as the southern or thirty-second parallel route and was afterwards made use of in part by the first overland mail a road along this line was naturally favored by the southern states because of what it meant to their economic development the charge that slavery dictated this choice though often made is scarcely tenable entirely apart from sectional interests the route had much to commend it because of its easy grades and almost complete freedom from snow these advantages however were somewhat offset by its additional length compared to the more direct routes and the desert territory through which it passed in addition to these three main routes the northern the central and the southern there were a number of others of somewhat less importance among the most likely of these minor routes was one especially championed by senator gwynne of california from san francisco it ran down the san joaquin crossed the sierra through walker pass and continued along the thirty-fifth parallel to albuquerque new mexico 
Thence it turned south to a point near Santa Fe. A branch road was thence to be built along the old Santa Fe Trail to Independence, but the main line, according to the plan, was to take a more direct course to Fulton, Arkansas. This terminus was to be the common meeting place of roads running to Memphis and New Orleans. Branch lines to Council Bluffs and Austin, Texas were also proposed at other points along the route. And in California, a road was to be built up the Sacramento to Oregon. Still another proposed route followed Whitney's original line as far as the South Pass, but turned into California instead of Oregon, taking the course of the Humboldt River from a point near Salt Lake and crossing the Sierra by one of the northern passes. From this general summary, it will be seen that railroad routes to California were plentiful enough on paper in the early 50s to satisfy the demands of every section. No intelligent choice could be made between them, however, from the data then available, since most of this was too general in character to satisfy the demands of railroad engineering. To meet this necessity for more accurate and detailed information, Congress at last authorized an official survey of the various routes. The work was begun in 1853 under the direction of Jefferson Davis, who was then Secretary of War. For more than two years, it was carried on so vigorously and efficiently that nearly all the routes subsequently followed by transcontinental roads were carefully reconnoitered and their feasibility for railroad purposes pretty accurately determined. In addition to this work, for which they were specifically organized, the Surveying Corps also gathered a vast store of material relating to the history, geology, botany, and ethnology of the Trans-Mississippi West. The surveys covered five principal routes. The most northerly lay between the 47th and 49th parallels. The second ran between the 41st and 42nd parallels. The third between the 38th and 39th parallels. The fourth along the course of the 35th parallel. And the fifth near the 32nd parallel. It will thus be seen that the operations of the reconnaissance parties extended from the Mississippi Valley to the Pacific, and almost from the Canadian line to the Mexican border. Except as their labors actually touched California, however, space cannot be given in the present volume to the exploration of these parties. Among the most important contributors to the success of the undertaking, as it related to California, were A. W. Whipple, R. S. Williamson, J. G. Park, H. L. Abbott, and E. G. Beckwith the successor of the unfortunate Gunnison, who was killed by the Indians on the Sevier River. Beckwith's survey covered the region from Salt Lake to the upper end of the Sacramento Valley. After leaving Salt Lake, his party followed the familiar emigrant route along the Humboldt, but at its sink, instead of turning south to the Truckee, the company took a more northerly course, mapping out two possible lines across the Sierra. One of these led through Madeline Pass, Round Valley, and the Pitt River Canyon. The other, a little further south, began the passage of the mountains at Honey Lake, crossed the summit by way of Noble Pass, and struck a tributary of the Sacramento known as Battle Creek. Both routes terminated at Fort Redding, whence the route down the level valley of the Sacramento was already sufficiently well known. Whipple's survey, on its part, covered much of the route afterwards adopted by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. Leaving Fort Smith on the Arkansas, the line ran to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and thence to the Colorado, and by way of Zuni, Aztec Pass, and Bill Williams Fork, through a territory previously but little known. Leaving the Colorado a short distance above the Needles, so-called because of certain mountain promontories, Whipple mapped out a feasible immigrant road to the Mojave. He then followed this stream until the old Spanish trail branched off to the Cajon Pass above San Bernardino. An examination of this pass, so long used by Santa Fe traders and fur hunters, showed it altogether practical for a railroad, and it afterwards became one of the great gateways for transcontinental traffic. The southern, or 32nd parallel route, had already been in part surveyed by Lieutenant Colonel Emery, first while serving in General Kearney's expedition, and afterwards as a member of the United States-Mexican Boundary Commission. But a more extended examination of the route was made by the surveys of 1853 and 1854. 
The line between the Red River and the Rio Grande was surveyed by Captain John Pope. From El Paso, the work was carried westward by Lieutenant Park to the Pima villages on the Gila River in Arizona. Emory's survey of the boundary line was considered adequate to bridge the gap between this point and the Colorado. West of the Colorado, the work was entrusted to Lieutenant Williamson. While the routes leading to California were thus being examined, other parties were making a reconnaissance of possible routes within the state itself. The most important work along this line was done by R.S. Williamson and his chief aide, Lieutenant Park. The first task assigned Williamson was to discover a feasible route from the Gila River to San Francisco Bay, connecting with the 32nd and 35th parallel surveys east of the Colorado. In the course of this work, Williamson made a careful examination of the mountain passes that led eastward from the lower San Joaquin Valley and of those through the Sierra Madre Range to the coast. Williamson's expedition left Benicia July 10, 1853, and entered the San Joaquin by way of Livermore Pass. Crossing to the east side of the valley, the party took the usual route to the delta of the Cahuilla, where they secured the services of Alexander Gotti, the famous guide who had given such material aid to Fremont at an earlier date. Walker's Pass was the first objective of the expedition. Contrary to popular impression, for this pass had long been described as the logical gateway through the Sierra, it was found to be wholly impractical for railway purposes on account of the difficulty of its westward approach. Because of this drawback and the position of the pass relative to the location of the proposed routes, Williamson pronounced it the worst of all known passes in the Sierra Nevadas for a transcontinental railway. Though disappointed in the character of Walker's Pass, Williamson was agreeably surprised to find that the Tehachapi offered a satisfactory outlet for a railroad from the San Joaquin to the Great Basin. He next examined the Tejon Pass, but found it, like Walker's, very far from satisfactory. The Cañada de las Uvas, Grapevine Canyon, opening into the Tejon, furnished a much more practical route between the San Joaquin and the Mojave Desert. This patch and the Tehachapi Williamson accordingly favored in his report. Williamson's next problem was to discover an outlet through the Sierra Madre Range, which lies between the Mojave Desert and the seacoast. A wagon road had already been built from Los Angeles by way of San Fernando into the valley of the Santa Clara. Thence it followed the sinuous course of the San Francisquito Canyon, passed by Elizabeth Lake, and entered the Tejon. Upon examination, however, the San Francisquito Canyon proved impractical for a railway, but east of the San Francisquito Canyon lay another canyon, which an extended survey showed to be well adapted to the desired road. This canyon, known to the Californians as Soledad, and now used by the main line of the Southern Pacific, Williamson called the New Pass. The New Pass furnished an outlet from the Mojave as far as the Santa Clara River. From this valley, a line could be run without too great difficulty to Los Angeles. It was also believed that the course of the river would furnish a practical route for the extension of the road toward the Salinas Valley in San Francisco. Further east of Soledad Canyon, the Cajon Pass offered a gateway between San Bernardino, with an easy connection to Los Angeles, and the proposed Mojave River Colorado line. One of the most important contributions to the surveys in California was made by Lieutenant Park, who examined the great San Gorgonio Pass lying between the two highest peaks of the Sierra Madre Range, Mount San Gorgonio, or Grayback, and San Jacinto. This pass, pronounced by Williamson to be the best pass in the coast range, as indeed it easily is, furnished a feasible route from San Pedro and Los Angeles down the valleys, since known as Coachella and Imperial, to the junction of the Gila and the Colorado Rivers. It thus afforded a practical outlet for the proposed southern or 32nd parallel route to the Pacific. It was also hoped that a line might be run from the Colorado by way of Warner's Pass or through some similar gap in the mountains farther south to San Diego, but upon examination neither Warner's nor any other pass in the locality proved suitable for the desired line. As a result of these investigations, 
Williamson concluded that a road built from the Mississippi to the mouth of the Gila would reach the Pacific most easily by way of San Gorgonio Pass, San Bernardino, and Los Angeles. If it were decided to make San Diego the terminus, the line could be extended south along the coast after leaving the San Gorgonio Pass. This was the only feasible plan of reaching San Diego, since the mountains made a more direct approach impractical. Three possible routes presented themselves for extending the road to San Francisco. The line might run northward along the Colorado from the Gila, then turn westward to the Mojave and enter the San Joaquin by way of the Tehachapi. Or, having reached Los Angeles by the Cajon or San Gorgonio Pass, it might either be built northward along the coast or else be carried back to the Mojave Desert by way of Soledad Canyon and extended to the San Joaquin through the Tehachapi. Having reached the San Joaquin, the line could find an outlet through the coast range by the Pachico Pass to San Jose. Lieutenant Park was in charge of the investigations covering the route along the coast from Los Angeles to San Francisco. His examination was carefully made, but the details cannot be entered into here. He thought the road might be built for $20 million and pointed out the beneficial effect it would have upon the development of rich agricultural lands between Los Angeles and Monterey. A half century elapsed, however, before the Southern Pacific, following the park's suggestions, completed this vital link between the North and South. The careful surveys of Williamson and Park in Southern California were duplicated in the northern part of the state the following year, 1855. Williamson was again put in charge of the work, but as Park was busy elsewhere, Lieutenant H. L. Abbott was detailed to act as chief assistant. The main object of this investigation was to discover a feasible route between the Sacramento Valley and Oregon, either by way of the Willamette River or the Deschutes. The Deschutes route involved a recrossing of the Sierra Nevada along the earlier line mapped out by Beckwith, and a survey of the region lying between the eastern outlet of Nobles Pass and the Klamath River. The course of this stream was then followed for some distance until a low range of hills allowed the party to cross to the Deschutes. The valley of this river, which was supposed to furnish an outlet to the Dalles, after a time proved impossible for railway purposes and though a pass was afterwards found heading into the Willamette Valley, the route as a whole proved too difficult and the country too sterile to make the construction of a railroad practical. The second line marked out for survey between California and Oregon was much more favored by Williamson and Abbott. It tapped the rich mining regions of Shasta and Trinity counties and ran through the fertile Umpqua, Rogue, and Willamette valleys. On this route, the chief difficulty was presented by the mountainous country lying between Shasta City and Wairika. Indian troubles, however, unfortunately prevented a careful examination of much of the region. But Abbott's conjecture that the route would prove eminently practical upon further investigation was later verified by the construction of the Oregon and California Railway from San Francisco to Portland. The Pacific Railroad reports, which embodied the findings of Whipple, Gunnison, Stevens, Beckwith, and the rest, showed plainly enough that no insurmountable difficulty had been placed by nature in the way of a railroad to the west. But unfortunately for the immediate construction of such a road, the same report showed that it might follow at least four routes across the continent, thus keeping alive that sectional rivalry which had already proved such a serious impediment to the railway bill. The selection of the southern route by Secretary Davis as the most desirable for railway purposes did little to mend the situation. He was charged with pro-slavery and sectional motives, though his choice was wholly justified from the engineering and financial standpoint, and the battle between the various routes went on as vigorously and indecisively as before. In this contest, the southern route scored two important gains. One, the acquisition of the Butterfield Overland Mail, has already been spoken of. The other, which transpired some years before the Overland Mail, while in fact the railroad surveys were still in progress, was the so-called Gadsden Purchase. This further acquisition of Mexican territory was urged because it was found that a railroad following the general line of the 32nd parallel 
would be compelled at times to dip south of the border owing to topographical difficulties and run for part of its course through the state of sonora to keep the road wholly on american soil president pierce therefore sent colonel james g gadsen of south carolina to negotiate with mexico for the desired territory gadsen himself a railroad president and one of the earliest advocates of a line to the pacific had suggested in eighteen forty five that its terminus be made either mazatlan or san francisco he was an ardent enthusiast for the southern route and succeeded without great difficulty in securing mexico's consent to the transfer of some forty five thousand square miles lying just south of arizona and new mexico for ten million dollars after a good deal of debate the treaty was ratified by the united states senate and went into effect june thirtieth eighteen fifty four footnote the southern pacific for much of its course from yuma to el paso now runs through this gadsen purchase the treaty also provided for certain transit rights across the isthmus of tehuantepec in footnote while the federal government was thus concerned with the question of a railroad to the pacific the people of california were also busily engaged in agitation for the project their newspapers were continually harping upon it mass meetings and conventions were called to further the enterprise and California congressmen and senators were made to feel that the chief end of their political life was to secure the enactment of a railroad bill. The state legislature similarly showed great enthusiasm for the enterprise. Much of this, expressed in oratory and memorials to Congress, did little good, but a few practical results were accomplished by other means. Most important of these was an examination of that portion of the Sierra Nevada lying between the American River and Carson Pass for the purpose of constructing an immigrant road that later might serve as a railway route across the mountains. This investigation, carried out under the Surveyor General's orders by Sherman Day and George H. Goddard, whose name is still retained by one of the highest peaks in the Sierra, served materially to supplement the surveys previously made by the federal government. In California, however, as in the nation at large, sectional rivalries prevented general support of any one route. San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco each had its ambition to become the railway center of the West, and the result was a frittering away of energy in urging local claims that might better have been spent in concerted action. This lack of harmony among Californians seriously weakened the railroad cause at Washington, and was one of the reasons for the long years of delay between the time of the completion of the surveys and the actual construction of the road. So, in spite of a need which grew more urgent every year, various adverse factors continued to defeat the Pacific Railroad until the patience of the people of California was almost gone. In 1859, a San Francisco editor summed up this popular feeling in the following exasperated protest. Quote, if ever a people belonging to and forming part and parcel of a great nation were subject to a downright persecution from the government to which they owe allegiance, the people of California are the ones of all others that furnish the most prominent and striking example of such treatment. We are wholly at the mercy of a gang of political harpies who care no more for the interests of California than they do for those of the wild tribes of the interior of South Africa. If all that we have given to the world thus far, all the benefit that California has bestowed on the rest of the Union, and all that she has yet to become are to count for nothing in the estimation of the government, then let it be so understood, and let us cast about us and see what we can accomplish single-handed. If this editorial fairly represented public opinion on the coast, as it did without much question, then political necessity as well as economic expediency demanded the enactment of a railroad bill. The outbreak of the Civil War brought the issue to a climax. The federal government at last saw that a railroad must be built to California if California were to be kept within the Union. At the same time, since the southern route was eliminated from consideration because so much of it lay within Confederate territory, the question of the location of the road was greatly simplified. 
succession and war thus cleared the way for the eagerly awaited but long-delayed Pacific Railroad. End of chapter 25